Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. Six years ago, here on the lands of the Yananu people, in the shadows of this sacred rock, the words of the Uluru Statement from the Heart were read aloud for the first time. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. And we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. The statement called for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament to be enshrined in the Constitution. Tonight, we hear the Australian people's verdict on that request. This is a once-in-a-generation chance. Do we want to become an advisory body to the colonial system? For years, the voice has been debated in this building. Liberal Prime Ministers refused to put the advisory body in the Constitution. Then Anthony Albanese, in his election night victory speech, promised a referendum. And on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, I commit to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Yes, advocates wanted a grassroots campaign, but this has also been a raw political contest. And the tone of the debate has taken a real toll on First Nations people across the country. Just eight of 44 constitutional referenda have succeeded since Federation. A victory for yes would indeed make history. And we will not allow this referendum to divide our country along the lines of race within our constitution. The idea for a voice came from the people and it will be decided by the people. Tonight, we'll learn the people's verdict. We'll bring you the most up-to-date results as votes are counted and hear from leading figures in the campaigns and from Indigenous communities across the country. Live from the ABC Referendum Centre on Gadigal Country in Sydney, welcome to Australia Votes, The Voice Referendum. Hello and welcome to the ABC's referendum coverage live from Gadigal Country in Sydney. I'm David Spears. And I'm Bridget Brennan. Polls begin closing on the mainland in less than half an hour. Tonight we're bringing you expert analysis as well as all the results as they come in. And bringing us the numbers is none other than Anthony Green, of course. Anthony, we're used to seeing you there at the touchscreen on election nights. Uh, tonight's a bit different to an election though. How? Well, it's, it's, in some senses, it's a lot simpler. We haven't got candidates and preferences and stuff. The whole election is a simple choice between yes and no. It's like the ballot paper is the same everywhere across the country. It's a choice between yes and no, a two-horse race between two candidates. And the count, therefore, is much quicker. It's very quick to count such a simple ballot paper. We'll be getting results very quickly after 6pm and they'll come from the small rural booths first and we'll be expecting a low vote for yes a rise of yes through the night until it settles down and we can call each state. So it'll be quick. Just how quick do you expect to see meaningful numbers? Well, back in 1999, we went check, back and checked the tape and we had 68% of the vote counted in New South Wales by 7.30, half of the national vote by 7.30. That's twice what you normally get at a general election. Uh, now, there are fewer votes cast on the day now, but they'll actually be quicker to count. We could have 50% of the vote counted in the eastern states by about quarter past seven, half past seven. So uh, it could be a very quick call mm. if those results come in like that. We will see. Anthony, thank you. And we'll be hearing from many voices tonight from right across Australia. And here in the Referendum Centre, we're first joined by the voice and referendum correspondent, Dan Borsher. Good evening to you. Good evening. And 7.30's Chief Political Correspondent, Laura Tingle. Great to see you, Laura. I appreciate it. We're also joined by the Director of Yes23, Dean Parkin, and Liberal MP Keith Wallahan, who opposed the model put forward at the referendum. Welcome to you both. Uh, Dean, let me kick off with you. We're at the end of the campaign, essentially. Now, um, we're yet to see the first numbers come in. What are you realistically expecting? expecting tonight? Uh, David, we're really keen to see the numbers come in. I mean, we've been at this uh, process, this campaign for recognition and for the voice for many decades. Um, 
particularly in the last six and a half years since the Uluru Statement from the Heart was issued to the Australian people. So um, we're actually just keen to see those numbers come in rather than preempt or hypothesise. There's been a lot of that speculation throughout this campaign. And I think we've earned the right um, at the end of this very arduous um, campaign in some regards to wait and see until those numbers come in before we start making uh, mm. assessments about uh, uh, where the votes might fall. Mm. And Keith, what about you? What are you anticipating? Are you going to call it for no? Oh, I think we'll wait and see what the result is. That The Prime Minister had a mandate to put this question. There's no doubt about that, and that's why he led with that in, in his acceptance speech. But the mandate for the answer lies with the people, and while they're still voting, we, we need to respect that. I, I think there's a temptation for one side maybe to have uh, engaged in hubris, but we must all show humility and respect for the result. Uh, one of the things I kept hearing today and through the week was that a lot of people said, I wish there were two questions on the ballot paper. One for recognition and one for the voice. I, I think that's something that I heard again and again and, and really drove a lot of people's results today. I might come back to that idea uh, and where we go from here once we do see some results. Uh, clearly no one wanting to make too many bold predictions uh, before we see the numbers. If we look back at the final week, um, Dan, to you, last week of campaign are always critical. What was the final week like, do you think, for the Yes and the No camp? I think what we saw is both campaigns crisscrossing the country trying to uh, attract the attention mm. of the undecided voters. Of course, this has been a week where there's been a huge and expected focus on international affairs and the effect mm. and impact that that's having in Australia. So those undecided voters have also been grappling with so much else. But what we've also seen is a real escalation or a ramping up of uh, the tone of the debate and, and I would have to say a deterioration in the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been talked about and that's been deeply troubling. Mm. Laura, would you agree there on that analysis about the tone of the debate? Have we seen something like this in, in modern history, the kind of um, debate that we've had on no, this I, issue? I, I certainly haven't seen anything in 40 years, anything like this and, you know, it, it, whatever the result, it's, it's deeply disturbing that uh, there's been so much abuse thrown at people, um, Indigenous people, uh, and that's more than unfortunate. It's, it's a really troubling thing because it felt like we had been making progress and it feels like we've gone backwards. Mm. But I think the other thing about uh, the last week is it's really crystallised the fact that there is such a splintering of issues here. Yeah. Um, that what people think they're voting on, um, you know, the... the, the a whole range of issues about the voice, um, as Keith says, about recognition itself, and then a whole range of people who are just generally glum about things and want to send a message to the government about a whole range of issues. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, I think, very difficult to be making any clear uh, calls about exactly what has driven the outcome um, tonight. Yeah, and, and what it means, I suppose, mm. the result, when we do see a result, whichever way it goes, but that that need whatever the result for some healing, some coming together is going to be um, critical as well. Look, I just want to run you through the graphics on the bottom of the screen that you'll be seeing throughout the night. As the count goes on and the numbers roll in, states will start to be called. Purple for yes, orange for no. So let's get used to those colours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the usual election night colours. Purple for yes, orange for no. Behind us on this big wall, in the outer circles, have a look at this. Um, each of those small circles are the 151 federal electorates now, they don't, you know, getting a majority of electorates is how you win an election, but it, they, they don't matter really in terms of winning the referendum. But we'll see those light up, orange and purple for yes and no. The larger circles just behind us, that's each state and territory. Uh, now, you only need to win a majority of states as well as the national majority to win a referendum. The territories, uh, which we'll explain through the night, don't count towards the state's majority. They do count towards the national majority. But they will light up orange or purple. And then, of course, the big circle, the one in the centre, that's the overall national uh, result as well. And so nothing lit, lit up just yet, but we've got about 20 minutes to go until polls close. Well, Indigenous Affairs correspondent Carly Williams is on Minjerribah, Stradbroke Island, off the coast of Brisbane. She's on her home country. Carly, what are people on Minjerribah? Jeroba saying, and will they be watching the results closely tonight? Well, Bridget, it's pretty much business as usual on the island today. Beautiful Minjiriba, North Stradbroke Island. Uh, I went to a poll, a ballot box earlier. It was pretty quiet. I did see a massive koala walk across the lawn <laughs> right in front of the <laughs> ballot box, though. Look, Going to Minjiribar cast his vote. Home to about <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
Uh, it's home to about 2,000 residents, uh, North Stradbroke Island. About 3% of the population are First Nations. And Kwadamuka people have been on this land and caring for sea and country for more than 25,000 years. And like many communities across Australia, there is a broad range of views and perspectives about the voice referendum. If you jump in the car and drive to the ocean side of the island, you'll see yes signs, you know, tucked into gum trees and bark trees. And then at the Aboriginal shop just up the hill behind me, they're selling T-shirts saying, shut down the referendum, uh, tribal lands in tribal hands. But like I said, business as usual, we've had a community rugby league memorial game here at the uh, Dunwich in Gumpy, And I spoke to a lot of families and mob around the football field today. Those uh, who are concerned about the voice were worried that it wouldn't be inclusive of all mobs across Australia's breadth and depth. Uh, some others said that in the past they had been left out of power conversations, whether that be around economic development on the island or native title talks or Queensland treaty talks. So they're wary about how the voice would talk to Canberra. Uh, but yeah, there were yes voters as well. And I mean, something that really resonated with me earlier was Gurumpul man Dal Ruska. He said, without Aboriginal unity, uh, we can't move forward. So Aboriginal unity is much more important than the voice, regardless of the referendum result. Without Aboriginal unity, we go nowhere. Mm, such an important sentiment. And what's the sense on how the vote will unfold for tonight? For those that have been watching it closely and have been tapped into the, the debate, how do they think it will go this evening? Well, um, it's it's hard to say. I know that uh, the Strati Sharks had a big win at that community rugby league game. So a lot of people are here at the footy club. There's a sense of excitement and celebration from that win. And uh, we have got the TV on inside. So people are coming together. Uh, I know that there's a play with some elders at another venue on the island. Um, so it is business as usual. Uh, they do, they have been talking about the referendum a lot. It, it is part of the conversation here. Uh, but people aren't really sure what to expect tonight, Bridget. Mm. Well, Carly Williams, thank you. And we'll come back to you throughout the night. And we'll also cross two reporters in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities throughout the night. Well, Dan, you've spent much of the year crisscrossing the country, you've been to so many different states and territories talking to people about how they feel about how the process has been run and what they feel about the vote. What have you been hearing from people? Well, there's kind of two, two main things, Bridge, and that is on one hand, uh, people have been saying that they're actually stepping out of the debate, that the tone of it has been so vile that they don't want to be a part of it. That they've, uh, there was one elder, in fact, just a couple of days ago, who told me that they didn't want to have to consider their own Aboriginality as being the thing that was being debated and discussed by the nation and that was going to be voted on today. And so I explained, well, what the actual process was. And they said, yeah, but it feels like it's more than that. It feels like this is about who we are and, and our right to exist. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a sentiment that I've heard far and wide. On the other hand, I've heard the uh, most extraordinary generosity from elders. I uh, was standing with Arnie Faye Clayton Mosley as we were at the front of the Cootamundra Girls' Home where she was taken as a child. And she told me the story about when she was taken that they said her mum didn't love her and that in the time she was in the care of the state that, that no one said they loved her. When she got out, she said to her mum, why didn't you love me? And her mum burst into tears and said, of course I loved you, I came, and they kept shooing me away. And she said, even in spite of that pain, right now she feels like that she wanted to vote yes, because that was something that would have an impact, that there'd be a change. Uh, and then you hear other stories uh, of other Indigenous leaders who say, no, we're, we're not going to vote no, yes, because we're worried uh, about process or, or the question of trust comes up. And then you have this, this incredible resilience that we also, I've been hearing everywhere I go, and just the generosity of elders to share their story with me and, and by virtue of me sharing it with the whole nation. Mm. And that takes so much strength of character. It's not been lost on me and I've been so grateful 
to see and hear that generosity so much. Having spent time with Annie Faye, she's someone that every Australian should read her story. She's yeah. really incredible and, yeah, that yeah, resilience. And, and, Dan, you've done an incredible job covering this whole thing, no doubt about it. Uh, Isabella Higgins is in Sydney's Inner West, where Yes supporters are gathering tonight. And Patricia Carvelis is in Brisbane at the No Campaign function. Isabella, first to you. Uh, look, we keep saying it, it's not the usual election night, right? And So what does that mean for the event where you're at? Just explain to us what's going to be happening there tonight. Well, good evening, David. As you can see from the letters behind me, YES, we know where we are tonight. This is the major media event for YES 23. Now, besides those YES letters, there's not much else decoration. Everyone keeps telling us this is going to be a simple affair. They're expecting about 300 people, but that's largely going to be volunteers from this area here in the Inner West. Now, those that I have to spoken to here say that they still have some optimism despite what the polls have been telling Telling us, but I think once the polls close, we get the volunteers in here, that mood could change once we start to see those results trickling in. And Patricia, the No Camp is also having its affair in Brisbane, but a fairly subdued event there as well. Yeah, that's right, Bridget. A deliberately subdued event, and that's because the No campaign is aware that if they look like they're having a huge party on the back of what will be, no doubt, a very uh, difficult night for a lot of Indigenous Australians, um, that it won't be a, a very good look for them. So they've decided on a much more subdued event at a big Brisbane hotel. Uh, we are actually in a separate room. The media has been put in there in uh, another function room. There'll be canapes, both Jacinta Nubajimpa Price, who's the shadow spokesperson for Indigenous Affairs, with Peter Dutton's team in the opposition, and Warren Mundine are both here, so both leaders of the official No campaign. They'll be addressing media a little later, so I'll get the chance to speak to them, and so will you get a chance to hear what they have to say. But going into this, I've had a couple of chats with some prominent people. They are very confident, uh, not only of winning this vote, but of winning it across the country in, in a number of states. They say today was difficult to staff some of those booths, particularly in New South Wales. That's, that was a, a difficult um, situation for them and there were more yes campaigners out, but they do quietly believe that they are ahead enough to secure a, a no victory for their campaign. We will see. Patricia, Isabella, thank you both very much. We'll talk to you throughout the night. The referendum is just one chapter in the long story of Indigenous rights in Australia. As we wait for the first votes to be counted tonight, we look back on some of the defining moments that have led us to this vote. Vote yes and give them rights and freedoms just like me and you. The eyes of the world are on Australia. 1967, the last time Indigenous rights were at the centre of a referendum debate. I feel that the time has come when Australia can no longer tolerate legal racial discrimination against its Indigenous people. Australians overwhelmingly endorsed a constitutional change to fully count Indigenous people in the census and to allow the federal government to make laws for First Peoples. It was a moment of optimism, but Aboriginal populations had been decimated since colonisation. A third of Aboriginal housing is shanty or slum dwelling. Aborigines are condemned to live on these places. And the scars of the past were ever-present. Proportionately, say the statisticians, far more of the infants die than any other section of the Australian population. And although Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had finally been counted, they still weren't being heard. The Aborigines have never really had a voice in what they think should be done. Years of protest and calls for equal rights followed. Leading to a succession of Indigenous commissions and advisory bodies. The longest running, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC, was more than an advisory body. It also ran programs and delivered services. ATSIC is seen as an attempt by the federal government to take the decision-making process to Australia's Indigenous people. But as soon as the Howard government came to power in 1996, it enacted major cuts to ATSIC's budget, hampering its ability to deliver programs. It's uh, probably uh, the most serious crisis for Indigenous affairs since the 1967 referendum, or perhaps since the original invasion of the country. 
In the years following, there were contested allegations of governance failures. In 2004, ATSIC was abolished with little explanation. We believe very strongly that the experiment in uh, separate representation, elected representation for Indigenous people has been a failure. Many First Nations communities across the country were devastated to lose their only national representative body. ATSIC may not have always got it right, but tell me which government department has. Aboriginal people had also wanted changes to ATSIC. Now they say it's been made the scapegoat for all the problems the federal government couldn't fix for the last hundred years. We have no voice at all now at the national level. Despite significant moments in the decades since... On behalf of the government of Australia, I am sorry. Communities are still living with the effects of transgenerational trauma. We apologise, especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. The centrepiece bipartisan policy at a Commonwealth level has been closing the gap, which has so far failed to make a dent in the gulf in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. What we face is not a gap, but a chasm. Seven Prime Ministers have spent almost 20 years debating whether changing Australia's constitution would make a difference. At Uluru in 2017, a national summit was held to solve years of debate over proposals to change the Australian constitution. There were different views, but the Uluru Statement from the Heart landed on a model that seemed to have consensus among Indigenous leaders, a permanent advisory body to the parliament. It's this generation's turn to have a run at it, and we're going to run at it head first and butt it down and make it happen this time. Our very survival, in fact, depends on it. We won't be around in another 50 years, for goodness sake. The 2023 voice referendum has been another chapter in the long struggle for Indigenous rights. A long struggle indeed. I want to show you what's going to be happening on this wall tonight as the results come in. Uh, what you can see there with these circles is an illustration of what's going to be required. For the yes vote to win, they need what's called the double majority. That means a majority of the national vote, which will be that big circle in the centre, once uh, the numbers start to come in, that will start to turn either orange for no or purple for yes. Secondly, the yes vote would need to win a majority of the states. You can see the six circles over here are the six states represented all grey with question marks now. But as the numbers come in, we'll see whether the yes vote manages to win four of the six states. That's what's required, as well as the national majority to win this. Over here, we have the two territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory. They, of course, are territories. They don't count towards the majority of states. They do count towards that national majority in the centre. So we'll keep an eye on what happens in the ACT and the Northern Territory as well. Also, I want to show you this, a rough map of Australia. Each dot represents one of the 151 federal electorates around the country. Now, you don't need to win a majority of federal electorates to win a referendum. That's an election night. But this will help illustrate where the yes and the no vote is. So what we've done here is we've grouped them into states. Up the top is Queensland. The big batch in the middle is New South Wales. Below that, the next big batch is Victoria. Tasmania down the bottom. We've put South Australia on the side there and then WA on the far left. So as those results come in, we'll get a good idea of where geographically the no vote is strongest, where the yes vote is strongest. Will it be mostly orange for no in the regional areas and purple for yes around the urban fringes? We'll see as these results light up. Bridget, back to you. Thanks, David. Well, let's go now to our reporter, to, to uh, Anthony, rather, and we'll go to a reporter shortly. Anthony, uh, tell us about how we'll know the results tonight and how quickly might, we might have a sense of uh, the yes and the no vote. Well, we haven't, haven't had a referendum since 1999, so I went, thankfully I kept my notes, so I went back and looked at the results <laughs> we got from 1999. And, uh, um, what we did then, we didn't get polling places, we just got totals from the Electoral Commission. So we tried to estimate what would the figures look like if you were just getting overall totals for each state. And tonight we'll be doing something along these lines just as a way of predicting the result. That's what our trend line before 
the Republic in 99 was looking like. It started low and rose, and we expect, again, the yes vote will start low and it will start to rise. At what point does it stop rising? Does it reach 50%? Does it go beyond? Does it fall short? Now, what we actually got in 99... Uh, this one. No, that one. ..is the actuals. This is the actual. It started low, about 38%. It, this is the New South Wales figure, mm -hmm. rose to about 40 and then just levelled off. And so that's what happened last time. We might get that again this time. It may set the level off earlier than expect, but it will start low. It will then grow. It's a matter of how close it gets to 50% before you can call it one way or the other. Um, and that's what we'll be watching. We will show this graph for the figures as they come in tonight and we'll be watching for those first figures, which should be out. Not long after six. Not long enough. No, we're getting close. About five minutes to uh, six to the close of polls in at least those uh, states. New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and the ACT as well. The other states, as Anthony explains, will come in depending on the time zone there. But we'll come back to Anthony once we do get some of those very first results. We should point out there's also uh, a fair bit happening beyond the referendum tonight. New Zealand's election was mm -hmm. held today. And, of course, there's the ongoing Israel-Gaza war. So to keep us up to date throughout the evening, let's check in with Gemma Vaness. To ABC News, I'm Gemma Vaness. It is morning in Gaza, where anticipation of a full-scale Israeli ground offensive is growing. The Israeli Defence Force says it'll allow the safe movement of Gazans on two main roads south over the next six hours. The earlier deadline for Palestinians to evacuate Gaza's north has passed. ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons joins me now from Jerusalem. John, what's the situation? The Sabbath here, so there's not many cars normally on the road, but this is one of the main streets in Jerusalem, Karen Hayasod. Virtually nothing. I've seen a couple of ambulances gone by. Israelis are, many of them, staying in their homes. In Gaza, it's a different story. People are trying to flee, as many as a million people from Gaza City, trying to get down to the south following that warning by the Israeli army. However, complications. The major hospital in Gaza, the Shifa Hospital, is in Gaza City. So trying to get all of the patients who might be in, in intensive care or something, trying to get them out and down with, with a bad road system and crowded uh, and no food or water going into the Gaza. So um, that deadline has run out. The Israeli ground offensive could start at any time. There were, they did go in last night, the Israeli army, in a limited operation. I think it was like a reconnaissance operation. They went in um, and came back out, but I think they're preparing for the big ground offensive, which I expect to be within 24 hours. ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons in Jerusalem. Thank you. Foreign Minister Penny Wong says 825 Australians have left Israel and occupied territories. The first flight repatriating Australians from Israel landed in London earlier this morning. The Qantas flight, carrying 238 Australian evacuees, left Tel Aviv late Friday afternoon local time. A second flight is due to leave from Tel Aviv to Dubai later today. It is one of three additional repatriation flights. Penny Wong says the situation on the ground is changing quickly and Australians who want to leave should not hesitate. Polls have closed and counting is underway in New Zealand's general election. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins is hoping to lead the Labor Party to another term in office, while National Party Chief Christopher Luxon wants to become the country's new leader, ending six years of Labor rule. With around 20% of votes counted, the National Party is ahead of Labor of 41.5% to 26%. And that is the latest from ABC News. And, of course, you can keep up to date on our website and, of course, on ABC iView. I'm Gemma Vaness. Thank you for your company and stay with us. We'll have our further comprehensive coverage of the Voice referendum on the Voice referendum day here in Australia. After months of difficult debate, we're about to find out the decision of the Australian people on an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Polls are about to close in New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and the ACT. We'll soon find out if the referendum will achieve the required national majority and support from a majority of states to pass. 
The result will have profound implications for the country and its First Peoples. We're here live to learn Australia's verdict and discuss what it means for all of us. It's six o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Welcome back to our coverage of The Voice referendum. I'm Bridget Brennan. And I'm David Spears. Polls have now closed in Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales and the ACT. Anthony will bring us those first figures in the next 20 minutes or so. And as those results come through, we'll get analysis from the ABC's voice and referendum correspondent Dan Borsher and 7.30's chief political correspondent Laura Tingle. Also with us on the desk, the director of Yes23, Dean Parkin, and Liberal MP, Keith Wallahan. Keith, I'm wondering from you, you were out on some polls this week and talking to people. What was the sense you got from Australians on what they made of this debate and the proposal put to them at this referendum? I think a lot of people, unlike a federal election where they're very quick to give you their opinion about what they think of you and your leader, um, a lot of people walked in there very quietly. Um, there wasn't the usual taking of how-to-vote cards, which makes sense. You don't need much instruction to write yes or no. Um, but people did it quietly and they did it politely. I was worried earlier on there would be tension and maybe some violence, and we saw some little bits of that today. But largely, people were polite, they bought each other coffees and they were kind to each other. And, and that gave me hope that whatever the result tonight, we can come through this as a nation. Dean, uh, anecdotally, it... Uh, apparently there are a lot more yes volunteers out there than no volunteers. Was that your experience from what you've heard in the booths today? And do you think that made a big difference in the end or will make a big difference in the end? Well, it will in the final reckoning of the votes, uh, David. We've had, I think, 80,000 Australians volunteer today mm. um, on polling booths across the country. Every single one of those volunteers is now part of the largest single uh, political volunteer movement this country's ever seen. It's and the I've, largest It's the largest volunteer, volunteer movement. movement this country's ever seen. Wow. Um, so it is a tremendous uh, show of support by Australians and for a good deal of those people that have volunteered over the course, um, a, a big chunk of those, about 60,000 of those have come straight through Yes23. This is the very first time they've ever volunteered. They're not political operatives, mm. they're not members of a party or a, or a campaigning organisation. They're just Australians from all walks of life. I spoke to, uh, I spoke to a volunteer this, this morning um, at Manly um, and I asked her had she been out on the, out on the polls uh, previously and she said no standing there today was the very first time that she'd worn the shirt and she was handing out the how to vote cards for the yes campaign and I uh, I tapped her on the shoulder as I was leaving and said uh, uh, we'll be back we'll be back and we'll be tapping you on the shoulder what again do you mean at some by that? point I'm in history in to, uh, what, is, what do you mean by that because I mean if this does go down tonight obviously with that army, as you called it, that volunteer army. You'll want to build on that, do something with that. When you say, we'll be back, what do you mean? Well, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice movement and reconciliation movement is a very resilient movement. Um, we've had our setbacks in history. We've had some very big setbacks in our history, um, but it always returns. And um, I am absolutely confident on this fact that it will um, return regardless of, uh, of how things pan out today. Um, uh, it will continue. And, and uh, one of the, I think, the interesting things we should take into account tonight as we obviously do this process of, of counting the votes and doing the analysis, and it's fantastic to be here with Anthony and all the experience, um, but this isn't an election. Mm. Um, we didn't start with a base vote uh, 12 months ago, and we'll talk about how the polls have shifted over time, but as the numbers sit there right now, that is what we started with, zero votes. And... The votes that come in now, however many million votes that come in now, don't represent a swing. They represent the creation of a base of support by Australians from all walks of life in support of recognition, in support of a voice, and, uh, and I believe in support of uh, Indigenous progress more generally. And, uh, and that is something that we are absolutely proud of, um, of having been part of creating through this campaign. 
We'll come back to that once we do see some of those results and see where you do end up. Our reporter, Leanne Wong, though, is at a polling place yes, in Essendon Fields in Melbourne. Leanne, votes are, uh, well, they're, they're being counted, we can see in the background there already. Yes. That's exactly right. It's just after six o'clock here in Victoria, meaning all polling locations have now closed and the count can officially begin. I'm here at one of 58 counting centres across the country. You can see behind me there's a real hive of activity. There are dozens of counting staff here making their way through the ballots. Each ballot is counted by hand. And from there, it's a fairly straightforward process where they're essentially making three piles, one for yes votes, one for no votes, and the other for informal votes. The AEC tells me they expect it to be a quicker counting process compared to the federal election simply because they're not having to deal with multiple candidates, for example. Around them, you can also see scrutineers who are patrolling where they're counting. They are appointed by each campaign and they have the ability to challenge any ballots they believe hasn't been marked clearly enough. Now, here in Victoria, it was widely assumed by the Yes campaign that Victoria was a key state they could rely on simply because of its reputation as being one of the most progressive, if not the most progressive, states in the country. Victoria is the most advanced state in regards to treaties with Aboriginal people. It also has already its own representative Indigenous body, similar to the voice called the First People's Assembly. However, speaking to people on the ground here today, the vote appears to be very split, particularly in Melbourne's outer suburbs compared to inner Melbourne, where there appears to be more support for the voice. We've spoken to families and even within the same families, couples, parents, even their own children that seem to be voting differently ways, which just shows how divided the vote very, it really is. Now, every vote cast today at a polling location must be counted tonight. So regardless of when we know the final result of this referendum, it will still be a long night ahead for counting staff here at these centres. Yeah, well, Leanne, thank you and great to see those Electoral Commission staff hard at it already. Yeah, yeah, going very quick on the papers there. Laura, I'm curious to know from you, do you think there's a, a higher or lower amount of engagement with the issues at a referendum compared to what you'd see with voters engaging with a range of issues at an election? Um, I've, I suppose I've been surprised that there is sort of less engagement in a way, given that it's a single question, um, than, uh, than you might get at an election. But in an election, you get people who are engaged for a whole range of different reasons, whether it's the hip pocket, their particular concerns on climate, whatever that might be. Um, so you get people you know, really focused on particular issues. So I think the level of disengagement we hear from people mm. um, is, has been sort of quite a surprise to mm. me and the fact that, you know, we still were hearing reports, you know, only a few days ago that people didn't, didn't know, know the there referendum was referendum referendum right, actually yeah. happening. We heard that from a lot of people, mm. actually. I mean, yeah. it, it, it is interesting. Um, the polls take them for what they are. We'll see how accurate they turn out to be pretty soon. But a lot of them were showing, weren't they, Laura? that this issue, for, for a lot of Australians, just wasn't in the top few issues with cost of living particularly dominating. That's right. Um, we've had this uh, change um, in the last few months. You know, we had the sort of shock of uh, the rising prices after the invasion of Ukraine. But that sort of, as pollsters will say, you know, has led to this sort of sullenness where people just go, this, it's going to be like this for as long as we can, uh, as, as long as we know. So that's tended even before we've had things like um, what's been happening in Israel, um, bef before uh, discussions about China, all of those foreign issues. People have sort of tended to push uh, push the, the, the voice down down the uh, down the chain. And I think, as a lot of people have remarked, um, and as Noel Pearson remarked in his Boyer lectures last year, a lot of people just don't know Indigenous mm. people. So it's it's different from the same sex. Um, marriage proposal. People did know, um, you know, gay f family members or friends, but they didn't, they don't necessarily, after all these t uh, years, necessarily know Indigenous people, so it, they don't have a connection with them. Mm, you wonder whether that um, level of engagement will rise after this debate that we're having. Uh, well, Julie Gallagher is the Chief Executive of the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. She's a Gundich Mara leader and she joins, joins us now from NAM in Melbourne. Ani Jill, great to see you. Now, what has this debate been like for you? I know you've seen many, many struggles for Indigenous rights throughout your life. How would you characterise what you've seen in this debate on a voice to Parliament? Um, well, uh, back in 2017, when the Uluru um, Statement of the Heart was um, put together, I thought, oh, this is going to be a shoo-in. 
Um, and, um, you know, over the last few months, it's been um, quite good, quite, um, what's the word, energising, uh, I'm excited, and um, to see so many allies that come up and support uh, the voice here in Victoria. Um, and I just think it's an amazing momentum in history that this country, um, if we're successful, uh, it would be, um, I don't know, life-changing for many, many, many Aboriginal people right across this continent. Um, and it's, um, you know, I mean, I, I have a little bit of hope that we will be successful. But it's been an interesting thing. I mean, I've never lived through uh, a referendum, so this is my first. Um, uh, I was only a young girl in the 67 referendum, so... But it's been very interesting to see how um, the game is played, so to speak. Mm. Annie Jill, it's Dan Borsha here in the uh, referendum centre on Gadigal Country in Sydney. You talked there about... Uh, how a voice to parliament would be life-changing. You've been a leader, an advocate for many, many years. You uh, have a key role there in terms of frontline healthcare for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Victoria. Why would it be life-changing to you? Well, our people have been disempowered for 230 years. Empowerment is also a very powerful medicine um, and hope is also a very powerful medicine. Um, we still have um, the bad outcomes in our communities. You know, we've still got a gap in life expectancy between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Uh, we're still over-represented uh, in the justice system and the majority of crimes are crimes of poverty. Uh, so we're still dealing with the uh, ramifications of colonisation um, and... You know, we have not never had a voice to Parliament and I believe if we do have this voice, it actually will make change. It will help us to hold us all, not just governments, but also uh, service delivery and systems that are there to supposed to support us, hold us all accountable. Uh, and so, apart from the recognition that it also brings for us as the first peoples of this country. Um, so our people and our cultures will never disappear. It's such a powerful point that you make. And you touched on there the ongoing impacts of colonisation on first peoples. It really surprised me that that became a component of this national debate this year. What was your observation about that? Um... My, uh, well, uh, disappointment, I mean, because the evidence is there. The ev you know, and I don't know what people think, but I know that there is statistical evidence and research that currently exists by non-Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people um, that looks at the, the disadvantage that our communities, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, still suffer uh, as a result of the impacts of colonisation. I mean, colonisation, it was brutal and it was quite quick and it did a lot of damage. Um, you know, I mean, I can stand here and, and talk about the stolen generation. I can stand here and talk about the life expectancy gap, but there is ongoing impacts and it's called transgenerational trauma. Yeah. Anitio, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight and for your... Uh, advocacy over such a very long time. It's, it's wonderful again to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It may be the nation's second smallest state by area, but Victoria contributes 4.5 million voters to tonight's referendum. 66,000 Victorians identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. The city of Greater Geelong is home to the highest population of Aboriginal Victorians. Its traditional owners, the Wadarong, have lived here for tens of thousands of years. In the north of the state, the Dungala, or Murray River, is the life source and spirit of the Yorta Yorta people. In the state's far west lies the UNESCO heritage listed Budge Bim, a dormant volcano sacred to the Gunditjmara people. 
For thousands of years, the Gunditjmara used the volcanic rock from Budgebim's lava to manage water flows and construct fish traps. Well, we have the first figures in, Anthony. What are they showing? Oh, they're absolutely tiny. There's about 200 <laughs> votes in total from Wannan and from Parks. Uh, just to show why we don't um, always use these early figures is that, um, there we go, figures. Uh, in New South Wales, it's 86.6 and uh, Victoria, 76.6. That's 200 votes out of nearly 16 million. So it's not very reliable, <laughs> reliable at this stage. But as I always say, I'm always happy when I see the first votes, whatever they are. Yeah. <laughs> System works. Thanks. <laughs> well, we're going to go to Patricia Carvelis in Brisbane now. She's at the No function there, where there's a relatively small gathering there of No campaigners. And we understand she's got Warren Mundine with her. We'll go to PK now. Yeah, thank you. Warren Mundine, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, yes. OK, so the polls have closed on the East Coast. What's your assessment right now about uh, what you predict will happen across the country? Wow. That, well, hopefully, very shortly, as Anthony Green said, we'll have a, you know, in the next half hour or an hour, we'll have some really good results that will be meaningful. And, uh, and, that'll, and then, of course, uh, within the hour, we'll have uh, Queensland as well. Their results first start coming in. Uh, then half an hour later, we've got South Australia, uh, Northern Territory, and then two hours. Uh, okay. Is Australia. it your sense, though, that you are going to... that this will be defeated in every state? Well, I, from day one, I felt that we could do that. A lot, a lot of our uh, team said, no, it's not possible. <laughs> yeah, then I... Um, you know, it just to me, it was just uh, that we could. I always felt that we could do it, so... Today, the Yes campaign has been reporting, as have voters, that, in fact, there are places where your no campaigners are just not at the booths at all. Have you, have you mismanaged the kind of running of the day? Uh, no, not really. The problem we have is that we don't have the, as many volunteers and that as, uh, as the Yes campaign. Uh, but we, you know, so there were some areas that we couldn't get people to. And, and you know, you look at New South Wales, uh, you know, and that was because of how the uh, Liberal Party was in that state. Uh, but other areas we were able to make up for that. But, you know, I, my feeling is uh, that uh, people have really made up their mind the way they were going into the, into the polling booths today. You say New South Wales was an issue. Explain to me what the issue was. Is it because the New South Wales leadership was, in fact, in favour of the Yes campaign? Yeah, that was part of that, was part of that pro problem. And, and that's why, you know, we had some great volunteers and that out there in, in Sydney and other areas, and especially in the bush. But there were some places that it was very difficult for us. We... You just couldn't get volunteers out? Well, we got one or two, or we got uh, in some places it was one, then and then it was none. So we had to we had to you know fix that. Mm. The yes campaign says that that in fact that's a flaw of your campaign. It wasn't a grassroots campaign because you couldn't get the numbers of volunteers out. What's your response to that? Well, we'll soon know by tonight. <laughs> I want to ask you about the campaign itself. At times, it's been toxic. There's been racism. Do you regret any of the things that your campaign has said? Uh, not from not from the main campaign. Uh, you know, the, the, we were very much on mark. Uh, the way we handled ourselves and what we did. Uh, so I was pretty proud of the team, and I'm pretty proud of our volunteers that are, that went out there and did things. Uh, and but there were some people on the edge of this that was a problem. Uh, my main concern was the uh, what was from the Yes campaign, where their people were major players in their campaign, yeah, and that was a problem. But, but I mean, some of the arguments. I mean, people are saying they think it's a land grab, that perhaps um, that this was going to give all of this power to Indigenous Australians. A lot of that is just demonstrably not true. Should you have been more active in calling it out? Well, when people put that question to me, I, I always called it out. I said, we have never said that from the main campaign. Our thing was about prosecuting the case of why you vote n no. OK. okay. Thank you. All right, we've got to jump out of this. Uh, Warren Mundine there. I'll throw back to you, Bridget. We're just having... Uh, thanks, PK and Warren Mundine. We're just having a little problem, a uh, bit of break-up with the line there. But look, thank you. Interesting to hear from Warren Mundine. Keith, uh, let me come to you. Uh, PK talking to Warren Mundine there about some of the messages from the No campaign. I think clearly the message they landed on uh, as, as an effective message towards the end was that this would divide... The voice would divide Australia by race. 
Is that a line that, or an argument that you agree with? Uh, it is. You can split hairs about the difference between race and ancestry and indigeneity, uh, but, but I, I think it's an argument without a, a difference. Um, I think people know what we mean. Of course there's a, a race power within the Constitution. It's an outdated term that we find distasteful today. But, but when you swap that with indigeneity or ancestry, I, I think people know it means the same thing to them, and it is about equality. That's what it feels for people. And there's a reason, I think, that that was one of the number one reasons for people to vote no. And, and, and I think it's a seductive argument that that is not just one that you can agree with with your head, but also your heart. And, and a good example of that is citizenship ceremonies. When we speak as members at citizenship ceremonies, we tell everyone there we are all equal Australians, 100%. That's an argument that people understand, and I think it was relevant. In but if, 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 that's the, if that's your argument, was there ever any sort of wording or detail around the voice that would have solved that issue? Wouldn't even all, every detail that you were demanding about how the voice might work still have left that fundamental concern you've got that it divides us by race? It, it would. and So, so the, the detail argument was what, a furphy? No, it's not a fair fee. And, and a good comparison is the same-sex marriage plebiscite. There was detail on the table for that. There was a bill, there was two bills. You're saying that wouldn't it's matter? Like, it, it would matter. And let me give you an example. I was the deputy chair of the Joint Select Committee. If we had a bill, we could have compared that against the model to see if it was actually fit for purpose for the model, to see if it, was, it had the boundaries that were needed to have a bill like that. But uh, it still would have, in your view, divided us by race. Uh, on that issue, but for some people, detail was important. For some people, there was many other issues that were important, including but legal for you, risk. I'm asking for you, the, the, would the detail really have mattered, have, have, have solved that problem of dividing us? The, well, the, the number one issue for me was legal risk, and, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. And let's not forget that we were asking Australians to vote on a model, a particular mm. model. That's what we were asking Australians to do. We didn't have a constitutional convention. We had a five-day hearing where only two of those days were devoted to legal experts and legal mm. risk. That's what we put to the Australian people, and we shouldn't forget that. It wasn't just about recognition and listening. Yeah. Uh, all reasonable Australians agree with those two ideas, but we, we put a model to them and they voted on that model. But if uh, you did accept that a proposal to put a recognition statement in the Constitution, for example, uh, would that have been acceptable to you? Definitely. But I, I... Then why not, if, if you're deciding to recognise Aboriginal people as the first peoples of the country, then don't they get... A, a say in, in the matters that affect them? Shouldn't they have some sort of say on the kind of constitutional change that they want? Uh, no doubt, no doubt. But democracy is about compromise. It just is. And, and democracy is about compromise in so many different ways. In, in order to win the vote, in order to earn the trust of the Australian people, uh, I think a constitutional convention could have put that compromise on the table. We could have talked about it. And, and I don't want to write the result off. We've yet to get the results in. But uh, I think it was a, a misstep by the Prime Minister not having a proper constitutional convention and putting the detail forward for us to assess it. We'll come back to everyone on the panel shortly, but we have to go now to Thursday Island, where our reporter Marion Farr is on Thursday Island in the Torres Strait. Marion, what's been the feeling on the ground there today? I know you've been speaking to lots of elders in the past couple of days. How are they feeling tonight? Yeah, well, Bridget, as you know, the Torres Strait has played a really significant role in uh, the fight for Indigenous rights. It's the home of Eddie Mabo, who um, lobbied successfully for his people to be recognised as the traditional owners of their land and um, to overturn the myth of terra nullius. So it's that context that this, in that context that this referendum takes place here on Thursday Island today. And there is a strong desire in the community for recognition and for change. But um, there's quite a mixed uh, view on how that should be achieved. So if you drive around the island here, Waibeni or Thursday Island as it's known, there's a really strong visual presence of the Yes campaign. There are posters on people's um, fences and there are flyers up in on the shop fronts and people wearing shirts saying vote yes. And there is quite a strong support for the Yes campaign on the ground. Um, but when you actually go out and speak to locals, um, there are some people who may not be as vocal or as upfront about their views, but uh, saying quietly that they 
they've decided that they'll vote no. So there is a mixture of opinions. And then there are quite a lot of people that I've spoken with who say that they've actually felt really uncertain about how to vote and reaching a decision has been really difficult. They may have at first thought um, that they would be voting yes and then they've seen a really strong campaign from the no side and um, some really prominent figures come out um, in support of the no campaign and that's just cast a seed of doubt in their mind about which way to vote. So it's safe to say there is a fair bit of uncertainty here in the Torres Strait about um, what, what this referendum and what the result will mean, whether it's yes or no, how that will impact uh, people here in, in the Torres Strait Islands. So a diversity of opinion there on the Torres Strait. Our reporter, Marion Farr, thank you. Anthony's got some more numbers for us. What have you got, Anthony? Oh, there's only about 6,000 votes counted so far, a small number from New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, all quite small from individual electorates. Um, so that's the current position. Um, the ACT, of course, doesn't count for the formula to do with the states, but it's worth looking at the results because they pay taxes as well. The, um, sure <laughs> the <laughs> figures are currently New South Wales 30.5, yes, 69.5, no. 35.9, Victoria, 64.1, no. Um, the yes in the ACT is 71.7 .7 to 28. That's one tiny polling place of 150 votes from the Canberra CBD, so it's not very meaningful. But just to keep the, people the idea that the numbers are starting to roll in now, but they are very, very early. On an election, federal election, we usually correct and project the numbers. At this referendum, we're showing the raw numbers, so the yes case starts very low. Anthony, thank you, and Dean Park, and you'll be hoping, you'll be wishing that the ACT were uh, had statehood at this point, <laughs> but that's that's for a whole other uh, referendum. <laughs> hey, I want to come back to um, you know the, the discussion we're having with Keith there about this um, uh, no argument that it divides us. Is this an argument? I mean, clearly it was effective for the no campaign. Was it one you anticipated? How, how did you um, or didn't you manage to handle that argument? Well, if you ask the people that were involved in the creation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and I was there when it was created, I had the great privilege of signing it, so uh, I was able to listen to what people was talking about, the underlying intention, um, the underlying vision by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from the beginning of this, and I will also add all the way through this campaign, was one of invitation, one of extending the hand of friendship, one of bringing the country together, creating the Uluru State. It talks about creating a richer sense of, of nationhood, of identity of the Australian nation getting this right. So why was right. this argument so effective then? And, and because you, it became politicised, David. It's, it's, let's, just, let's just call it out straight away. It became um, caught up the minute that, uh, that there was a uh, concerted and deliberate political opposition to this. The whole nature and tone of the debate uh, really descended and, and focused in on this question of, of, of dividing um, Australians. And, and that, is, that is a great shame. That is a great shame, not just regardless of this vote, and I know that's a very difficult thing for me to say as campaign director and, and as the votes are literally rolling in on a historic referendum, but regardless of that, um, the idea that we, it was actively taken as a, as, a, as, a, as a tactic to openly try and divide Australians on this nation when the originators of this were the people who put it in great faith, with great heart um, and great vulnerability to the rest of the nation, said that this is about bringing us together, uh, this is about moving us forward as a nation. I, I think... There's going to be a lot of analysis about this whole campaign, about this referendum, about what happens to us as a nation after this. I don't want us to lose sight of... Because... And it has, and it continues to be taken out of the realm. In some ways, Indigenous people have been spoken over in this debate and it has become so politicised that leaders, political leaders, are having this conversation almost to the exclusion of the Indigenous people who who first put this forward. So mm. um, I think... But it wasn't just political leaders making this argument. Uh, I mean, this was central to the everyone on the no side, right, at the end? But, the, but most of... Let's be honest, most of the um, leaders of the no argument are political leaders. Um, they're not actually the grassroots Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that came together to form the Uluru Statement from the heart. They are professional politicians, either current or, or former and, and aspiring still. Um, so um, it, it was very much on the no side 
uh, politicised, a politicised argument rather than one which, which really addressed the question that was being put forward and the opportunity that was being put forward by Indigenous Australians through the Uluru Statement and through this campaign. If I could just take you up on that, Dean, and also just reflect on um, your comment about, you know, we will be back. One of the things that has happened since uh, the Uluru um, meeting in 2017 and in this campaign is we've seen this new generation of Indigenous leaders come up, um, you know, and they're not going away. But it's, they've got a sort of a different... They've come from different places, um, you know, say, to the people who emerged during Mabo and Wick, who were often representatives of land councils and a lot of really smart lawyers. Um, I, and, of course, the Howard government didn't just dismantle ATSIC, it actually dismantled a lot of Aboriginal organisations and, therefore, sort of black institutions. How do you see the sort of the leadership and where they've come from? And I, I'd be interested, too, in what Dan has to say about this, you know, about where where these leaders are and where they can continue to rise up in the next few years. Well, that's been the brilliant thing about this process, Laura, and, and I'm not going to just try and put a, a, a positive spin on everything here, but, but, but I'm also not going to ignore some of the great strengths that have emerged through this, this process. You have seen very, very strong, natural, community-based leaders, people like... Uh, Daniel Morrison, Wanjanung Corporation in Western Australia, Josie Douglas in Central Australia. You have seen strong um, leaders who are, who are both traditional and, and, and have that cultural connection and very much modern leaders in their own right. Um, with a, Understand that for all of us that are involved in this, whether we are younger or, 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 or older, we are connected through time and we are connected through the struggle. We're connected through our DNA into this. So while it might feel like there are, and I would not say this, that there are different generations coming through, um, we are absolutely on the shoulders of and connected to those that have come before and indeed, as difficult as this might be for some people to understand, those that are yet to come. Mm -hmm. Should point out, polls have just closed in South Australia, so we'll start to see some early numbers from South Australia before too long, but uh, uh, it has gone six o'clock now in South Australia. Dan, what are your reflections on some of the new batch of leaders coming through and the diversity of voices that we heard during this campaign? Well, I think we have one of them sitting at the <laughs> other end of this panel, and I'm sure that Dean will, will tell me I'm wrong and, that, and be a bit embarrassed by that. But I think what we've, we've actually seen is a whole range of... Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that haven't necessarily had a space on the national platform before, really raising their voices. I mean, that's been the story within the ABC. We are seeing and hearing from journalists that have got a whole wealth of experience that haven't been heard before. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. I've been doing a whole lot of other jobs, but we've been able to see a whole lot of different perspectives. There, Dean, there is Sal Sally Scales from the Uluru Dialogues. Uh, there is Jacinta Nampajipa Price on the other side of politics who is a very new politician who has catapulted into this role as Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, been the front person for the entire campaign for No, along with Warren Mundine that we heard from earlier. So I think what, what we're seeing and hearing is a whole range of different perspectives. And really, regardless of the outcome tonight, that can only be a good thing to have more voices, if you will, in the political discourse about us on the national stage. I think it can only be a good thing. It's just what we do with those voices and how we hear them going forward. The listening part is, of course, key to that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, let's go to Anthony, because I think we've got some more figures from South Australia, Anthony. Well, I haven't got South Australia yet. yet. It's only just closed, no, just but closed. I do have some more figures from the other states. Now, at this stage, none of them have reached 1%, but I am starting to see some trends already. So if let's look at the actual figures again. That's the yes over here. No on this side. Now, on these raw numbers, of course, the no's well ahead, as I kept saying, that the figures have tended to come from smaller polling places, tend to favour the yes case, the no case initially, and the yes vote rises. On some comparisons with the last federal election, these numbers are looking towards the yes being in the 40s, very early, and you can't call it yet. So they're not that low for the yes case. But there is one interesting thing I'm spotting already, and I was watching for this, uh, and that is a difference between in, in the metropolitan areas. In eastern Sydney, there's a higher yes vote than in western Sydney. Um, there's a bit of a difference there in the different parties of the seats. But the key thing is if I actually I look at New South Wales, it makes it a little easier to see. 
in country New South Wales, a big majority for no. Big majority for no in, in the regional areas. Uh, a smaller majority for no in the Hunter and Illawarra. And then a difference between inner and outer Sydney. 59% no in outer Sydney, 45% or 54% yes in inner Sydney. And we're seeing a much bigger shift from the Labor vote of the last election to yes um, in those areas. So it looks to me already we're seeing a trend like the Republic in 1999 is that there's a difference between inner and outer suburban areas. Even on those early figures, we can see it at this stage. We'll see if that follows through the night. Thanks, Anthony. More figures to come in throughout the night. Well, Keith, as we were just speaking there about the diversity of voices across Australia and the people we've heard from, from urban, regional, remote communities, how does a government or ministers listen to those diversity of voices if there's no representative structure? No, it's a very good question. Um, I'm a new member of the House of Representatives. I'm one of 151. Our core job is listening. Uh, for example, in my electorate a week ago, I had 20 listening posts, 10 in that weekend and 15 in another. Uh, that's where it all starts. Um, Deans, we've met in Canberra and, and I hope whatever happens tonight, we keep doing that because I really valued your contribution in this campaign and we met in private. I, I think we need to do our job and if there's anyone in the House of Representatives or the Senate who's not listening to Indigenous Australians, I'd love to know who they are because there's goodwill across all sides. Wouldn't it be easier to do with a voice structure to bring in all those diversity of communities that are concerned about common issues? Of course it's one way, but it doesn't have to be in the Constitution. That, that, that's what the whole point is. We're here for a referendum voting on a particular model. So you could legislate it? Of course you can. Of course and you can. And you'd be happy with that? Well, you know, I'm not going to announce policy here no, just on, what you on, think. tonight, but, but the idea of listening is a good one. No, no, no reasonable person disagrees with that. The well, idea we, of legislating a voice? Well, well, of course, but the focus should be on the grassroots because that's where the most disadvantage is and that's mm. where the most work has to be what, done. What does that mean when you say that the focus should be on the grassroots? What do you, what do you mean? Well, well, we know we're a federation and, and we know that the closer you are to your community, uh, the more context you have and the better you can deliver results that are appropriate for that community. The Indigenous community in Healesville is quite different from the Indigenous community in Alice Springs. That's why it's important to recognise that diversity and listen to the groups within those areas. To play devil's advocate, isn't that a voice? Of course it is, but, but, but again, to come back to it, mm. it's about a model to amend the constitution, not just a model, a new chapter, a new chapter, remember the... The Parliament, the Executive and the Courts have their own chapters. It's got three parts. We haven't talked much about that tonight and we didn't talk much about it in the committee that I was Deputy Chair of. I think that's one of the reasons we are where we are. Dean, uh, when it comes to this idea of legislating the voice, if it doesn't get up tonight as uh, uh, part of the Constitution, we know the Prime Minister's ruled it out if there's a no vote. What do you think, though? Would you like to see some sort of legislated voice? Oh, look, I think we've got to get through tonight. Um, the, 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 the result tonight stands on its own. Um, and to now start proposing alternative policy um, solutions, I mean, that's, it's, it's kind of why we said and have consistently said all the way through um, that voting yes is the only chance to give us a real uh, policy change here as well as that constitutional change. But if there's change. not a yes vote tonight, if there's a no vote, it doesn't sound like you're ruling out the idea. Oh well, I've taken the I've taken the prime minister at, he, at his word on this. I mean, the one. But what thing do you the, think should happen? Well, I I, I think we should. Um, as I say, I think we should get through tonight. But I, but I think that the uh, what the prime minister has said, and I think we've got to take him at his word because the one thing that this prime minister has done, it he is um, he has carried through on his commitments. Um, he carried through on his commitment to hold this referendum. Can I just pick up this question on the um, the, the the emphasis on the remote polls? And I think this is the uh, the remote areas. Uh, as, a, as a Yes campaign, we absolutely put the focus in on making sure that this process and that this voice conversation um, got to the ground in those remote parts of the country. Um, we had volunteers in the most remote parts of Indigenous Australia, through Central Australia. Um, we made sure that they were there on the remote polling booths. There wasn't a single no campaigner on any of those remote polling booths throughout this campaign. And so it's fine, to, it's fine for Warren to say, well, we had a couple of people in inner Sydney and we chucked a couple in the, in the outer mm. suburbs. Um, but if you're serious about understanding where this is most needed, where the voice was going to have the greatest impact, the people who were most affected by this decision tonight, the no camp didn't even turn up. So I, 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 I just find some of these inconsistencies about mm. what's being said about listing the grassroots voices, but then the actual action 
um, kind of doesn't really back that we'll up. We'll see what uh, impact that has on those particular um, results when they come in. I just want to remind you as we start to see some of the results come in, Orange is no, purple is yes, and you'll see those on the bottom of the screen there as well as more of those results come in on Anthony's screen as well. Remember, it's the uh, orange colour for the no vote tonight and purple for yes. We're also joined tonight with their political uh, analysis and campaign analysis by former Labor strategist Cos Samaras and former Liberal strategist Tony Barry, uh, both now at the consulting firm Redbridge. Uh, good to see you both there. Um, Cos, to you first, just some reflections uh, briefly, if you can, mm. on how this campaign ended and what we're seeing in some of those very early figures so far. Basically, I think the campaign can be summed up uh, uh, one that is focused from both camps, that's no and yes, on uh, the inner parts of our large cities uh, and to a lesser extent some of those regional communi communities that we've just touched on before. But absent is definitely the outer suburbs and uh, uh, unfortunately for one side, and we'll find out tonight, that's where this referendum will be decided, in the outer suburbs of our large cities. Uh, and we could see already, and Anthony touched on it, the, the difference in, in, in support for the yes proposition in the outer suburbs of, of Sydney and Melbourne in particular, and I expect that to be a, a pattern for tonight. We can go to the infrastructure in terms of the, the, what the two camps actually rolled out. There, for, for example, today there were volunteers missing from all those outer suburban uh, polling places from both sides, but in particular the no camp. That's a problem given proportionally the most undecided voters live in the outer, 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 outer suburbs of our cities. So they weren't being given a final pitch. Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting to compare uh, to an election campaign in terms of the, the resources, the volunteers and so on. But, Tony, just sticking with this divide that we're seeing already in those early numbers, it was expected between the inner and outer parts of the major metropolitan areas and then regional Australia as well. What does that tell us about Australia? I think uh, we've been saying for some time is uh, Australia is becoming a nation of smaller and smaller tribes. It's no longer a homogenous sort of, uh, you know, one-size-fits-all message. Uh, and um, what we're seeing is, you know, very different communities of interest all around Australia. And it's not just state by state anymore. It's, it's even in capital cities. There's inner suburban, outer suburban, middle suburban, peri-urban. So that makes it very hard to pitch a message that unifies all of Australia or that captures all of Australia which is part of the reason why we're seeing a collapse in primary vote of the, of the major parties as well. If I could just ask, uh, taking you up on that point about the outer uh, suburban areas, uh, I'm just curious about uh, how important you think people manning the votes, uh, manning the polls has actually been today. I mean, was your sense that there are still a mm. lot of people who are undecided and who might, who might be there for, uh, up for grabs, if you like, um, when, uh, when they went into the polling booths? The, the, we do know that uh, through some of the data that we've collected throughout this campaign that the number of undecided voters in the outer suburbs is, as I touched on before, proportionally much larger. But also what's driving that, un that undecided sentiment is, is uh, not enough information or people, voters not having enough information, uh, not being sure what, what this, the referendum is about, not having enough detail. So they're turning up to the polling places with an open mind. And uh, whoever was there handing a, a bit of material to them uh, may indeed be able to actually switch them. Now, we know that's, that, that's, we're dealing with small numbers there, but it still makes a difference. Cos, Tony, thank you both. We'll check in with you a bit later in the evening. Want to go to Anthony again with uh, more numbers. What have you got? Well, some of these figures are starting to come up. New South Wales on 3.3, Tasmania 3.8, 1.1 there for Tasmania, 1.4. Victoria, let's look at the actual percentages. Now, um, uh, people were watching closely. We just got some first figures from South Australia. I haven't seen where they're from, so I won't comment on that. Uh, again, obviously a small rural area. Um, the yes vote has been rising, as we've expected, from the low 30s earlier, getting higher now. Uh, the ACT, uh, the yes is still ahead. What I wanted to talk about was Tasmania, because um, it's the most advanced, it's much quicker to count than the votes down there. We've got five electorates. Bass is in the North, Bridget's Archer's seat, the Liberal held seat around Launceston. Um, 44.7 for yes. Braddon, which is up in the northwest, and Lyons in the centre, the two more rural seats, they're doing very badly for, for the no case and at this, for the yes case. And at this stage, they are dragging the whole state vote down. Franklin, the yes case is just slightly ahead. Franklin is the outer seat of, of, um, of Hobart. We have no votes from Clark, which is the independent Andrew Wilkie's seat on the western side of the, of the river. 
once we see some figures in from Clark and we get an idea if, the, if what, how Clark's going, then we may be close enough to calling Tasmania. But at the moment, on the trends in Bass, Braddon and Lyons and with Franklin Line Ball, then Clark isn't going to compensate for those other three seats with very solid no votes. So uh, at the moment, it's trending away from the yes case in Tasmania on these numbers with 3.8% counted. Well, just, just on that, I know you're not calling that yet. These are still early numbers in Tassie, but this is a, you know, we've said it throughout the campaign, a critical state, swing state. You, just to underscore what you're saying there, Anthony, it's not looking good. It's not, it's not looking good. Bridget Archer, Archer was campaigning at four in the north. Now, um, her vote, I mean, compared to Braddon and Lyons, that's a relatively good ra result. And I presume there's a lot more Launceston booths to come in that may, may okay. tilt it in the favour. We're doing a lot of comparisons in some modelling with the Labor vote at the last election. There's an observation, and this happened in 99, it seems to be happening here. In the country areas, the comparison between the yes-no percentage and the two party preferred of the election is holding up. But when you get into the cities, you're getting very different patterns, as I was mentioning about Sydney earlier. So uh, we're getting some more meaningful figures now, and we're getting a pattern where uh, New South Wales, South Australia, New South, sorry, New South Wales, Victoria, and um, Tasmania, to me, are all trending towards being above 40. But uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, we should get a better handle on where they're going to finish up. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Anthony. Well, we know South Australia was a key state for both campaigners, spending a lot of time there in the previous weeks, um, over this week's six weeks campaign. And we're going to go to our reporter, Jack Evans, in Adelaide on Ghana country. Jack, tell us, you've been speaking to lots of mob there. I know you're at an event tonight. What's people's feeling on how the vote in South Australia will go tonight? Yeah, so I'm at the Living Ghana Cultural Centre at Waraparinga, which is a significant site for the Ghana people. And yeah, there's an event taking place here. There's been live music. Uh, there's talks from elders and traditional owners. Um, there's lots of bush tucker. I saw a wombat on a leash walking around before. Um, and later there's going to be a... <laughs> <laughs> we had a there's we also had a, a snake and a crocodile. <laughs> well, the wildlife are out tonight on Ghana country. The wildlife certainly are out tonight. And, that, and you know, the vibe here it's very relaxed, it's very calmed. Um, I think there's a lot of support for the Yes campaign. I've seen that in the badges and shirts and people I've spoken to. And people are really taking this as an opportunity because the event wasn't actually scheduled to be part of the referendum. It, it was already in place before the date was announced, but um, they decided to embrace that and use it as an excuse for people to come together during this time to connect, to learn from each other, um, and also take in some of the culture, or one of the many cultures that this whole thing is all about. Um, and, you know, if we do get a result, I've asked if I could go on stage and make an announcement, and they politely told me no. But oh, wow. I'm sure <laughs> uh, if we do get a result, it will spread. I think that breaking news would have been delivered very well by you, Jack. Well, look, how are people supporting <laughs> one another? Because it's obviously been a difficult campaign for all sorts of mobs and particularly there on Ghana country where there's been a lot of attention on the campaign in the past couple of weeks. How are pe people coming together tonight? Yeah, I was speaking to one of the musicians before and um, she sort of... Her sentiment was that tonight's sort of about bunkering down and seeing the storm through. And so, you know, like I said, this wasn't a, an, a planned event for the referendum, but it's really special that the community is still being able to come together and support each other and, and not necessarily talk about what's happened or, or reflect, but just take in all the culture and, and the connectedness of the people here. So beautiful for everyone there. Thank you so much, Jack Evans, and we'll come back to you a little later in the evening. <laughs> the red dirt and rocky outcrops of the Ananu Pichinjara Yunkunjara land sprawl across more than 100,000 square kilometres of arid South Australian outback. It's home to the Pichinjara, Yunkunjara, and Nanunjara peoples. They're among more than 30 Aboriginal language groups in South Australia, with histories dating back tens of thousands of years. A few hundred kilometres away lies Gatitanda, the massive salt lake also known as Lake Eyre, and home to the Arabana spiritual keeper, Warana. Further east, the River Murray winds its way from the Victorian border to the Coorong, with twists and turns said to have been formed when a giant codfish was hunted by the namesake of the local Naranjeri people. From the dusty outback to the rugged coast, 43,000 South Australians identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. That's 2.4% of the South Australian population. 
Most live on Ghana land, the Adelaide Plains and hills whose landscape features strongly in the Chilbrooky Dreaming. South Australia is the fifth most populous state in Australia, and more than 1.2 million people are enrolled to vote in this referendum. Well, the numbers are rolling in. And just a reminder, this big wall behind us, you can see some of those smaller circles starting to light up. Orange for no, purple for yes. They represent the smaller circles, each of the 151 federal electorates around the country. Now, you don't need to win a majority of federal electorates. As we keep saying, to win a referendum, you need a majority of states and the national majority of the vote. But you'll get an idea of how that is looking uh, on the board behind us. We'll get a better idea with Anthony Green, who's got the latest count for us. Anthony. Well, what, what we're actually going to do is actually call something which is uh, not related to the referendum result. It's the ACT. Uh, the ACT, as expected, is showing a very strong yes vote. I've been looking at... We've got about 25 polling places. And every one of them has voted yes with almost no shift compared to the last federal election. So we're pretty confident. We've only got about 3% counted the same in each electorate, but every one of them is showing exactly the same trend. Now, of course, the ACT, while the voters count towards the national total, the ACT does not count towards the majority of states question. So while we might call the ACT for yes, and ACT was the only place that voted for the Republic in 1999... Yeah. Um, we believe the ACT has voted yes to the voice, but as I said, that doesn't factor into the equation of states for determining the referendum result. So the first jurisdiction is in there, just that breaking news from Anthony Green, and rightly pointing out it doesn't count towards the majority of states, being a territory, but the ACT has voted yes to enshrining an Indigenous voice in the Constitution. Dean Parkin, did you do much campaigning in the ACT or was this one sort of in the in the bag all along? We campa campaigned everywhere, David, and um, the beauty of our campaign, being a people's-led campaign, was that uh, people just signed up. Mm -hmm. um, they signed up as volunteers. They wanted to get out on the ground. Um, one of the great... Uh, stories that I heard uh, during the campaign was from a, uh, a younger woman who was uh, a Territorian um, in the ACT. Uh, she actually moved physically to the Gold Coast for six months so that she could campaign figuring that the ACT might be one of these um, safer jurisdictions. <laughs> she actually moved her life That's for commitment. six months That's commitment. <laughs> to be on the Gold Coast um, to, to help out in a, in, a, in a slightly tougher part of the country. So it's been those stories of, yeah. of volunteers and supporters getting behind and going well, we, well yeah, above. We don't have any results yet. The Queensland uh, vote, uh, the polls are still open there for another nine minutes or so before the polls close in Queensland. But I do need to ask you about what uh, Anthony was reporting to us earlier with Tasmania. We've got nearly 6% of the vote counted there and it's still struggling, the yes vote, to get up to 40%. Now, this is a critical state we know uh, to win. I mean, you need to win Tasmania. Um, just looking back, how do you explain that? Why do you think it is struggling below 40% at the moment there? Oh, look, I think uh, we always knew that it was going to be tough across the board, um, more broadly, David, in, in terms of getting those votes up to where we needed them. Um, as this campaign progressed. I do want to shout out to the Yes campaign team that are down there. They did a tremendous effort crisscrossing the state over a great period of time. Um, and leaders like Rodney Dillon down there in Tasmania, Nick Cameron, that just really took this on and led their um, Aboriginal communities down there in Tasmania with some No doubt, but I'm just wondering if you can identify for our viewers why you think we're seeing this sort of result. Look, I think um, there's a lot of people in Tasmania that are doing it quite tough at the moment and this cost of living um, issue that has been an issue that faces all Australians, we know that um, it, it's particularly uh, pertinent in places like Tasmania um, and I think that's something that has, you know, the points that we've made before about where the priority for this referendum lies in terms of people's priorities more broadly, understand that when we go to a normal election, it doesn't even make the first page. It's, it's right down the bottom. Indigenous Affairs, more broadly, is right down the bottom of the first page. Um, part of the reason why we've said we need a constitutionally guaranteed voice because it's never going to be a vote winner. It's never going to be a vote winner. We're never going to exert that political power to make sure that we've got a voice there. Um, there are pressing issues facing people right now in that cost of living crisis that a lot of people are faced with. And I think that's probably had a, an impact in places like uh, Tasmania. And I think it's probably also something that's reflective of the inner um, city um, support. And as you get further out into those suburbs as well. Um, and that's, you know, 
that's understandable because people are struggling and they are looking to you know, pay their rent and put food on the tables for their families. That's a reality facing millions of Australians as we speak right now. And you could argue whether there was a right time to hold a referendum. Well, name me anybody that could wa wave a magic wand and say, well, we're going to do it in 2025 and know that it's going to be perfect timing but if for you, that. But if you had gone in 2024, would you have had more time to explain to Australians who were still waiting in line, like this week, saying, I don't, I don't really know what the voice is about, I don't know what I'm voting on? Would, there, would that have given you more time for education campaigns to, you know, particularly to non-Indigenous Australians? I mean, I think you have to balance up the, um, the, the ability for us to be able to cut through on the education campaigns with the historic level of misinformation that has been propagated throughout this campaign as well. Um, and I, to be honestly speaking, that, that hasn't shown any signs of abating as this campaign has progressed. In fact, if anything, it's gotten worse. Um, so I think um, this idea that you just sort of string it out, uh, a longer campaign is a more costly campaign. Um, it's a difficult thing to keep going. A lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that have been advocating for the last six and a half years also, we're pretty tired mm -hmm. um, about the efforts taken to get to this point. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're pretty resilient, but we don't have a bottomless well of energy in, uh, to, to do this. So I think, you know, we're not going to sit here and commentate and say too soon, too late, whatever, um, we are where we are and, as we say, we'll see the votes come in and, and um, deal with what comes after that. All right, just going to interrupt uh, there, Dean, thank you for that. Anthony's got some more news for us, Anthony. Yeah, look, just first off, a state update, 9.5 in New South Wales County, Tasmania, 12.4. If I look at the actual figures that are, that are out there, you can see New South Wales is now up over the 40% for the count so far. Victoria, 43. Tasmania's on above 40. Very early figures for South Australia, as I said, we've already called the ACT. I want to look at Tasmania in particular because I think, we're very, I think we can call Tasmania at this stage. Um, with about 12% of the vote counted, we got the no case on 59 in Tasmania. In Bass... No's on 57. Braddon, 72, is no. Lyons, 68, for no. Franklin is bouncing around about around 50%. Clark is on 60.6%. But just have a look at the individual polling places in Clark. Clark covers the western side of Hobart. It's in two parts. In the north of Glenorchy, which is the predominantly working class, traditional labour burning part, end of the electorate. And in the south, you've got Sandy Bay, the Hobart City Council area. They're getting lots of yeses in Sandy Bay and lots of noes in Claremont and Glenorchy. Mm. So that electorate is splitting like that. I had a look at Bass for the polling places. All the country's big swing in the rural areas against, um, against the yes case. So the, the, a good, strong yes vote outside of Launceston. There's some better-looking booths in Launceston itself. So Bass, the figures may rise in 75% of, of Bass is in Launceston. But at this stage, there's enough votes in for Tasmania that what I have, what I have, whatever happens in Bass and Clark, it's not enough to compensate for the other electorates. So we're pretty confident that Tasmania has voted no to the referendum. Thanks, Anthony. We'll, we'll probably have your prediction. It sounds like quite soon there that Tasmania looks to be voting no in tonight's referendum. And we have it there, breaking news. Um, well, that is, yeah, and Bridget, that is, as you know, a big blow for the Yes campaign, given the importance of Tasmania to win the four states they need, four out of the six, to win this referendum. So with Anthony now calling Tasmania for the no side, the yes side would need to win New South Wales, Victoria, uh, Queensland um, and South Australia, or WA if not one of those. And we know that WA and Queensland have always been very difficult, it seemed, for the yes side. So this puts the Yes campaign in a very difficult position to win from here. Tasmania was always going to be uh, critical in terms of getting that pathway to a majority of states. Yeah. Why have Tasmanians voted no? Uh, well, we heard from some of them after some voters in Tasmania after casting their ballots today. I voted no today. I do understand like the whole yes and everything, but personally I just think we all are one people you know no one's like we're not putting a line in between us all as if they're separate from us we're all one person we all represent each other at the end of the day i think we need a united australia yeah one for all yeah, all for one it's like the lack of information it's just yeah doesn't give us a confidence as to so i'd rather have it know and then have it reviewed more than just go yes and just then have repercussions after that. I felt that we already have them in the parliament, um, our Indigenous people, so I kind of thought I'll go the no vote today. Yeah. I don't know what's 
really about. So I just voted no. I voted no. And why did you vote no? Um, because a black man up the back of the country doesn't, he doesn't get anything. He gets all he needs. Yeah, most Aboriginal people get all they need. My family's Aboriginal. Yeah. We'll go over to you, Keith, and some final observations very quickly before we go to news headlines on what we're seeing tonight. Yeah, I've said it a few times tonight, but we should never forget that tonight is about a change to the Constitution and particular words that were put to people. We heard from some of the people in Tasmania reference equality and detail. I just There will be reflections later on in the coming days, but I think it was a significant mistake not to have a constitutional convention. I'm confident you would have brought, if there was compromise, more Liberals in the Parliament, more people in the community, and you would have had more people out there arguing for it. Um, uh, and I think we will reflect on that, that maybe there was hubris from the Aston by-election, which coincided in the exact moment that we were having that Joint Select Committee. And Dean uh, Parkin, before we let you go as well, it's not looking good for the Yes campaign from here. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Um, look, I think uh, we always knew that this was going to be tough. As I said, I'm incredibly proud of the efforts that has been put in across the board. Um, and I think, um, you know, this question of division has been raised uh, a few times um, we heard it by the No campaign, and, and, and uh, I've got a lot of respect for Keith. Um, and I think um, we all need to think about these next couple of days very deeply. Um, and I think that if the, uh, the No campaign that has run hard on ending division... Um, then particularly the parliamentarians that are party to that um, cause um, now have a very solemn duty to make sure that the days that follow uh, are not characterised by further political point scoring and further division, that every effort, and particularly our parliamentarians who will be commenting uh, on this in the next couple of days and particularly in that next sitting week in Canberra, um, that there is um, a concerted and decent effort to make sure that the sentiment and commentary from here on is about unifying and bringing the country together. Um, if, if, the, if the no case stands for ending um, division, then it needs to um, live by those words and, and conduct itself in a way that signals very strongly to Australia that we've got to bring the country together. A really important Thank message uh, and you know, the respect that clearly the two of you have for each other is, is appreciated as well. But before we let you go though, we do need to go back to Anthony who's got some more breaking news for us. Yeah, I'll, I'll just actually, just because I just realised it's there, I just thought I'd look at what we said about Tasmania. There was a bit of a dip and an up and down and it's just settling down. And that's, that's what we've called Tasmania. If I look at New South Wales at the moment, um, a really low start for yes, and then it's settling down. Now, what I need to do is look at this, what's happening in New South Wales. Uh, across the whole state, it's about 42.6% yes. New South Wales regional is 33.7 yes, 66 no, so two to one. The Hunter and Illawarra is voting 55% no. This is a part of New South Wales which votes 60% Labor at general elections. So the yes vote is way down on what the Labor vote would be. And the yes case really struggles if it can't keep Labor voters on side. Outer Sydney is 57% no. Inner Sydney is 57.6 no. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. So what we're seeing there is the same divide that we saw with the Republic and we're seeing again here is that the Labor seats are not returning yes majorities and that makes it almost impossible for yes to get a majority. At this stage, we're saying we can't see New South Wales getting above 43, 44% at best for yes. So on that basis, we're prepared to call New South Wales as having voted no. Mm. Well, there you go. More breaking news from Anthony. New South Wales has voted no to the Indigenous voice being enshrined in the Constitution. That follows Tasmania also voting no. So the, uh, the Yes campaign would need to win every other state, and that, of course, is most unlikely. Uh, two states already in the no column, Tasmania and New South Wales. We had to see Victoria. Uh, polls only just closing now in Queensland. We have to see more figures out of South Australia. And then, of course, WA is going to be a bit later on. But right now, with two states voting no, um, well, this is all but over for the, uh, for the Yes campaign, you'd have to say. But, of course, we'll wait and see the actual results as they come in. But a difficult start, indeed, uh, to the count tonight for yeah, the Yes more, side. More counts to come as we continue into the night. We want to say thank you to Keith Wilhelm and thank to Dean Parkin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And, of course, uh, we're going to have more of those numbers coming in very shortly. There's plenty else going on tonight, so we do want to keep you up to speed with what's going on with Gemma Vaness in the newsroom. Gemma. Thanks, David. Well, it is morning in Gaza, where anticipation of a full-scale Israeli ground offensive is growing. The Israeli military has advised 1.1 million Palestinians in northern Gaza to evacuate south, saying it'll allow the safe movement of Gazans on two main roads over the next five hours. And as an invasion looms, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has vowed to crush... We are striking at our enemies with unprecedented might. I emphasise, this is just the beginning. Our enemies have only begun paying the price, and I won't detail what is yet to come. The Israeli army is already conducting raids inside Gaza. According to Israeli media, the IDF recovered the bodies of a number of Israeli hostages in a raid overnight. Over 120 Israeli hostages are still being held in Gaza. And yesterday, families streamed down the main road out of Gaza after Israel issued that warning to relocate south. Hamas says 70 people, mostly women and children, have been killed while fleeing and called for residents to stay in their homes. The UN Secretary General says passage across the Gaza Territory is dangerous. Moving more than one million people across a densely populated war zone to a place with no food, water or accommodation when the entire territory is under siege is extremely dangerous and in some cases simply not possible. 825 Australians have left Israel and occupied territories. The first flight repatriating Australians from Israel landed in London earlier today. The Qantas flight carrying 238 Australian evacuees left Tel Aviv late Friday afternoon local time. Early results in the New Zealand general election show Labor's six-year rule could be ending. With around 33% of votes counted, the National Party is ahead of Labor, 41.5% to 25%. National and the ACT Party could together form government, with early results indicating the two parties look likely to secure 64 seats. That's three more than needed. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins' Labor Party is facing a potential loss of 30 MPs compared to the last NZ election in 2020. Think About It has claimed this year's $20 million Everest horse race at Randwick. Ridden by Sam Clipperton, Think About It was in third with 300 metres to run, but then stormed home to claim the $7 million prize for first place. I Wish I Win and Private Eye rounded out the podium. It's such a nice run in the race and you travelled so well. I'm like, this stuff doesn't happen. To... It just went too perfect. I guess that's what very good horses do. Looking at the weather around the capital cities for tomorrow, Brisbane and Sydney will be sunny. Canberra's expected to be cloudy. The showers increasing in Melbourne and Hobart. Showers also in Adelaide. Perth and Darwin will be sunny. Back to our coverage of the Voice referendum. Welcome back to the ABC's Referendum Centre. I'm David Spears. And I'm Bridget Brennan. Polls have just closed in Queensland and counting is now getting underway in that state. And we'll bring you our new panel shortly. But first, let's get the latest with Anthony Green. Anthony, what are we seeing? I thought for the, the first time we'd present the national figures. Now, of yep. course, there are no figures from Queensland or Western Australia or the Northern Territory. And South Australia is very limited. So this is basically the three main southeast states. And it's 55.6% no, 44.4%. Yes, and as you can see, that's about 1.6 million votes. So that's about a 10%, count. what's a 9.6% count. Um, now let's have a look at the states and just to, uh, I have to do two buttons for this. I'll show first the percentage counted. We've got New, uh, oof, this is New South Wales at 20% counted, 11.9 in Victoria, Tasmania 25.5, ACT 11.8. Now, just to show the, um, the figures at the moment, New South Wales is 42.9, that's why we've called it Tasmania is 42.4, we've called it. Victoria is on 47.5. We're looking at where the votes are from and at this point we're projecting it's going to be about 50%. Mm. So Victoria is line ball, so we certainly won't be calling Victoria for some time. And in Melbourne itself, we're not seeing the same trend we're seeing in Sydney. The trend between inner and outer, east and west, is much greater 
in, New, in Sydney than it is in Victoria. So I think that that's why Victoria is going to take what, quite a while to call. South Australia, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at the South Australian figures. I've been too busy calling other states and its, it's count is not as progressed so far as, uh, as the other states. But at this stage, we've called those two states and, of course, called the ACT. We're now waiting for Queensland figures and in the next half hour while we're waiting for those, we'll get a better handle on South Australia and Victoria as well. Thanks, Anthony. Well, we'll bring in a new panel now. Independent Senator for Victoria, Lydia Thorpe, joins us. And Tanya Hosh, the Executive General Manager of Inclusion and Social Policy at the AFL. Good evening to you both, Lydia. Your thoughts tonight on the results we're seeing coming through? Tasmania voting no? Oh, well, not surprised, given uh, the country hasn't been taken on a journey and that the referendum ultimately was a bad idea in the first place. So... Uh, I'm not surprised that uh, we've got no votes coming out strongly because people don't either know what it's about or that in terms of the black sovereign movement, uh, we don't want to go into the constitution. And, and I think, you know, we've, we've been loud and clear about that and we've certainly got a lot of support How showing. Your campaign wasn't as influential as perhaps the Conservative no, um, or wasn't as, didn't get as much coverage, I would say, but uh, do you think it was as influential as that Conservative case? Were you speaking with people who had changed their mind having listened to your position on The Voice? Absolutely. Uh, the Black Sovereign Movement position has been the position since invasion uh, and it's grassroots activists who have resisted colonisation for over 200 years. We've never changed our position uh, and a lot of people uh, were, you know, aware of that and realised that this is a movement that needs to happen in this country uh, and we need truth-telling as part of that process and ultimately a treaty. Going into the Constitution at this time and having a referendum at this time has, as you know, from the beginning I said it was a waste of money uh, and I also said it would divide our people. So here we are down the track 12 months later and, you know, wasted money and no result and basically no justice either way. Tanya Hosh, good to have you with us uh, tonight. We might come back to some of those points about whether it was all worth it, but looking at the results so far, Tassie and New South Wales have voted no. Um, the national vote, I've got to say, looking at Anthony's numbers, show it, it might be a little closer in the end than the polls were indicating, but perhaps not enough for the yes side. What do you make of the, the numbers you're seeing so far? Well, obviously still remain hopeful because when you campaign for something like this, you hold on to hope until you're told that there is no hope left on, on the result. But what I can say is that um, judging on the experiences of engaging with Australians through this yes work has been, you know, really heartening. Um, there's never been a campaign in Australia's history that's had as many volunteers, um, so many so that when I tried to volunteer today, there wasn't actually anything for me to do but eat a sausage. So <laughs> I think that, you know, what we can see is that the numbers that we end up with when they all come in is going to tell us something about this country, about our ability to have the important conversations that Lydia's referring to and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been talking about for generations. Um, it'll tell us where we're at in relation to those conversations. And so, you know, given that a referenda in Australia is very hard to win in any case, we know that when a conversation in this country is had about issues of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and then you put the framework of a referendum on top. I mean, we were up against it from the start um, and, you know, I think I'll be grateful for the number of people who did come out in strong support for yes. Tanya, if the, the results tell us one story about the nation, what does this year tell us about our nation right now? I, I think a lot will be drawn on this in the days, weeks, months, years to come. I think this will be a moment in our country's history that we keep going back and looking at. Um, we don't have 
um, the sorts of conversations that we need to have. My concern is that on the back of tonight, there'll be a lot of conversation and nitpicking about campaign strategy and all of those sorts of things, instead of the reckoning we need to have in Australia about the way that we relate with the first Australians and the way this country understands our place in this country. Laura. Um, I've got questions for both of you. Um, uh, just, I suppose the thing that strikes uh, me in what you're saying, Tanya, is that people keep talking about the division here, but in some ways what you're saying is we're seeing a division between, you know, a, a very heartening, uh, you know, level of support amongst some Australians for Indigenous people and, and uh, you know, possibly a greater understanding of their position against those who aren't... Uh, you know, who remain reasonably hostile and that, that that's actually a, a reason for, you know, for encouragement despite the, the fact that the result may actually be disheartening on the night. Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, drawing on what Lyd is saying, that some people will have voted no because they wanted more. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of activity, a lot of work that happens across this country in efforts towards reconciliation, in efforts towards justice, efforts towards really improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And yet we could end up with a no result tonight. And so I think to actually have had the opportunity to cast a ballot, to actually give us some real numbers that we can look at that tells us something instead of assuming things about where we stand, I will absolutely welcome knowing what that is. Let's go to Anthony Green with more of those numbers. What have you got for us, Anthony? Well, let's have a look at the trends in Sydney and then I'll bring up the map and it's kind of fascinating. The metropolitan area is voting 52% no at this stage. Eastern Sydney is voting yes. Western Sydney voting solidly no. Labor seats voting a narrower, uh, narrow no. Liberal seats a stronger no. And other seats, which is all the teals and independents, solid yes. Mm. Let's look at this map. And it's very interesting. This is a map of Sydney. Now, remember, at a general election, all this area used to be blue. There's a few blues here and there and lots of red in Western Sydney at the moment. This looks like the results of the Republic in 1999, exactly the same. Blue here, uh, purple here for yes, orange out there for no. But look at some of these seat results. Warringah, one of the teal seats, 54% uh, yes. Warringah, which used to be Tony Abbott's seat, now held by Zali Stegel, 64% yes. North Sydney... 63% yes. Wentworth, another TLC, does on and win North Sydney, 66% yes. Mm. Kingsford Smith is yes. Sydney, a Labor seat, yes. The Prime Minister's seat of Graindler, a very solid yes vote. Even Benelong, which is a marginal Labor seat currently, used to be John Howard's, is currently yes, though I wouldn't, we've got that in doubt. But there we are, there's those one, two, three, four teal seats, and they're all very solidly yes. Now, now tonight we're looking at the results of the referendum. It's very hard to avoid also talking about the political consequences of the result. But uh, um, I'd point out that there were 17 Liberal seats that voted yes to the Republic in 99, and now they hold, only hold five of them. So we're seeing a result here which has some similarities to the Republican result for Sydney in 1999. It's a really interesting point too when you think the Liberals have got to try and win back those teal seats to get back into government yeah. and you see them strongly voting yes yeah. but for Labor on the outer parts of yeah. uh, Sydney there in, in Labor heartland a strong no vote. Well, well let me have a look. Lindsay 67% um, no that's a Liberal seat. Chifley next door very safe Labor 57. Fowler which is Died Lee's seat 60% no. Uh, MacArthur a rapidly growing district 63. Werrower 62. I mean, it's just uh, an extraordinary collection of results. Um, Linda Burney here, that's her seat of Barton, 53.8% no. So, I mean, we'll see how the rest of the counting goes there. But that just gives you a picture. Is Scott Morrison's old seat of Cook, 60%. Still his seat, still his seat. Oh, yeah. no, I should say, yes, sorry, yes. <laughs> Barrara, um, <laughs> which is Julian Lees's seat at the moment, has got a, a now, it's not, we haven't given that seat away or mm. decided it's voted yes or no. But that's Julian Lisa's seat. He's on 52% no at this stage. So uh, th if that map continues, that's, that's, that's a fascinating, fascinating mm -hmm. political consequence of this. It doesn't say much about the future of reconciliation, but that's an interesting political result. The inner and the outer. Thanks, Anthony. We'll come back to you shortly. Let's go to Brittany Klein in Strathpine in Queensland, one of our reporters there. We don't have a great deal of data from Queensland just yet, but Brittany, what have you been hearing from voters there? You've been out speaking to people today on the polls. 
Yeah, we certainly have. And it's been quite a subdued atmosphere right across polling booths. Like you said, uh, we're in Strathpine tonight outside what was a polling booth uh, about 17 minutes ago. Uh, and it's actually in the federal opposition leader, Peter Dutton's electorate of Dixon, about 30 minutes north of Brisbane CBD. When we arrived here, though, uh, it was quite peculiar. It's the first polling booth that I've seen all day where there was much more advertising for the no campaign as opposed to the yes campaign, uh, which is quite peculiar given over the past six weeks we've really seen a lot of effort by the Yes campaign. In fact, 3,000 volunteers right across Queensland really targeting undecided voters given that the polls have suggested right from the start of this six-week campaign that support for the Yes vote has been well below 50% in Queensland. Perhaps we shouldn't consider this too surprising given the state's conservative political history. We also know that a lot of Queenslanders live in regional and remote areas and outer suburbs. Uh, and like you said, we've been spoke, speaking with voters right across the state over the past six weeks. And the sentiment for no is a lot louder in those regional areas and in outer suburbs. A lot of Queenslanders did also have the chance to vote pre-polling or postal votes in this electorate alone. Uh, about 52% of voters had their say before today. So that could delay the count slightly, the count which is underway inside right now and across thousands of polling booths across the state. Thanks, Brittany. And Queensland, an important place for Indigenous rights and the history of Indigenous rights in this country and a lot of mobs in Queensland will be watching this closely. Lydia, I want to go to you about the tone of this debate. You've spoken very candidly about the effects and the personal effects on you. Every day, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander have been abused on social media and have had reams of racism um, come towards them mm. during this campaign. Mm. Uh, picking up on Tanya's point, do you think that this has elevated our discussion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island affairs or have you seen something different? Absolutely. I think um, it really shows where the nation is at in terms of uh, their knowledge of the own their own country that they live in. There is no truth-telling uh, and a lot of those people out there, particularly in Queensland, um, don't even know the true history of this land. They don't know that the incarceration rate in Queensland is through the roof of our people. The uh, children being incarcerated around this country right now is an, is, is an act of genocide. Uh, and the fact that we have 550 deaths in custody with nobody ever held responsible, responsible 23,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care, our people are hurting already. That's why we didn't need this referendum. We need a truth-telling. We need a truth and justice commission like they have in South Africa. We need to heal and unite this country, not through a referendum of yes or no. It needs to be through truth-telling and healing. And I think tomorrow that's where we need to begin to heal this country and ensure that everybody uh, knows the true history and, and stops this racism that we have to deal with every day. I mean, I deal with it in my job every day, but my people, our people, deal with that every minute of every day. So I think the referendum has certainly given a platform for the racists, uh, and we know that suicide rates amongst our people have skyrocketed since the announcement of the referendum. So people are literally killing themselves as a result. And we have no other choice in this country but to unite and heal and go on a, on a journey for treaty. We have to do a treaty in this country to bring people together. I'm just wondering why you think a voice couldn't have been a moment for unity, why it couldn't have brought all those issues to the national stage, the unacceptable suicide rates of our people, the skyrocketing, skyrocketing numbers of children in out-of-home care and the juvenile detention mm. issues. Why couldn't a voice have brought those to the table, a permanent representative body? Well, as I keep saying, the voice is just window dressing for constitutional recognition. And um, Sister and I met when, when you were heading up the Recognise campaign and I was protesting against you then. She was. Uh, it's true. So, <laughs> you know, I've never changed the tact on constitutional recognition. It's the colonial constitution, right? So it's not necessarily the voice... Our, it's, have, not, it's not necessarily the voice you're opposed to, the representative body, but it's, going in, it's it going into the constitution. Anything to do with the constitution should not have... should not happen without a treaty with... First Peoples in this country. This is not our constitution. This was developed in 1901. 
by a bunch of old white fellas who had no regard for black fellas, no regard for women, and now we're asking people to put us in there? But no how, thanks. How else do you get permanency on a representative body? That through a could... treaty. Through a treaty through a clan-based treaty, through the language And how long would that take that at a national level? How long would you that take? You let me finish this. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, we know our own mobs. No one can... Sp I can't speak for your mob, you can't speak for mine. And so language groups around this country, we all know who they are, we know who their families are, they are Senator, the only ones we're gonna... who decide their own destiny. Sorry to interrupt you there. Albanese. We'll come back to that, but we do need to go to Anthony Green. Anthony, what have you got? Well, I've got South Australia. Let's have a look at South Australia. Um, the figures for South Australia. Uh, now, we've, there's only three electorates outside of the metropolitan area and the seven inside. At the moment, South Australia roll vote is 33.36.6% no. Yes, sorry. We're predicting it might end up 42, 43. Adelaide Metro is 44.6 for yes. Country re South Australia is a, a solid no. We are now prepared to call South Australia. There's absolutely nothing indicating anything other than a, than a no victory in South Australia. There is a uh, big swings in all the Labor held seats, polling place by polling place. You're seeing 20 and 30% differences between the Labor vote at the last election and the yes vote at this referendum. So we're calling South Australia has voted no. And of course, with three states voting no, the referendum is defeated as well whatever happens in Queensland and Western Australia. So there it is. Anthony Green has called it at 7.24pm. The Indigenous Voice referendum has been defeated. Australia has voted no to enshrining an Indigenous voice in the Constitution after this long-running campaign that really began with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This was the request from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people six years ago at the Uluru Dialogues when they issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And this will be a difficult moment for many First Nations people across the country. It will. Uh, it was the Prime Minister, of course, who promised to have this referendum through the election campaign in his election night victory speech as well. He said this would be a way to unite Australia. It would be a way to close the gap on Indigenous disadvantage. It would be a way to recognise Indigenous Australians in a practical way in the Constitution as well. But Australia has today said no to that request. For those who've argued that this would divide Australia, who've argued there wasn't enough detail, that it would create a new level of unnecessary bureaucracy, well, this is a win for that no campaign argument. But where this leaves the fate of recognition in the Constitution, reconciliation in Australia, and not to mention those practical issues of Indigenous disadvantage is right now still very unclear after this no result tonight. But it has only taken an hour and... Well, less than an hour and a half since the close of polls uh, for this result to be declared by Anthony Green tonight. It is what the polls predicted. Tanya, Hosh, to you, uh, some reaction to this result. Look, on a personal level, I feel devastated um, after... I've been working on this for over a decade um, and so have many, many other people. Um, we knew that one of the prerequisites for success was that bipartisanship. Um, as soon as that was denied, after, can I say, you know, at least a decade of very careful work seeking to find a series of carefully put words and language uh, that uh, conservative-minded leaders would support um, to find ourselves in this position when, you know, as Lydia points out, this is an incredibly modest request that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who contributed to the Uluru Statement asked the Prime Minister to put to the Australian people, there's going to be a lot of pain and hurt and dismay and we're going to need to take a moment to absorb that message um, and what it says. One of the things that has been really confronting in watching the polling over time is the large number of Australians who at the beginning of this campaign didn't even seem to appreciate that there is extraordinary disadvantage faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We now know through this campaign that a lot more Australians are aware of it, but even so, still nowhere near enough. Mm. So it, I think it is going to take some time to absorb. Um, we need to respect that time and that and that moment and then this country has some important 
and uncomfortable conversations to have in a real response. Um, a response that is meaningful, that moves beyond the politics and really gets to the realities of the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our own country and the lived experience. Uh, this was always motivated um, for an outcome that would actually bring us together around a basic question of fact about the First Peoples who are always here and uh, really uh, a mechanism for accountability that would be permanent by virtue of being enshrined in the Constitution so that our voices could never be shut out of Parliament or away from the government. Dan, have you got a question there for Tanya? Um, I just want to pick up on, on what Tanya has said and who has been an advocate and leader in this space for so long and I can hear the absolutely clear pain when you are speaking and speaking there of that truth that is going to need to flow from this and the reckoning that you touched on a little bit earlier about what the story is that this tells us about our nation right now and, and I suspect there are going to be elements of that that are incredibly difficult that we need to grapple with. This is going to be an uncomfortable time for many and there, there will be so many campaigners tonight who have put so much of their heart and soul into this attempt who will be feeling absolutely devastated right now. Mm. And I think that as we've heard from all the panellists right across tonight, is that this is clearly a message that, that things need to be done differently in this country when it comes to political debates and the way that we have national conversations about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. And there's, a, there's an enormous challenge for us to grapple with, I think, in how we talk with rather than about, and that goes back to the, mm -hmm. the point the Senator was making about some of the really confronting, horrible, intractable circumstances that face so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I just, I think that there is going to need to be a lot of soul searching about what this night means and what this campaign has meant. Mm -hmm. Do you think, Tanya, that, um, I mean, the Uluru Statement was always talking about being a statement of love and generosity before we get to questions about, you know, what happens next, you know, do Indigenous people end up feeling like they're not loved by their own country? I'm sure there will be some people who absolutely feel like that, but I know for myself, of course, I've had to reflect on what tonight might bring. I don't intend to be a victim to this result in terms of knowing who I am um, and my identity as an Australian. I, I don't. And I know that there will be other people who are equally wanting to be galvanised by this moment. I think um, the dialogue that we have to have with each other means that we can't be doing that just from the perspective of um, being diminished by this result. We actually have to stand strong and it might take some time to find that strength and the sets of words that we need to bring. But one thing um, that is not changed by tonight is that we're the first peoples of this country, that our um, enjoyment of justice and um, human rights in Australia, the levels of disadvantage are not acceptable. So now we're left with the status quo and we're left with um, a huge disappointment. But one of the things that we will know is that perhaps six to eight million Australians are with us on this journey now. And we're going to have to stick together in the interest of moving this country forward um, in that truth-telling that Lydia is referring to that will be so important and trying to move in a way that um, doesn't lose the unity that has been achieved with some people for the first time um, in those large numbers. And uh, we're going to have to bring that together and maintain that um, because that is um, going to be the strength of uh, what enables us to move forward in a way that is 
constructive and actually means that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do start to live like equals in their own country. A lot of healing Can I just needed. Add, add that I too um, am sad for my people in this country right now. Uh, it's been a, a horrible 12 months for a lot of people. Yes, no, in between, don't know and don't want to be, don't want to deal with it. Blackfellas have gone overseas to get away from this because it's been so hurtful. Uh, but we have to, you know, not allow our people to be so downtrodden once again because that seems to be repetitive in this country. It's part of colonisation. We need to rebuild and rebuild at the grassroots level and that's where this whole referendum and even the idea of it coming out the way it did, it left the grassroots behind. And when you leave grassroots behind, black or white, you're always going to run into problems. So we've got to be uh, respectful about any consultation. It's got to be real consultation, not a ticker box. And go to the language groups around this country because they have solutions for themselves and also... Uh, the Prime Minister has an opportunity to implement the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, the Bringing Them Home report, and he, they could even pass the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which I'll be putting to the Parliament floor in December. So we've still got uh, okay. work to do, and we need those 7 million people to tell this government to uh, implement those recommendations that will save our lives today. Thanks, Senator. Well, we're going to go to Ghana country in Adelaide now to Liberal Senator for South Australia, Karen Little. Uh, Karen, we just had the prediction or the, the result, really, that uh, the no case has won the 45th referendum. Why did Australians vote this way, in your view? Well, 17 million people went to the ballot box and they were asked a single question with two separate components. One was constitutional recognition and the other one was voice. Um, they went to this referendum without a constitutional convention. Uh, this is the foundation document of the country and I think that is as simple as it is. They didn't say no to reconciliation. They did not say no to improving the lives of Indigenous Australians. I've not heard that in all of the discussions I've had since becoming a Member of Parliament just over 12 months ago. Uh, this was about a flawed process. This was about a process that didn't consider that the Australian Constitution is a representation of all Australians equally and there should have been a conversation with the Australian public before putting such a divisive, unknown, risky proposition and permanent proposition to the Australian people. Senator Little Dan Borsha here in the Referendum Centre on Gadigal Country. Thanks for joining us. If this is not a message about reconciliation and, and, and about the way forward, that's clearly been a tone of some of the discussions throughout this year. What is the message that you think this is solely about? Well, I think this is one about unity. This is about recognising Australians are equal under the Constitution. Uh, people recognise that there are disadvantaged people within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. And a lot of the conversations uh, revolved around how do we actually address issues for them? They're the people that I'm really focused on. And, uh, you know, just since being in Parliament myself, Senator Lydia Thorpe, and Senator Jacinta Nampajibba-Price have asked for inquiries uh, to look at some of these organisations that already get funding for Aboriginal Pacific programs and asking what's working, what's not working, how can we do it better and stop doing those things that aren't working. We could do that now. The Prime Minister could have legislated if he wanted to, but he chose this path and he chose to, in a cost of living crisis, be distracted from issues that affect the most marginalised and vulnerable in our communities. Uh, Senator David Spears here, you said the Prime Minister could have legislated. Is that something you would like to see? Well, look, I think we're, you know, we're just where we are at the moment. Uh, we're just absorbing all this information from across the country. Uh, I'm not going to jump in and say what's next. I want to understand a little bit more about uh, where, what's happened right across the country. But if I talk specifically about South Australia, let me, let me talk about what I saw at the polling booth today. I still saw a highly resourced campaign by the Yes campaign. 
I saw banners out there that talked about 80% of Indigenous Australians want voice. And we know that the Resolve poll came out earlier this week and said, no, actually, it's 59%, and that doesn't include remote communities. They could have not put those signs up knowing that the most relevant um, current information said only 59%. And I even dispute, given my conversations with Aboriginal people in South Australia, that that number is actually that high. Um, but they chose not to. I was pretty disappointed to see that. Senator Karen Little in Adelaide, thanks for your time tonight. Well, let's go to our reporter Isabella Higgins at the West Ashfield Leagues Club in Sydney where the Yes campaign is holding a function and she's there with prominent Yes campaigner Thomas Mayer. Yeah. Uh, we don't have Isabella so. just there, so we're going to come back to them there. Uh, Lydia, what Karen was touching on, Senator Karen Little was touching on there about the amount of support in the Aboriginal community. Uh, there was some early polls about showing about 80% support earlier in the year. She touched on that Resolve poll showing about 59% mm. were supporting the referendum in our communities. Do, do you think that was accurate, that polling, that recent polling? Oh, I don't think the initial polling was accurate. It was out of 800 people. Like, 80% of 800 of Blackfellas is not not a good result, not a good... Um, it's a wasted exercise, in fact. We don't operate that way. Uh, and that's why this country going to ref the referendum to decide on our destiny was the wrong thing to do. And that's where we, as Aboriginal people, need to come together and make those decisions for ourselves. That's what a treaty can do. That's what truth-telling can do. And, uh, you know, most... All Aboriginal people I've spoken to don't want deaths in custody to continue. Okay. They don't want uh, the continuation of the stolen generation. You don't need a referen referendum for a treaty and you don't need a referendum for extra Senate seats in the Parliament. Now, I'd rather have blackfellas as senators with a vote that can change this nation than some advisory body with no teeth. Let's go back now to Isabella Higgins at the Asheville Leagues Club with Thomas Mayo. Thanks, Bridget. Well, here, as you can imagine, there's enormous disappointment. I can see people crying in this room. This is not the result that anyone here wanted. Thomas, you have worked for years to try and advocate for a voice to Parliament. Can you explain what's running through your head at this moment? Uh, I'm devastated. I know there's a lot of people that have done a lot of hard work, you know, not just here in this room, but across Australia. Uh, you know, many thousands of volunteers. Um, you know, all of our, uh, you know, the Indigenous leadership that has stepped up and, and done uh, and put themselves out there for this. Uh, I think that the proposal that we have made is the right one. Uh, we need a voice. We need that structural change. Um, and we got it right at Uluru. Uh, but we have seen a disgusting uh, no campaign, a campaign that has been dishonest, that has lied to the Australian people. And I'm sure that will come out in the analysis. Uh, I'm sure that history will reflect poorly on Peter Dutton, uh, Pauline Hanson, uh, all of those that have opposed this. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know what's next, but, um, but uh, it's just devastating. Do you feel anger towards the Australian public? You spoke, I can hear anger in your voice right now. I'm not angry at the Australian public. Uh, I think that the Australian public were ready for this. I disagree when people say that, that they weren't. Uh, I disagree that this was a bad idea uh, because I know that we needed that foundational change, you know, to be recognised uh, and to have a guaranteed representative body. Not politicians that uh, purport to speak for us, uh, like the one that we've just heard. Uh, not having political parties choose Indigenous people for us, but having us choose our, our, our leaders ourselves. We got that right. Uh, I'm not blaming the Australian people at all but who I do blame and who I hope that um, the Australian people look very closely at the next time they have a say in this democracy about who our leadership is. I hope they look at who lied to the Australian people. I think Albanese um, was courageous. I think he was empathetic. I think he genuinely wanted this change uh, and he has done the right thing by putting it to the people. 
So it's not his fault, it's not the Australian people's fault, it's the people that have lied uh, to us, to the Australian people. They are the ones that we should be blaming. Thomas Mayo, David Spears uh, here, if you can hear me. Look, I, I know this has just happened, but in terms of the path forward, we heard Tanya Hosh saying earlier, we need a response to this that's meaningful. Uh, Pat Dodson at the, at the press club a few days ago uh, in his address was talking about the, the need for a structured process, a pathway forward from here. Have you given much thought to that? What would you like to see happen now? Well, I don't know. Um, to be honest, uh, we have not got a plan B. Uh, we put our faith in the Australian people uh, and, um, and, as I said, I think they were ready, but there has been some really uh, horrible uh, political campaigning uh, from Peter Dutton and, and, and his uh, no campaign. It's been disgusting, to be frank. Um, so we're going to take stock now. Um, Indigenous people, Indigenous leaders, uh, uh, one thing we do know is that we're never going to give up fighting for our rights, our rightful place in this country for recognition and for a voice, because as I said, it was always the right thing to do. Uh, but we have seen a, a disgusting campaign from the No people uh, and let that, that, be, that come out. Thomas Mayo, thank you. And Isabella, we'll come back to you a little later on as well. You can really hear this, is a, you know, this, this reaction, this visceral reaction, Laura. This is a disgusting camp, a horrible campaign from really laying the blame on Peter Dutton not accepting any fault on the part of the Yes campaign, and, you know, you can understand that's perhaps an understandable uh, reaction in, in, the, in the light of what's just happened, but um, there is a lot of anger there. There is a lot of anger, and there will be. Uh, there'll be a lot of anger, um, there'll, and there'll be, I think, you know, my Indigenous colleagues can tell you better than I can, there'll be a lot of grieving about this, because, you know, it, it does... It's basically going to be, be looking like a punch in the face to um, Indigenous people in Australia, and... It's the last thing that anybody wanted out of this process. So I think there's going to have to be a, a, a time for just regrouping on that and, um, uh, and for people to work out what they're doing now. Lydia's talking about truth-telling um, and that's... And, uh, as, uh, as is Tanya. Um, and, of course, there were the three elements of uh, Uluru, truth-telling, treaty and, uh, and the voice. Um, and it almost sounds a bit like tr truth-telling now might from your perspective, might have to come even before talk, talking about treaties, but um, what comes out of it... Well, where does that leave us, Tanya? Yeah. I mean, are we back to the drawing board in terms of what the Uluru Statement called for? You've talked about the, the needing a meaningful pathway forward. What does that look like? Yeah, well, look, it won't be me that decides that, but what I do know is that those elements that are already encapsulated into the Uluru Statement, the truth-telling, the Makarata Commission, um, the Prime Minister announced when he was elected that this would be implemented in full. So we've had the opportunity to have these vote. These other areas where I do think there is great agreement on, you know, quite often it's not where we're trying to go um, that... Um, sends us in different directions. It's the, the pathway to get there, the order in which these things happen. And so I think that the power of the Uluru Statement that now a lot of people have read across the country and have an understanding of, I don't think that those things are dismissed because the referendum itself has failed. From a technical perspective, a treaty is much easier to achieve um, but the time that takes and the frameworks to ensure that any treaty making and any truth telling is done in a way that is credible, is safe and really does um, bring a sense of resolution to the unfinished business in this country is something that we're going to have to grapple with. And I think, if anything, this result tonight will again tell us who is already with us and doesn't need to be brought on a journey to understand the work this country has to do. And we're going to have to um, keep asking those people to walk with us um, and make sure that we don't throw out all of the progress that has been made through this campaign in terms of some basic understandings, which, frankly, in 2023, should not be the news to Australians that clearly it is. Mm. Well, let's go over to Anthony Green now with some more results. Anthony. Well, we've got... Uh, now, Queensland figures are still very preliminary. We've called New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania. We've called the ACT. 
We haven't called Victoria because it's a very close contest and I'll do a deep dive into the Victorian figures in a moment. So if people are concerned we're not looking at Queensland enough, there's actually a lot to work out before we start to deal with very preliminary figures from Queensland. Um, actually, they're, they're just... Uh, I'm trying to remember what I'm doing now. Figures. This is the actual percentage you're seeing. Them. New South Wales is settling in about 56% no. Victoria is 51%. No at the moment, I'll come back to that. Tasmania, 58, solid no. South Australia, 61.5. Queensland, very preliminary figures. And the ACT, a very solid yes. Um, let's have a look at my tracking graph of Victoria and you'll see what's going on. Um, it's just continued to drift upwards. We've got to 35% counted now. Victoria has had the highest incidence of pre-poll voting. Uh, so it will be quite late tonight before those votes start coming in. So Victoria has just continued to drift up and it's the ones, it's why we haven't called it because at 48.2 with 35% counted, the result can still be turned around here. But there are um, just two other things I'll say before I dive into that. Um, of all the state seats that voted yes or no to the Republic in 1999, the average yes vote in those is 56%. We are seeing an extraordinary similarity between the results on the Republic and the re results in this. The pattern of where the seats are, the overall levels or differences from seat to seat may differ, but the pattern of where in our capital cities they voted yes or no is very similar. Um, and if you look back at the referendum results, they were very much related to social status of electorates, and that's the same pattern we're seeing this time. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that I've looked at, there's about, 20 seat, uh, about 26 seats, I think, where the Greens got more than 20% at the last federal election, and they're nearly all voting yes at this stage. And there's things to say about that also, that does correspond to a lot of inner city seats. But one of those seats with a high green vote, which is Richmond, which is based on the far north coast of New South Wales, at this stage the yes vote is still ahead in Richmond, which is quite different from nearly other regional city, a seat in the country. But I need to have a look at Melbourne, which has got some very interesting trends. That's the map of Melbourne. Very, you might have, it's a different geography to Sydney. It's not east and west, it's inner and outer. There is an east-west line which you know, runs along the Yarra, but this is clustered around the inner city. It's both, both sides of the Yarra, you're getting yes votes. And some of these are interesting. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, Carayo, which is Richard Marle's seat, was voting yes earlier. It's now dropped behind. But again, just a, a look at a few seats. Here's Melbourne, um, uh, Adam Bant's seat, 80% yes. Some of these districts are just huge compared to everywhere else in the country. 70% in McNamara. Higgins, once a Liberal heartland seat, 66% yes. Of course, now held by Labor for the first time. Kuyong, 62. Um, Isaacs, the Attorney General seat, 55. Goldstein, um, Teal seat, 61%. And in the northern suburbs, uh, you've got Cooper, 70% Labor versus Greens contest. Wills, Labor versus Greens, 70. Uh, Maribyrnong, Bill Shorten seat, 58. Fraser 52, so very different results in Melbourne uh, in, in terms of a much higher vote in the inner city, which is resulting in that sort of, we're not calling Melbourne yet. But again, there's that pattern of outer suburban seats. Uh, Flinders down here, um, it's only got a very low count. It's got the highest pre-poll rate in the country, Flinders. So all these outer suburban seats, the safe labour seat like Holt, um, Bruce, another safe labour seat, is, is sort of a narrow and no vote. Um, Deacon, Michael Sucas, Sucas seat, he's currently the yes ahead. Um, we, we're being very, um, because seats aren't important, we're letting a few more seats drop through as being decided one way or the other. If they correct later in the evening, they will do so. But as you can see, they're a very different pattern to what you're seeing in a much higher no vote and again, a yes vote. And again, what we're seeing is that pattern of inner versus outer um, in, in both of the major capital cities. And of course, the other capital cities around the country aren't nearly as, uh, as socially divided like Sydney and Melbourne are. Thanks, Anthony. Well, Victoria looking close and not probably a huge surprise that one of the highest votes in the country for yes looks to be in inner city Melbourne. Mm. Well, we say goodbye now to our panellists, Gunai Gudijmara, Jabarong woman, Lydia, Lydia Thorpe, I've got them all right there. <laughs> and Thank Independent Senator for Victoria, thanks for your time tonight. And Tanya Hosh as well, a difficult moment for you and we thank you for your time tonight. Yeah, thanks, thank Tanya. you. Appreciate that. All right, well, as we've been mentioning, there's a bit going on uh, beyond the referendum. We'll keep covering all of this as the results come in and get plenty more reaction and analysis for you. But we're going to check in some of the other news headlines right now with Gemma Vaness. Gemma. Thanks, David. Well, the Department of Foreign Affairs has announced that scheduled repatriation flights from Israel have been cancelled. Political reporter Matthew Doran is live at our Parliament House Bureau in Canberra. Matthew, what do we know?
Gemma, good evening. This is a message that's been posted on the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's Smart Traveller social media platforms. And it says that the situation is highly challenging and rapidly changing. Unfortunately, we have been advised our scheduled flights will not depart Israel today. A further flight will not depart as scheduled tomorrow. It goes on to say that the Australian government is working to ensure Australians who want to leave can do so as soon as possible. And we will communicate the to a registered Australian Australians about the next available flights. We don't have any further detail as to why that has indeed been, why that decision has been made while those flights have been cancelled. Uh, we know that the first one took off from Tel Aviv to London uh, overnight and you can see there some vision of people arriving in London aboard that flight. There have been concerns about missile activity in the area and whether or not that could have an impact on the safety for planes to fly in and out of Ben Gurion Airport. Uh, other airlines had indeed cancelled their flights as a result of that. So as we get further information, we will bring it to you. Matthew Doran in Canberra. Thank you. And let's go to the Middle East now, where anticipation of a full-scale Israeli ground offensive in Gaza is growing. The Israeli Defence Force says it will allow the safe movement of Gazans on two main roads south over the next four hours. ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons joins us now from Jerusalem. John, what's the situation? Well, well, Gemma, it's it's obviously very grim. The Israelis uh, are on the brink of their land invasion. Just in terms of Gaza's situation as it currently is, I think it's basically a humanitarian crisis already. The Israeli army in the last uh, week has dropped 6,000 bombs on the Gaza Strip. Now, just to get a sense of that perspective, imagine cutting Canberra in half, putting 2.3 million people into half of it, and then dropping 6,000 bombs on it. That's Gaza at the moment. No food, no water is allowed in. But as Benjamin Netanyahu says, this is just the beginning. Um, and in fact, the ground offensive, the ground invasion is likely to wreak much more havoc, especially on civilians. Live from Jerusalem, ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons. The picture isn't looking good for New Zealand's Prime Minister Chris Hipkins as he seeks another Bye -bye. term in office. With more than 50% of votes counted in the country's general election, the National Party, together with the ACT Party, are projected to win more than enough seats to change the government and install National Leader Christopher Luxon as the new PM. The Labor Party is facing a potential loss of 30 MPs compared to the last election in 2020. And checking in the weather around the capital cities for tomorrow, Brisbane and Sydney will be sunny. Canberra is expected to be partly cloudy. The showers increasing in Melbourne and Hobart and showers too in Adelaide. Perth and Darwin will be sunny. <laughs> You're watching Australia Votes, The Voice Referendum. I'm David Spears. And I'm Bridget Brennan. We'll get to our new panel shortly, but first, here's Anthony Green with the latest. Ah, uh, yes. Just preparing my run here. <laughs> Came to you a bit early. <laughs> <laughs> might, look at, uh, might look at Queensland, Anthony? Uh, I'll just do the state yep. figures first. I mean, Queensland is not as far progressed, but overall, New South Wales, Tasmania and, and South Australia have voted no. We've already called them. Victoria, still too close to call. The yes faces continue to progress up. And there's a huge pre-poll vote there, so we can't call it. The ACT has voted yes. Queensland is very early figures. I've just, um, just had a chance to look at some figures. The, we've broken Queensland into... The overall is 665 but there's a lot of regional Queensland at this stage, at 75%. We've broken the rest of the state into Brisbane metropolitan area, Brisbane City Council, basically, and then other southeast Queensland, which is the surrounding councils and the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast, and they're also showing a pretty solid no vote. So um, I think we'll call Queensland pretty quickly because it's absolutely everything you'd expect um, from the opinion polls, and it was always expected this state to be most likely to vote no. So uh, Queensland, early figures. We'll watch a little bit longer, but uh, it's looking like a no vote there as well. Thanks, Anthony. Well, let's go to our new panel here and we welcome Labor Senator Melandiri McCarthy and Liberal Senator Andrew Bragg. Okay. Thanks for, to you both for joining we'll us We'll call tonight. Queensland on the next one, yeah. All right, welcome to you both. Uh, uh, Melandiri McCarthy, thank you. Uh, look, we know the outcome now while we're still waiting to see Queensland and, uh, and WA, of course. Um, we know that three states and the national vote... Uh, well, the, the, the referendum's been lost. So um, when you look at that, 
why? What do you put that down to? Well, can I just, David, can I just go to some of the points, though, that Anthony just raised mm. around Queensland? And one of the things that we're certainly obviously looking at is uh, the Indigenous uh, areas as well in terms of the remote areas. And I'd just like to give some of the stats that I've got mm. uh, in regards to, to Queensland. So what, what we've got is that um, the booths with the high Indigenous populations, Palm Island, for example, in Herbert, uh, has a 93% Indigenous population and voted at 75.12 voted yes. So, again, we, this is really important, I think, for your viewers to understand. Uh, Mornington Island in Kennedy has a 77.46 Indigenous uh, population and voted 79.22% yes. In Lockhart River in Leichhardt, which also has a 79.8% Indigenous population, voted 66.15 yes. And Gadooga in Parks has a 68% Indigenous population and voted 68.49%. So I, I mention that to your viewers and I think it's really important because this was so important to First Nations people, David, and I have to bring that back. I've heard previous uh, commentary this evening and I, I want to uh, emphasise the importance of that uh, to all Australians, that this was always going to be about 3% uh, of the population who were asking uh, for an advisory body to the Constitution. But so when it comes to I, that, I think it's yeah. important no, that, that to is important. Uh, absolutely. bring out That's the, very uh, interesting. The, but when it comes the to the, the national vote, why do you think, just coming back to the question, why do you think sure. Australia generally have voted no? Well, I guess in the next couple of days we will uh, have a good look at that. Uh, we know that, and I've said this from the outset, that referendums are tough to win. Uh, we've seen that with the statistics in terms of, uh, you know, eight out of 44. Uh, it doesn't help if you don't have bipartisanship. Uh, that certainly uh, made it incredibly difficult when the Nationals walked away in October last year, followed by Peter Dutton in April this year. Uh, you know, those sorts of things do add to the complexities of winning a referendum. Senator, you voted yes, but the country has voted no. What's your analysis on why most Australians turned away from this? Well, I think it's a very sad night for the country. I think there'll be a lot of people in pain tonight and people who've done a lot of work over many years to try and get a structural change. And I think that, unfortunately, the process was defective here. Uh, the government didn't run a long-running committee to develop up the models. Uh, they didn't release an exposure draft bill. But the most critical component here was a refusal to negotiate and a refusal to try and compromise to get a product which could have captured the centre ground. And I think uh, that is my diagnosis. Was it possible, though, to find something that the Coalition, in, in particular, Jacinda Numpajimpa Price, has argued this divides us on race, was there ever a model do you think she would have supported? I think there were many people in the coalition that would have been open. Uh, many more than just me and Julian Lisa. Mm. Um, but perhaps not a majority in the coalition. No, but I mean, there may have been as many as you saw in 99 when there was a referendum on the Republic, right? When you had the deputy leader, Peter Costello, voting yes. Uh, you could have seen that uh, if there had been a willingness to try and concede some ground and to capture that middle ground, which we saw with the marriage vote in 2017. So, I mean, I think that the process was defective and that is the main reason why this has been lost. What about the <coughs> influence of some of those campaign slogans, if you don't know, vote no, divisive. We heard a lot of people on yeah. out of the polls saying that they thought this was going to be divisive. What was your assessment on I think that? it all stems from the product. The product was defective because the process failed. And you have to take a referendum very seriously. It was treated like a day-to-day -day political issue and it needed a very serious attempt to build consensus. I mean, this was a referendum, almost impossible to win. And so we needed to have the government take it seriously and try and find some common ground and be prepared to give some ground. Now, the reality is that the, the model the government developed was a model they took to the people. They didn't move a full stop or a comma through the sham of a committee process which we had for only one month. And I think the government squibbed it. Come back to that. Uh, but we need to go to Anthony Green, who's got some more breaking news for us. Anthony. Uh, yeah, just managed to have a, a bit of a... I, I managed to get a closer look at Queensland. And as has happened in a couple of states, the figures have suddenly started to arrive in. 13.8% counted, and we've had a look at where they're from around the state. It's absolutely clear that uh, no has won Queensland, so we're calling Queensland as the fourth state to vote no. 
There you go. Yet another state, the fourth state, as Ant Anthony says, has voted no to enshrining the Indigenous voice in the Constitution. Uh, we called this uh, more than half an hour ago that the referendum was lost, but yet another state now coming in for the no uh, vote. There's still yet a state to vote yes. Victoria's close. The ACT, as a territory, has overwhelmingly voted yes. We have to see numbers out of the Northern Territory and Western Australia, but there you go, Queensland, unsurprisingly, voting no on uh, this one. That was absolutely expected in, uh, in all of the polling, uh, no doubt about that, so I don't think anyone's terribly surprised. Um, just picking up on the point, Andrew Bragg, that you were making there, when Peter Dutton and the Coalition mm. decided to oppose this, you were one of the very few who decided to still support it. Sure. Um, and Julie and Lisa, of course, had to quit the front bench to continue supporting it. Do you think that the Prime Minister at that point should have called it off, delayed it, pulled the thing? Well, the last chance saloon was the committee, which was the inquiry into the bill. Uh, the government could have made even just a small change, which would have forced other parties to re-examine their positions. And I think it's just a great example of there was never any serious willingness uh, to move into that centre ground. It was a take-it-or-leave-it approach. All right, Andrew Bragg, we'll come back to you in a moment. We're joined, though, right now by the Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Miles, uh, who I can see on our screen there. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, look, we've been discussing the outcome. We just had the Queensland result called by Anthony Green as well. So the yes case is yet to win a single state. Why do you think that is? What do you put this down to? Well, I think uh, it is obviously a very difficult thing to win a referendum. I mean, that's what's clear, and we knew that coming into this. Um, but just because something's difficult doesn't mean we don't uh, try it. And we went to the election uh, in 2022, committing to take this to the Australian people. We're following through on that commitment. And we're keeping faith with a process, really, which had begun under the, the Howard government and followed through in the Abbott government, which led to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Um, and uh, you know, what was clear from all the First Nations groups which participated in that, which was a long and extensive process, was if not now, when? Um, and with that in mind, we, we, we took this to the Australian people and uh, obviously you know, the, the, the results we're seeing are not what we hoped um, and it is disappointing. Um, but I'd also say in the same breath, we, we very much respect this result. We understand now that um, Australians are not voting to change the Constitution. Deputy Prime Minister, it's Dan Borsher in the uh, Referendum Centre in Gadigal Country in Sydney. Thanks for joining us. What do you think what was the reason that we're seeing this outcome tonight and what does it mean for your government going forward? Well, I think, again, I think it is hard to get referendums up. I think that's, that's what's clear and, and, and we knew that. I think there is... Uh, if you like, a, a kind of higher standard of, of, of proof, if I could use a legal term, when uh, we're talking about referendums, uh, if people aren't sure, uh, what's, it, people are tending to, to vote no. Um, and, and I think as we, we saw the process go on, we, we were seeing uh, the ability to, to explain this to more and more people, but uh, it, it's difficult where there is uncertainty. Um, I mean, in terms of the government, I, I don't think actually tonight really is about that. I, I think, uh, it, it, I mean, it is about it in the sense that this was a promise that we took to the last election. We are very committed. We were very committed to this, and, and we followed through on that. Um, you know, going forward now, um, we are really mindful that while the Australian people have not voted for a change in the constitution, I don't think this is indicative of any lessening sense of a desire for reconciliation nor, well in fact I actually think that during the process of this campaign the need to do more to the, close the gap in social disadvantage which impacts Indigenous Australians uh, has, has grown if anything um, and, and, and that's really where we now need to take this. There is bringing the country back together and there is focusing on what we now do in terms of uh, practically moving forward on closing the gap. I think Australians do feel that the gap is, a, is something which is fundamentally unfair and, and, and that's where our focus is now at. And, and really, that's, that's in terms of the impact on the government, um, that, that's, that's the most significant element. Uh, Richard Miles, uh, a, a quick plug here. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you on Insiders in the morning, so I'm going to have 
Plenty more questions for you about where we go to now in terms of closing the gap and the issues Looking you've raised there. So there's a hold off till uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow, Eastern Daylight Time. Tune in. But I do need to ask you about the unfolding situation, if I can, in Israel, because as we've just heard, the repatriation flights have been cancelled. Um, you're the Defence Minister. <laughs> What's going to happen? Will a defence flight get them out? Uh, look, there's a limit to what I, what, what I can publicly say, but obviously it, it's a very challenging set of circumstances and there's um, a lot of moving parts. Uh, we are looking at how we can resolve issues around the repatriate, repatriation flights which we had in train. We're also looking at ways in which we can uh, find other alternatives for uh, Australians who are wanting to, to leave Israel to be able to afford them that assistance. So uh, this has been very very much front and centre really since the moment or for the last week, uh, knowing that there would be a desire for uh, a number of the Australians who are in Israel to, to seek to leave. So we'll continue to work this issue as we are and we're, we're working it very hard. All right, we might have some more news in the morning when we talk to you then, but uh, Richard Miles, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Just had to squeeze that in because there's a bit going on uh, with uh, unfolding developments there in uh, Israel and, uh, yeah, as Gemma Vaness was telling us earlier, those repatriation flights have been uh, called off for now. Um, but what's uh, clear is from everybody who supported the Yes campaign, um, they're not really acknowledging failure on their part, but, Bridget, you would assume in the days that uh, are to come we're going to hear, you know, points raised about could we have done this, should we have done that, um, whether it's timing, whether it's detail, all of these things, or, or the model itself, that's inevitable, isn't it? I think so, because what we did see was a very strong level of support earlier this year, in late last year. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister commit to this uh, in his first speech when he was elected in May last year. And when we spoke to Australians at that time, there was a broad understanding that this was probably the right thing to mm. do and people could, could understand, uh, as Richard Miles said, that there are unacceptable gaps in our chasms in our society. So I'd be interested to hear from you, Senator, why you thought that level of support started to really fall away, um, not, not even just when the campaign began, but, but before that as well. Thanks for the question, Bridget. I mean, clearly uh, one of the areas that we were dealing with throughout this, and it's been mentioned um, uh, tonight, but also uh, throughout uh, the, the year, is the uh, misinformation and disinformation campaign on social media. Uh, I know that as I travelled across the country, I think I spent more time trying to correct uh, misinformation and disinformation out there. Mm -hmm. And even at the polling booths, you know, you had in places like Mataranka, for, for example, mm -hmm. where you had uh, voters going in thinking they were voting uh, no to fracking, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in Tennant Creek, voters were told, uh, if you vote yes, uh, you won't get any royalties. So there was a terrific amount of uh, deception on the ground, as well as in the social media. So were Australians what? deceived? Is that your argument? I can only say the places that I'm very aware where it occurred, David, and I've named some of them. I can certainly give you more examples of other places. Uh, I, I would say that that was a large part of the No campaign or disinformation and misinformation was something that was picked up and we tried to uh, correct that every time we went anywhere. So, for example, I might, you know, I remember in Adelaide I was asked about uh, how much would people have to pay if they say yes. You know, so questions like that showed me that there was clearly a swirl of activity that was going on out there uh, where, you know, ordinary Australians were made to feel that that's what was happening. We yeah. certainly heard that also when we went out to polling booths, a large amount of misinformation. But we also heard from Australians who could say, yes, we're concerned that things are not right in this country, that mm. we have a huge life expectancy gaps between our first peoples and non-Indigenous Australians, but we're just not convinced that the voice is it. Why weren't those people convinced that a voice to parliament could start to address some of the disadvantage? Oh, look, it, look it was, it's a fair comment when you have people who uh, just don't want the constitution to change because they think it's uh, a, 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 you know... The Constitution is a document that should remain as it is and to change it is really difficult. I came up against those arguments as well uh, and not convinced at all for any movement, whether it's Indigenous issues or, or any other issue. So that's one thing. 
Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, closing the gap and in terms of the advisory committee, uh, they were questions that were also raised at various times. Uh, why not have, um, you know, an advisory committee now in, in, in across the country? But that was where we had to reach out to people and say this was a request from First Nations people who had, through their own dialogues in 2016 and 17, had come to the conclusion at Uluru, on Anangu country, uh, requesting that it be enshrined in the constitution for very real reasons. And one of those reasons, as I've mentioned a few times, is uh, you know, legislation like the Northern Territory Intervention, for example, where there is no say whatsoever in policies and legislation that impacts First Nations people. The hard question, in a way, is sure. you're, you're fighting off a lot of disinformation and a lot of attacks and there are always a lot of reasons why people will tend to vote no, but why wasn't the yes case able to, you know, really land the point, this is, this is, a, this is why you want to vote yes? That, I mean, you know, most people can tell you what the no, the, the sure. no slogan was, but they can't actually tell you, you know, what the yes case is in a simple, in a simple way. I think fear was a really strong factor in this, Laura. I think that uh, using fear as a tactic uh, uh, is a weapon that works. And, and in this particular case, I think it worked very well. Uh, and in terms of uh, First Nations people getting a message out for the yes case, I would argue that people uh, thought they did. You know, when we look at uh, the stats that are coming through in the areas in the booths that I've got here, I see that it worked there. So we're going to have to go through uh, bit by bit to see what happened in different areas to better understand it. But, you know, we can also look back at the, uh, the referendum in 1999 when we look at the question around uh, the preamble and the fact that the vote for the preamble was much lower uh, than, than what we're seeing now. So, you know, does that mean Australia didn't do enough even from that point of view on the question of the preamble uh, to actually mm -hmm. increase awareness through our schools, education system, uh, to understand just about our country? Mm. Well, let's go to Anthony Green because Anthony's got some numbers, I think, on, uh, on your home territory. Anthony, what have you got? Well, just um, you're going to very low count, 2.7% from the Northern Territory. Uh, if we look at just the percentages we're seeing at the moment, um, that it, that's coming out at 68.6. The one thing I would say, just having a look at those numbers, um, they're, they're from Pine Creeks and the big urban centres in Lingyari, and they're from Berrima in Solomon. So they're from the areas that, um, in my judgment, I would expect to see a high yes vote. We haven't seen any remote communities and we haven't seen um, some more of the inner parts of Darwin. So. Uh, I would ex oh, no, we'll see. We just a lot more counting to go, and the Northern Territory is the one place where I would not expect our ability to look back at past results to give us a good guide on, on how the vote patterns will go. Thanks, Angie. Well, let's go to the Northern Territory, to Alice Springs in, Mbunt in Mbuntua, uh, where our reporter Isabella Tolhurst has been speaking with voters. Bella, do people seem to be uh, absorbing this result there in Alice Springs, and, and what's the feeling from those who you're speaking to tonight? Good evening, Bridget. Uh, I'm here in Alice Springs. Behind me down the hill, you can see there's an event going on. Um, it's being run by the Northern Territory Government that just coincidentally happened to fall on tonight. It's celebrating being a year out from the Masters um, Games returning to Alice Springs. But Paul Kelly is also coincidentally performing. So it was expected to be a place where people were going to gather tonight, uh, particularly, yes, volunteers and campaigners were planning on debriefing and then coming down here and enjoy enjoying some music. There's not as many people here as we were probably anticipating so perhaps people are feeling um, a bit upset as those results are rolling in. Now of course it's still early days in the count in the Northern Territory but uh, the results here are largely ineffectual to the overall result making up only 1% of the total population. Um, however the Northern Territory has been a really pivotal part of the discussion around the voice. Um, it's where people have been calling for change for a long time through things like the Yurikala Bark petitions, the Barunga State um, the Uluru Statement of the Heart was originated just a couple of hours from where we're reporting from tonight. So it's been a place where people have called for change and I think the results tonight won't stop those calls. Um, community organisations will continue to do work within places like Alice Springs to help uh, address disadvantage, to address things like crime rates, domestic and family violence, health outcomes. Um, they'll continue to fight for those things. Whereas others will be celebrating tonight, there are people who have expressed that um, 
Jacinta Nampajimpa Price's words really resonated with them. They either went to school with her or are part of her community here in Alice Springs, um, and they said that her words really rung true to them. A lot of no voters said that they were voting no because it was divisive, so her messaging seemed to have really cut through to the community here. Um, but I think either way, whether people are voting yes or no, uh, lots of people acknowledge that change is needed here in Alice Springs and in a lot of other places around the Territory, and they'll continue to call for change. Um, it just won't be the voice to Parliament that will deliver it. Isabella Tolhurst in Mbantua, Alice Springs, thanks for your time tonight. We're going to go back to Anthony Green now. Anthony's got uh, another update for us. Uh, well, it's clear the referendum's been fitted anyway, but I thought it was worth calling that we're actually calling the national vote mm. as being no. It's 564 I think it will only drop from here as figure, further figures from Queensland and Western Australia come in. So uh, where it drops to, I'm not exactly sure, but um, it's definitely that there is a no majority in the national vote at the moment. 56.4 with 38% counted. Uh, I suspect that that no vote might increase slightly yet, but it's definitely a no vote nationally. So, yeah, just to underscore that, uh, a double majority required to win a referendum, but on both counts... Uh, the, the yes case has failed to win a majority of the states and this breaking news failed to win a majority of the national vote as well as Anthony has just called it there. I want to go back to Cos Samaras and Tony Barry, uh, our political analysts from Redbridge uh, who've been with us watching these results as well. Tony, to you first uh, on this. It's look, uh, looking at the number that Anthony just told us. Uh, he expects that no vote to grow as WA and more of Queensland comes in. It's really not too far from what the polls were indicating. What do you make of where things are at right now? Yeah, I think the numbers will continue to drop. There's 6.1 million pre-polls. That's 34.7% of the electorate. They're now starting to come in. Um, and so that's going to start pulling the vote down. The scrutiny, as I've heard from, have said that they're strongly running in favour of the no uh, vote. There's also 2.1 million PVAs, uh, postal vote applications, to be counted. And that makes up 8.1% of the registered voted um, number. So lots of pre-polls to come in, about 42%. Uh, that was currently starting to uh, be hitting the pile. Uh, so I think we're going to see a number closer to 40. Um, there's been a lot said tonight about um, the geography, um, uh, where the vote has been landing, but I think that's a proxy for income and age. So if you look at some of the census data on, um, on income across the 151 electorates across Australia, the three highest income earning seats, household income seats, are Wentworth, Warringah and Mitchell. And the yes vote was 64%, 62%, 62% respectively. The lowest household incomes are Hinkler, Line and Grey. And the yes vote in those seats were 21%, 21% and 27%. And obviously of pre polls to come in. So I think, you know, there's some pretty clear patterns uh, about, um, about income earning and its impact on, on the vote, especially in a cost of living crisis where it's really hard to communicate through that through that uh, prism. Um, the other thing which I talk about is the age. Uh, those seats with the highest proportion of people aged 20 to 34 are Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane electorates. And the yes vote in those seats were 80%, 70% and 70%. Yeah. Those electorates with the age of over 65 were Lyne, Gilmore and Hinkler, the top three in Australia. And the yes vote in those seats were 29%, 42% and 20%. Very interesting um, breakdown there, Cos. I'm keen to hear your thoughts mm. on what we learn from campaigning. I know uh, referendum campaigns are very different to election campaigns. Nonetheless, a lot of conversation already about the tone, the nature, um, the tenor of this campaign. Has this changed campaigning in Australia, do you think? Look, if you want to uh, win uh, uh, a campaign that, that is, pro is proposing for significant social reform, uh, that pathway, that road needs to go through <coughs> not Smith Street Collingwood, but Smith Street Melton. It needs, to go, it, not, it needs to go through Penrith and not Belmain. The problem we have with campaigning in this country and the way the major political parties are now responding and rolling out their... their, their, their tools of, 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 uh, of communication is it's all tailor-made to the, to the demographics that Tony just touched on, which is people with uh, higher levels of education, uh, they've got social capital, they've got time to engage in these campaigns. You know, we touched on a bit before around the lack of volunteers in the outer suburbs. That's not only because 
uh, there, there isn't there isn't enough people out there that are willing to volunteer. They just can't. They don't have the they don't have the hours. They're working longer hours on average than than people in those inner more wealthier electorates. And so, if we revisit re, we revisit this issue again, and it goes to the to to another plebiscite of of this sort, those who are who are putting together a campaign need to understand you've got to drive through those outer suburbs, otherwise you cannot win. Carlos Samaras, Tony Barry, thank you very much for your analysis you. on that. I doubt we're going to see another shot at this at a referendum, Laura, or indeed, raises the question, um, we, you know, we've talked about the difficulty of winning a referendum. Is, is this, this really sets back the prospects of you know, a referendum on the Republic or anything, really, for, um, for the... Well, well there's the... Peter Dutton's referendum. He still wants to run one. I mean, and, he said he would. Does he? Uh, well, that, well, he did. He, said he, was, he keeps we, changing his mind. Peter Dutton said he would uh, if, if we lost, so I imagine you guys will start working on that. Well, I think the main lesson to learn here is that referendums are not about routine day-to-day -day politics. Uh, you really need to build that genuine centre ground if you're going to take it forward, and that's what has not happened this year. You dodged the if question, there was though, going Senator, to be, with no, respect. But if, are we going to see I think another referendum very, under the Liberals I, on I think recognition? It's very, I think it's a very important point because there's a lot of people that are going to be very un unhappy and very upset and very hurt and we need to be honest about what's happened here. Mm. And my analysis is that the process has really let us down. It's not a failure of the system, it's a failure of politicians. And but, you but can win a referendum and you can win a referendum. He decided to oppose this before that committee process that you were talking about had concluded. And he so, bound the front bench. So the position to oppose that wording was a position on that wording. If the wording was different, then there would have been a new position. Wording was changed. No, the wording would have been changed by the committee. Everyone thought there but would have called, been a pivot. But he called no before that. But it could have been changed. Everyone thought the committee would look at the wording, the government would pivot, they want to try and get anyway. some more support. Could, could, could I just ask is... the real politic question? Uh, Anthony was uh, taking us through those seats in Sydney and mm. Melbourne. Uh, the reality is that if you want to win government again, you have to win some of those coalition, those mm. teal seats back uh, next time and we saw these quite staggering figures of support um, for The Voice mm. uh, in those figures. Um, as Senator McCarthy says, uh, at various stages Peter Dutton has suggested he would have a second referendum. How does this result and the realpolitik of yeah. what he has to do to get back into government play out in terms of what the Coalition has to do now? Well, I don't think referenda is dead and I think if there was Indigenous support for a referendum on recognition, then you would run it, right? That's, you would definitely do it. The question is, though, would there be Indigenous support for that? My sense would be probably not for a while, given what's happened tonight. Uh, but to your political question, uh, of course, if the Coalition wants to be the government again, uh, then you need to be able to win the cities. Um, you can't win government if you're the Coalition only in the bush and the outer suburbs. I mean, that's an enumerate approach. So, of course, we need to be a party and a coalition that can govern for, all, govern for all Australians, which is why we need to pitch our tent as widely as possible. Senator with with respect, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I just pick you up on that, though, Senator Bragg, sure. with respect? Um, you know, Peter Dutton did say that he would go to an, a referendum should this one fail. He didn't put any caveats on it. Uh, he didn't support First Nations people now who gathered on Anangu country at Uluru. Uh, and called for this particular referendum to win. So, uh, so I think it's important uh, that we get a response from Peter Dutton. Uh, you know, when's he going to take the Australian people to the next referendum? But he's, with respect, he's not in government. You guys are. What now? W would you seek any other sort of constitutional recognition? Uh, yeah, all right. Well, let me just go back on that, though, David. He still needs to... Peter Dutton still needs to respond to that. OK. I, I think that because, I'm asking you as, because as that someone did who's in cause angst across uh, the First Nations communities throughout the campaign, and I think it's really important uh, that that particular question is answered. Uh, in terms of uh, our government, we clearly... Uh, you know, we do reach out, and I certainly reach out to First Nations people tonight and all those uh, volunteers right across the country who worked on this campaign, and I say thank you. Uh, thank you for your efforts and your hard work uh, and for your heart and your love into this and, and the way you conducted yourself to try and get the best outcome. You know, one of the things the Prime Minister said, David, was that it wasn't about, uh, you know, whether we obviously wanted to win, but it was, it was about having a go and, I th and getting out there and, uh, and having a go because First Nations people had worked but on this since 2017. Question, where does constitutional recognition go now? 
Well, that's a conversation we're going to have. Uh, we're going to have to have, obviously, post this, like a lot of conversations. And but for now, I think it's also important to just uh, respect the fact that those people who have been behind this all the way and those who've carried it for decades, they probably just need a bit of time. Senator, I'm, I'm curious to know how our communities heal after this year. Um, there's been a lot of pain, a, mm. a lot of racism, a lot of difficult conversations, different views within own families and own communities. What's your view on how people wake up tomorrow morning? I mean, people still have to get up and go to the cold place of closing the gap on Monday morning and continue going. Mm. But do you think there'll be Aboriginal people in this country who will see this as a rejection of them and their rights and their stories? Look, I think there will be <clears throat> a mixture of feelings right across for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, Bridget. You know, there are so many people who aspired for our country to be seen very differently tonight. And, uh, you know, that is going to be deeply felt uh, from all of those people who supported uh, this referendum. And I do think that it will take time. But one of the, the other things I do know about, uh, uh, certainly about our mob, is that uh, we've had many disappointments over decades and, and centuries, really. And I think that we are resilient people and uh, we just will take stock. And, Senator, to you, why did we see such levels of vitriol and hate directed to everyday Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who opened up their phone on Instagram or TikTok and saw some of the most vile racism a lot of people have ever seen in their lives? I think it would have been a very difficult period for most Indigenous people and I think it would have been very similar to what the LGBTI community went through in the postal survey in 2017. Um, now, as an outsider looking in, uh, I'm very sorry that's happened. Um, the reality is that when you go to a referendum on a topic like this, there was always going to be difficult conversations, there were going to be nasty things said, and I very much regret that all this work has come to nothing. I think it's very sad, and as I said, the nation is going to be very hurt by this outcome. What um, role do you think disinformation on social media has played in I mean, this campaign? I mean, as I indicated to you before, I mean, I think a lot of the questions about the product stem from the fact that it wasn't as strong as it could have been because the process wasn't very good. Now, if there had been, for example, an exposure draft bill, like we had on marriage equality, a lot of the detail questions... You think questions, people wanted that detail? But look, a lot of, look I, I know it's not for everyone, right? Not everyone was going to ask about Section 32 of the bill, but for some people it would have made a difference. And I think it would have enabled the yes side to push away some of the disinformation. So I think it would have benefited the campaign, certainly in the marriage equality debate of 2017, having a bill on the, on the table, we had Dean Smith's bill, made a big difference. Just, just quickly before we uh, say goodbye um, to you both, what would you like to hear from Peter Dutton tonight? Just bearing in mind you're a Liberal, but you supported yes. What would you like to hear him say tonight? Well, I think he will be very reflective and I think he will understand that a lot of people in this country are going to be very hurt. And I'm sure that he will indicate that when he has something to say. Have you advised him of that? No, but I think his instincts are good. He's a very decent person and my sense is that he will make his own judgments about these things. But that, that is the main point, that people are hurting and I'm sure that he will reflect upon that. I'm sure he's watching, so uh, we'll, uh, he'll be taking advice from you, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to hear, no doubt, from the, the two leaders we're expecting to uh, a little later tonight after this result. Counting, of course, continues across the country, but it is clear voters have not embraced the call for an Indigenous voice. New South Wales, Tasmania, South Australia and Queensland have voted no. As counting continues, the ACT is currently the only jurisdiction that's voted yes. Now, Anthony and I will be keeping you up to date with the latest figures as they continue to flow in. But coming up, we'll discuss what comes next for the country and for First Nations people who are following tonight's vote. Dan Borsher and I will be joined by Lisa Jackson-Pulver and Chelsea Wadigo, as well as Marcus Stewart, Tom Calmer, Fred Hooper and Catherine Little, Wesley Aird, Yvonne Weldon and Michael Mansell. Big thanks to our panellists, Senator Malandiri McCarthy and Andrew Bragg. Thank you both very much for joining us this evening. Time now to get a new uh, uh, news update with Gemma Vaness in the newsroom. Gemma. Thanks, David. The Department of Foreign Affairs has announced that scheduled repatriation flights from Israel have been cancelled. Political reporter Matthew Doran is live in our Parliament House Bureau in Canberra. Matthew, what do we know? 
Gemma, good evening. This announcement was made by the department's Smart Traveller service on its social media outlets. And it said that because of the highly challenging and rapidly changing situation in Israel, it has had to cancel those flights. It says, we have been advised our scheduled flights will not depart Israel today. A further flight will not depart as scheduled tomorrow. It's gone on to say that the federal government is working as hard as it can to ensure that Australians trapped in the region, unable to get flights, other, other flights out of the region, are able to do so as quickly as possible and it will communicate any updates with them as soon as they come to hand. No further information has been provided at this stage as to why those flights have been cancelled but uh, we do know that there has been missile activity in the area which has forced other airlines and we know that this flight, this next one at least, was going to be operated by Qantas has forced them to stop flying into Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion airport. A little earlier today the Defence Minister Richard Miles was asked about this situation and specifically whether Australian defence planes, Royal Australian Air Force planes, could be used to try to ferry Australians out of the area. We are looking at how we can resolve issues around the repatriate, repatriation flights which we had in train. We're also looking at ways in which we can uh, find other alternatives for uh, Australians who are wanting to, to leave Israel to be able to afford them that assistance. So uh, this has been very much front and centre really since the moment, well, for the last week, uh, knowing that there would be a desire for uh, a number of the Australians who are in Israel to, to see to leave. So we'll continue to work this issue as we are and we're working it very hard. The Defence Minister, Minister Richard Miles earlier this evening. We know that one flight has managed to get out of Tel Aviv, a Qantas operated flight to London. More than 200 Australians on board. Gemma. Matthew Doran in Canberra. Thank you. And let's go to the Middle East now, where anticipation of a full-scale Israeli ground offensive in Gaza is growing. The Israeli Defence Force says it'll allow the safe movement of Gazans on two main roads south over the next four hours. ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons reports from Jerusalem. It's obviously very grim. The Israelis uh, are on the brink of their land invasion. Just in terms of Gaza's situation as it currently is, I think it's basically a humanitarian crisis already. The Israeli army in the last uh, week has dropped 6,000 bombs on the Gaza Strip. Now, just to get a sense of that perspective, imagine cutting Canberra in half, putting 2.3 million people into half of it and then dropping 6,000 bombs on it. That's Gaza at the moment. No food, no water is allowed in. But as Benjamin Netanyahu says, this is just the beginning. Um, and in fact, the ground offensive, the ground invasion is likely to wreak much more havoc, especially on civilians. Live from Jerusalem, ABC Global Affairs editor John Lyons. New Zealand is likely to have a new government. With more than 70% of votes counted, the National Party, led by Christopher Luxon, has increased its margin and is now holding 40% of the vote. Together with the ACT Party, it is projected to have more than enough seats to form government. The governing Labor Party of Prime Minister Chris Hipkins trails on 26%, with the Greens third on 10%. And back now to our coverage of The Voice referendum. Good evening and you're watching the ABC's coverage of the referendum live here on Gadigal Country in Sydney. I'm Bridget Brennan. And I'm Dan Borsha. Let's bring in our next panel, City of Sydney Councillor Yvonne Weldon. Great to have you along. Thank you. CEO of the National Voice for Our Children, Snake Catherine Little. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And the Director of the Centre for Indigenous Training and former Coalition Advisor during the Howard and Abbott years, Wesley Aird. Great to see you. Hi. And I believe we've also got the Chairman of the Aboriginal Land Council of Tasmania, Michael Mansell. Well, we'll begin the conversation shortly, but first, here's David Spears with an update. Bridget, thank you very much. Just a snapshot of where we're at. The result we know has been a no vote from Australia. The two-part uh, requirement to win a referendum has been lost by the Yes case. Starting with the states, the six states over here, you can see one, two, three of them have voted no. New South Wales... Tasmania, sorry, four of them, South Australia and Queensland, all voting no. Uh, we're yet to see the result is line ball still at the moment in Victoria and WA. We're yet to see any of the results come in. Then you can see the national vote also a no from the majority of Australians. And if we look at the, uh, the actual numbers there for the national vote, 
Overwhelmingly no, 57, just over 57 per cent of Australians have voted no at a national level. That of course includes those two territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory. They don't count towards the state tally. Uh, but the ACT at the moment, the only jurisdiction to vote yes. The Northern Territory, we still don't have enough uh, uh, of the results in yet to determine whether it has voted yes or no. But you can see quite a strong no vote in orange there in the Northern Territory as well. Let's go to Anthony Green, though, to get a closer look at some of these numbers. Anthony. Start with the national trends. Again, Victoria, the yes vote has started to drift down slightly, but at this stage it's still too early to call Victoria. But um, that the drift upwards has declined. New South Wales, Tasmania, South Australia and Queensland have all voted no. The ACT, yes. Just a quick look at the Northern Territory. Um, the results, the count's rather slow. Solomon has definitely got a no vote. Solomon is the urban seat and it's definitely going to vote no um, on, the, on the numbers we're looking at. Lingiari, um, at the moment, the figures are mainly from the large centres. There's no remote polling place centres in yet, which is where most of the Indigenous people call, vote. So, at this stage, that's leaning towards voting no for the Northern Territory as a whole, but I'd want to see some more figures for Lingiari first. So, that's the first thing to say. Another thing, I just want to go back to the map of Sydney, because this is interesting, uh, and, and, and this is about national uh, politics in the next election rather than the, the referendum, but just simply that you've got all these teal seats which have voted yes, McKellar, uh, Warringah, 61% yes, North Sydney, 61, Wentworth, um, 64, and Bradfield, which used to be the safest Liberal seat in Sydney, 52% yes. Paul Fletcher, the member for, for, for Bradfield, there was a major redistribution coming in New South Wales. It is very likely that Paul Fletcher will end up running in a seat against T Carly Tink. Who's the member, the independent member for North Shore, North Sydney? North Sydney will it'll really struggle to survive in the redistribution. So there's some real politics in terms of the party votes there. And just one other thing, I'll just bring up Graindler. 77% for 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 um, for Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister. But then you look at safe seats in Western Sydney, Chifley, 42% uh, yes. Prospect, which is uh, um, Chris Bowen's seat, 65% no. Uh, let's look at Blacksland, which is um, the Education Minister, Mr Clare, 63%. Watson, Tony Burke's seat, 56%. No. Banks, a marginal Liberal seat, 61%. Fowler, which is the independent seat, Di Lee, even that is 60, 60.8%. 60 no. So it's very solid across Western Sydney, a vote for no. So it's, uh, it's, it's a really divided city, as I've said several times, and Cos and Tony were talking about, this looks very much like the Republic referendum in 1999 is eight seats with a high social status have tended to vote yes and other seats have tended to vote no. And that's been a pattern that's repeated in both Sydney and Melbourne and some other seats dotted around the country and it's very reflective of the Republic referendum in 1999. Thanks, Anthony. So certainly not a vote that's been split down party lines. Well, let's go to Yvonne Weldon. I can see you're very yeah, disappointed in this result tonight. When we look at that result in outer Sydney, yeah. there's a lot of blackfellas out in Western yeah. Sydney as well yeah. and a high amount of multicultural Australians. Yeah. Why do you think um, that part of the country has returned such look, a I, high no vote? I, I think there, there has you know, been a, no, a number of Aboriginal communities that have been moved to you know, Western Sydney uh, over you know, certainly the assimilation policies of the day. Um, but we also look at uh, the multicultural societies that are out there not necessarily aware um, of First Nation issues. Uh, there is a whole melting pot uh, in some of these suburbs. Um, but when we think about uh, this country and certainly the educational process in this country of what the truth telling is, mm. we're not there yet. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that has a, a major impact. And I certainly know there was, you know, certainly a lot of work that was going into it of late. Um, but I think it's a lot longer um, term in terms of the issues of trying to be received and, and to be known. And can I ask, what does Australia's decision tonight mean for you? Oh, I'm devastated. I certainly, you know, have a very strong family history around uh, fighting for our rights. Um, I thought this was a step in the right direction. I'm certainly concerned about the numbers of how many of Australians that think that no is the only way. Every single state and territory need to look at themselves in terms of their data and the outcomes for our people. Uh, it's not just about this country, it's about every one of those states 
uh, every one of those territories and how they look at our people and how they are and are not responding. These issues are not because of us alone, it's because of so much more. And people need to start to look at themselves as a result of that. The systemic discrimination that's Without a doubt. in our country. Yeah. yeah, and there'll be a lot of uh, reckoning to do with mm. that. Uh, Wesley, mm -hmm. I want to bring you in. You're on the other side of this discussion. How are you reacting to this news tonight? Dan, I don't, I don't take pleasure in the result because there are so many people that have worked so hard for so long. We're all Australians mm -hmm. and we all want to see better. But it looks like this was not the thing that Australia was going to support. Um, the campaign's had its issues. But I think what we need to do now is to sort of say, well, what does it mean? You know, what is the healing that has to happen? And also, I think it, it highlights to me that a lot of mainstream non-Indigenous Australians don't actually understand the full picture of what is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island um, demography. Yeah, well, that's certainly a point that was being yeah. made there. Yeah, Wesley, I'm curious um, when you said there that you, you think a lot of people... Um, there, well, there are some people that accept that there are issues and problems that we need to address. Yep. Why weren't they convinced that the voice to Parliament was the solution? It's possible because of the way the campaign was run. I mean, the campaign was handed over to a lot of corporates um, at a time when there was a, um, a cost of living crisis. And it wasn't I think necessarily handed over to corporates. It had corporate support. Mm. It had a lot of corporate support and it looked like a corporate campaign. It looked... You know, there were some photo ops there with some very key parliamentarians and mm. supporters. It looked pretty corporate-ish to me. And that didn't appeal to everyday Australians? No, no I, I, I don't think so. Um, I th and... I think people questioned when they were told that there was 80% Indigenous support. That statistic was out of date, but it kept on coming up. And I think that because we did have um, Indigenous leaders in a no campaign, I think for a lot of Australians, it didn't look like there were 3% Indigenous Australians or, you know, 4% in Queensland. It didn't look like there was a unified Indigenous community or polity that all wanted this. Mm. Catherine, can I bring mm. you in? Sure. We've, uh, like everyone on this panel, we've talked a lot about this yeah. campaign throughout the year. Mm -hmm. You've at times raised real dismay about the tone mm -hmm. and about uh, the vitriol, in fact, as every, mm -hmm. everyone has. I wonder how you're reacting right now. Um, how am I reacting right now? I think I'm still absorbing it and there's no doubt about it. I would have liked to have seen it got ac get across the line. There's no doubt about that um, because I live and breathe these statistics relating to the closing the gap, they're real. They're real. Um, we have more children dying. Our ch children, child mortality rates are, are pretty shocking. The number of children being removed for their families, shocking. The number of children committing suicide, shocking. The fact that our families, our parents die, our children die, our, our brothers and sisters die earlier than everyone else. These are real statistics and this was an opportunity to get in a structural change that budged that. But again, um, I'm sure as you know, I never stay in those places long. Those stats are real. So when I hear this news, I look at what went right, actually, and what I saw go right was an incredible number of people actually come together. The rooms I go into were in remarkably positive. People were getting behind this. I saw collaboration that I hadn't seen since I was a child, watching my, uh, my family get ready to march on the streets to get the Royal Commission into black deaths in custody. I have not seen movement like that in a long time. These are positive things. I look at the fact that there were um, 80,000 volunteers for the Yes campaign. Oh my goodness, that's an incredible number of people saying there's a structural problem, we want to we get behind what could potentially be a solution. So I look at those sorts of things um, and I, I see a different picture. I see that right now we got a lot of mob, going to feel sad and that's okay, feel disappointed, that's okay. But we have survived for 60, more than 65,000 years. There is no other culture as resilient as us. We'll get back up and we come back with fire. The problems need to be solved. We come back to the table and we move. It's an interesting point you make because Dean Parkin was on the program earlier and he said that the, the numbers can't be seen as a swing either way, mm. that what we are seeing now is the base of support for change. Tanya Hosh made mm. a similar point in terms of the, those that have supported this. It sounds as though to me that's what you're seeing it as as well, that, mm. that as we are looking at those numbers, the millions of people that, that voted yes, as you've pointed out, 
are actually saying something has got to change. I think that is. I, th I think that is the case. And and again, with three percent of the population, that's not a big number of people to move big numbers across the line. So I always lean into what is positive and I always lean into the fact that we do have the ability to solve problems and we are incredible at solving those problems. So um, my gut is um, most people will go down for a day or two and then wake up and say, how do we come back at this? How do we look at the problems? How do we use the momentum that we've seen and how do we start progressing? And I think nearly every person out there is going to say, start with the truth telling because that is going to solve a lot of these problems because a lot of what we were seeing, particularly in the rhetoric and the conversations, was that getting the truth of a story through was almost impossible to do almost impossible. So when we start looking at when we start able to be able to compel people to talk about what is really going on, when people talk about things like the hot potato racism, it was misconstrued as to saying everyone's a racist. That's not what people are talking about. They're talking about what is structural, what is embedded, what, what, why is it that every one of, say, the Northern Territory, where we're 30% of, uh, of the population and the government runs all these services, why is there barely an Indigenous executive director there? That's a structural barrier mm. it's, and, attend, and needs exploration. They're the things that people are talking about. What does it actually mean if you haven't lived it, if you haven't felt it, what does it look like? What mm. does it mean and how do we remove it? Which is very different from throwing stones at individuals. I want to bring in Palawa leader Michael Mansell in Tasmania, in Hobart tonight. Michael, good to see you. Uh, why do you think Australians voted no tonight? Uh, this was a, an awful campaign that was run by both the Prime Minister and the Yes campaign. Uh, at no stage did they put forward a compelling case as to why an advisory body should be entrenched in the Constitution. Instead, the whole campaign was based on emotion. They were saying, you know, all the ads, you might recall all the ads showing disadvantage, disadvantage, and then somehow stitching that to the advisory body as a solution. And, and at no stage did the Yes campaign explain how an advisory body could do that which the Prime Minister, state governments and the peak organisations couldn't. And instead of mm. taking on that core issue and explaining to people, uh, here is why this is so good, they just expected people uh, to jump on board emotionally if you are not a racist uh, if you're not anti-Aboriginal, you'll vote for this. And, of course, it worked with some people, but obviously not enough. And what about your assessment of the No campaign? How influential was the No campaign, led by Jacinta Nabajipa Price and Warren Mundine, speaking about their points of view that this was a divisive proposal? Well, uh, I, ca I could never understand why the Yes campaigners never expected a major opposition to come from the conservative section of Australia. And what we did see was the Liberal and National Party very cleverly allow two black faces to lead the No campaign and Peter Dutton and David Littleproud were then able to uh, sit behind them and let the two Aboriginal candidates run the No case and it was very effective. And instead of the Yes campaign explaining why the arguments from Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine uh, were not valid, uh, people like Marcia Langton and Pat Dodson and other people, uh, you know, used the old racist tag. And, and the, the other thing that comes out of this is this real policy question that hasn't yet been discussed, let alone resolved, at the same time as Australia went to a referendum today, New Zealand went to an election to again elect seven Maoris into the parliament where they can make legislation, they can pressure governments, they can really represent Maori people. And the policy underlying that in New Zealand is New Zealand has agreed to share power with the Maoris. The Prime Minister refuses to talk to Aboriginal people about whether 
he agrees to sharing power in one form or another because this proposal was not about sharing power with Aboriginal people. This was about leaving Aboriginal people on the outside, trying to influence the power brokers. And, of course, mm. um, it didn't work. And even if it had worked, it wouldn't have made the least bit of difference. And all of those campaigns by the yes, yes people saying, you know, when they raise the expectations of Aboriginal people that your lives will be better, will this young child have a future? I mean, that was pretty underhanded. So they shouldn't particularly point the finger at the no camp. They should look a bit in the mirror and just see how they run their campaign. Bridget, just on that... Go ahead, Liz. As, as I'm looking back at, at the last few months, sometimes I feel I got a bit confused because... On the one hand, we had a proposition to alter the Constitution. It was very clear. It was set out through Parliament through a Constitution alteration bill, uh, the explanatory memorandum put forward by the Attorney-General. But at other times, it was as if we were having an existential conversation around all sorts of other things. And, and I think sometimes we needed to... It would have helped if we stayed focused on what we were trying to do. And if we're trying to overcome Indigenous yep. disadvantage, then that's what we should have stuck with. I'm, go I'm, I'm just going to stop you there. Thank you so much, Wesley. But we're going to go to Warren Mundine, who's with Patricia Carvelis in Brisbane at the No Function. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, Warren Mundine, you've certainly won tonight. Uh, Have you I won... The Australian people won. What will, is reconciliation now dead in this country? Oh, no, no way it's dead. Uh, the, the Australia has been a, on a journey f now for, for 30 years uh, and we've had a wonderful journey moving forward. Uh, just because a proposal that was put forward was rejected by the Australian public, there's two things that really I've heard in the polling booths and I've heard around Australia is, one, they want practical outcomes for Indigenous people. They'd, they're, they're sick and tired of, of, of governments mucking up things. They want it to be fixed. And, of course, the other thing is they do want to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people recognising the Constitution uh, for, as the first people of this country and they are very proud of the uh, Aboriginal people and its history. Um, Thomas Mayer spoke to the ABC a little earlier, our colleague Isabella Higgins, and said that he's not angry with the Australian people. He believes the No campaign ran a dirty campaign of lies. There were many things that your campaign said that weren't true. Do you regret taking that approach? I reject your, uh, uh, what you just said. Uh, the idea of uh, dividing on racial division when there's already race in the Constitution, that's not factual? Well, the factual is that I'm Aboriginal. I've, all my life I've been uh, told I'm a, I'm a member of the Aboriginal race. My parents have been told that they're a member of the Aboriginal race and therefore it is race. Uh, and, and Torres Strait Islanders is a race. Look, they tried to, to, to sell a furphy, which was that, you know, for... 200 and something years, we've been classified as a race of Aboriginal people. And then when they want to put it in the Constitution, they say it's not about race. Well, it is about race. <laughs> Indigenous people are uh, many, not all, clearly you're not, but are heartbroken and feel like this is a time of mourning. What's your message to Indigenous Australians who are, uh, I think, probably having a really hard time tonight? Look, the, the, the thing was... Uh, they were promised something that didn't exist. And the first thing that, about this, this is a referendum we should never have had because it was built on a lie that Aboriginal people do not have a voice. Well, the Coalition of the Peaks sits at the National Cabinet and they advise government, and these are the people like Pat Turner, these are all yes voters. But governments could ignore them, couldn't they? Yeah. They're not, they're, there's nothing sort of structurally set in that means that they have to be consulted. Well, neither does that, do, and, and this is what the Prime Minister said and everyone else said, that uh, they don't have to uh, accept and they can ignore uh, the voice of the Parliament. And so, so what's the difference? You know, you sort of wonder why we spent hundreds of millions of dollars when we should have actually been spending that money on, on those communities that are struggling. Warren Mundine, I'm going to throw back to Sydney. Bridget? Thanks so much, PK. Let's go to Anthony Green at the touchscreen now. Yeah, uh, we just... I think, uh, look, we've decided we're going to call the Northern Territory. It's got a 60% um, no vote. No, my screen's decided to play up. The, um, the referendum, the vote in um, the Northern Territory 
is, six, is more than 60% no at the moment. So we believe that uh, Lingari looks like a solid no. Sorry, not Lingari. Solomon is a, lo is, a, is a solid no. Lingari is leaning no. There are no remotes in, only two small remote polling places in where most of the Indigenous voters to come. There's a lot of Catherine and Alice Springs votes to come. So at this stage, it looks like Lingari will vote no. And on that basis, we're prepared to call the uh, Northern Territory has also voted no. Yvonne, thanks, Anthony. Yvonne, um, to you, what, what are the key reasons why you believe Australians rejected this proposal at the referendum? Look, I, I believe that the no campaign was extremely confusing uh, with, uh, you know, what was before the people itself. Um, just listening to Warren Mundine and his lack of uh, ownership around his contribution to that just goes to show that there is so many of the people that have been politicians over time and continue to sit at tables. I mean, Warren was an advisor for, for governments, um, you know, for many years, and yet he's saying that this was a process that people were going, potentially going to be ignored. The fact that there were so many lies that were put to the Australian people from the no, uh, the, the no group, the, the no case, um, is disappointing. And then there was, you know, co confusion around what was progressive no and what was a soft no and all these other terms. Uh, people would... So that was for people to feel comfortable about being against representing First Nations people in the Constitution and also having a say. You know, I hear that there are peak bodies, and yes, they are at some of those tables, but some of the changes that could have been made locally from people locally about their issues and so that how they could be addressed, mm -hmm. that was lost in this vote and certainly lost in so, uh, the conversation that has taken place in a lack of mature uh, process. Yep. But when I think about where we're at for people, particularly when we think about how many children have been removed, how many of our young people are, are dying by suicide, uh, young deaths, you know, us, and how we can address those issues, there's so much more. And we have not been able to get that across to the people that think that we already have enough and we don't. When we have these stats that continue to affect us each and every day and will continue to for generations, I'm so disappointed because my great-grandfather, who was born in 1900, I was thinking about him all throughout this. In fact, I've got a recording of him speaking before he passed. And when I think about now, do I have to wait to be a great-grandmother before change starts to happen in this country? It certainly hasn't been done for me from my great-grandfather that was born in 1900. And yet here am I as a grandmother handing over to my grandchildren that this has not been addressed today. Can change happen without constitutional recognition and without constitutional change? You need uh, true leadership to be taken place across all parties. We're, we're going to have to go, leave you there to take you to the Prime, Prime Minister, Minister live now. from Canberra. Thumbs up and you're ready to go. Doesn't sound like you're ready to go. No. <laughs> My fellow Australians, at the outset, I want to say that while tonight's result is not one that I had hoped for, I absolutely respect the decision of the Australian people and the democratic process that has delivered it. When we reflect on everything happening in the world today, we can all give thanks that here in Australia, we make the big decisions peacefully and as equals, with one vote, one value. And I say to the millions of Australians all over our great country who voted yes with hope and goodwill, the people who volunteered with such energy and enthusiasm, many of whom were taking part in their first ever campaign, that just as the Uluru Statement from the Heart was an invitation extended with humility, grace and optimism for the future, tonight we must meet this result with the same grace and humility. And tomorrow we must seek a new way forward with the same optimism. My fellow Australians, the first time I spoke to you as Prime Minister of this nation, I repeated a commitment I had given many times before as Labor leader. I promised 
that our government would seek to implement the Uluru Statement from the heart. I gave my word to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders and elders who had poured their hopes and aspirations into that extraordinary statement. I spoke to the people from all walks of life and all sides of politics, the people of every faith and background and tradition who had embraced this cause. I promised our government would seek to answer the generous and gracious call of those 440 powerful words through a voice, recognition, enshrined in the Constitution. I never imagined or indeed said that it would be easy. Very few things in public life worth doing are. Nor could I guarantee the referendum would succeed. History told us that only eight out of 44 had done so. What I could promise was that we would go all in, that we would try, and we have. We have given Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the fulfilment of their request, that we take forward an idea that had been decades in the making, and we would give the Australian people the opportunity to decide for themselves. We have kept that promise. We have given our all. We argued for this change, not out of convenience, but from conviction, because that's what people deserve from their government. And of course, when you do the hard things, when you aim high, sometimes you fall short. And tonight, we acknowledge, understand and respect that we have. As Prime Minister, I will always accept responsibility for the decisions I've taken, and I do so tonight. But I do want Australians to know that I will always be ambitious for our country, ambitious for us to be the very best version of ourselves. I will always be optimistic for what we can achieve together. In that spirit, just as I offered many times to cooperate with people from across the political spectrum on the next steps in the event of a yes victory, I renew that offer of cooperation tonight. Because this moment of disagreement does not define us and it will not divide us. We are not yes voters or no voters. We are all Australians. And it is as Australians, together, that we must take our country beyond this debate without forgetting why we had it in the first place. Because too often in the life of our nation and in the political conversation, the disadvantage confronting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has been relegated to the margins. This referendum and my government has put it right at the centre. All of us have been asked to imagine what it would be like to walk in someone else's shoes. And we've been challenged to examine decades of failure from both sides of politics despite all of the good intentions in the world. Indeed, those arguing against a change to the Constitution were not arguing for the status quo because no one could say that more of the same is good enough for Australia. Let us hold on to that truth because a great nation like ours can and must do better for the first Australians. And while there has been talk in recent times about division, let us now cooperate to address the real division. The real division is one of disadvantage. The division that is the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians in life expectancy, in educational opportunity, in rates of suicide and disease. 
the gap which separates Indigenous Australians from the right to make a good life for themselves. I supported recognition through a voice because this was the vehicle that Indigenous Australians believed could change this. This was the change they asked for at the First Nations Constitutional Convention at Uluru in 2017, after a process that involved hundreds of meetings and thousands of people. And I want to make it clear, I believed it was the right thing to do and I will always stand up for my beliefs. It's now up to all of us to come together and find a different way to the same reconciled destination. I'm optimistic that we can, and indeed that we must. There is a new national awareness of these questions. Let us channel that into a new sense of national purpose to find the answers. The proposition we advanced at this referendum was about listening to people in order to get better outcomes. And these principles are what will continue to guide me as Australia's 31st Prime Minister. Our government will continue to listen to people and to communities. Our government will continue to seek better outcomes for Indigenous Australians and their children and the generations to come. This is not only in the interests of Indigenous Australians, it is in the interests of all Australians to build a better future for our nation. Tonight, I want to recognise that for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, this campaign has been a heavy weight to carry and this result will be very hard to bear. So many remarkable Indigenous Australians have put their heart and soul into this cause, not just over the past few weeks and months, but through decades, indeed lifetimes of advocacy. I have been honoured and humbled to stand by you and witness your extraordinary courage and grace, your great love for our country and your deep faith in our people. None less than my friend standing with me here tonight. You continue to inspire me and make me prouder than ever to be Australian. I have never been as proud to be Australian as when I sat in the red dirt at Uluru with those wonderful women, with those wonderful women. I have made lifetime friends and for that I am grateful. Constitutional change may not have happened tonight, but change has happened in our great nation. Respect and recognition is given at events. The fullness of our history has begun to be told. Maintain your hope and know that you are loved. My fellow Australians, our nation's road to reconciliation has often been hard going. The climb steep, the ground uncertain, the headwinds powerful, the way forward difficult to navigate. But through the decades, there have been hard moments of, moments of hard won progress as well. That's why I say tonight is not the end of the road and it is certainly not the end of our efforts to bring people together. The issues we sought to address have not gone away and neither have the people of goodwill and good heart who want to address them. And address them we will, with hope in our heart, with faith in each other, with kindness towards each other, walking together in a spirit of unity and healing, walking together for a better future for the first Australians whose generosity of spirit and resilience intensifies the privilege that all Australians have of sharing this continent with the oldest continuous culture on earth. The historic fact that Australia's story 
is 65,000 years old remains a source of national pride and remains a fact. From tomorrow, we will continue to write the next chapter in that great Australian story. And we will write it together. And reconciliation must be a part of that chapter. Thank Linda. you. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. For many, today is a day of sadness. This result is not what we hoped for. The Australian people have had their say and a clear majority have voted against the proposed change to the Constitution. We, of course, accept the decision of the Australian people. Tonight, I am reminded of a special couple, Auntie Gloria and Uncle Clive. Their story tells us so much about our country. They are 90 and 93 years of age. Gloria is Aboriginal, Clive is non-Aboriginal. They married in 1953 at a time in our history when the union, the union was not accepted. They've seen a lot in life, the ups and downs, the best and the worst. They've experienced the joy of a shared life and raising a family. And they've experienced discrimination and the awful scourge of racism. But they always got through it with an open heart, with their strength of their family and community. Their lives show us how far we've come and how far we will still have to go in this country. That there is a common bond, that we are stronger together. Gloria and Clive voted yes in this referendum because they want to see a better future for their children and grandchildren. Gloria and Clive won't give, up, won't give up on a better future and neither will we. I could not be more proud of people like Gloria and Clive and the tens of thousands of YES volunteers who work so hard for recognition. You are truly, truly inspirational. The Yes 23 campaign, the Uluru Dialogues, and of course the Prime Minister, and my parliamentary colleagues, thank you all so much. I will never forget that day in September when some 200,000 Australians walked together for Yes right across this country. I know this outcome will be hard for some, but achieving progress is never easy, and pro progress doesn't always move in a straight line. There are breakthroughs and heartbreaks, but I am confident that because of this campaign and the millions of conversations it sparked, that a new generation of Indigenous leaders will emerge. Young people like Sarah and Jakira, whom I met in Adelaide, they are stepping up and carrying the flame. That something good will become from shining a light on the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I want to say this. I know the last few months have been tough, but be proud of who you are. Be proud of your identity. Be proud of the 65,000 years of history and culture that you are part of and your rightful place in this country. We will carry on and we will move forward and we will thrive. This is not the end of reconciliation. And in the months ahead, I will have more to say about our government's renewed commitment to closing the gap. Because we all agree we need better outcomes 
for First Nations people. We need to keep listening to Indigenous Australians about what works and what can make practical difference for the next gener generation. Because we all want what's best for our children. We all want our children and grandchildren to have a better future. Have we take questions? Prime Minister, yeah. why do you think Australians voted no? Well, the, the analysis will go on for, for some time, no doubt. But the truth is that no referendum has succeeded without bipartisan support in this country. No. None. Here to change the country. There'll be a lot of Indigenous Australians tonight who are disappointed in the result. What immediate ideas do you have to improve or achieve those better outcomes in the short term and how will you ensure that reconcili reconciliation rather isn't set back given some of the comments from the Yes Camp? Well, I'll tell you the first thing we'll do is listen, continue to listen. We'll continue to listen and we will engage with those Indigenous Australians, treating them with respect. <laughs> Tonight will be a very difficult night for many Indigenous Australians. Overwhelmingly, if you look at the Indigenous dominated booths in places like Palm Island and Mornington Island and Lockhart River and Gadooga, uh, the uh, mobile polling booths aren't yet in from the Northern Territory. Overwhelmingly, they have voted yes in this referendum. Uh, we will. Tonight isn't a time to say, oh, well, we'll just move on and have uh, here, here's the, the, uh, the, the next agenda. The agenda will be, uh, will be guided by the principles that I've put forward consistently. Engagement, consultation, listening, progress to close the gap. Prime Minister, in light of what you've just said, the first words out of your mouth as Prime Minister was a commitment to the, to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. Is that still Labor's commitment? Uh, we just had a referendum. We just had a referendum and the referendum wasn't successful. I respect the outcome of that referendum. Yeah. So can that not be sweet, Prime Minister, you said, because Australians are a fair, compassionate and courageous people, I believe we're ready to take this step together. Does, re does tonight's result tell you otherwise that we are not a fair, compassionate and courageous people? Yeah, I, I think Australians are fair and compassionate. I think during this campaign, uh, we have had a very clear proposition of just two things, recognition and a non-binding advisory committee. But we've had, uh, including in outlets represented in this room, uh, discussions about a whole range of things that were nothing to do with what was on the ballot paper tonight. You all know that that has occurred. Um, debates about, you know, uh, debates about the length of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that no one's serious no one's serious, no one in this room. Uh, is there anyone in this room thinks it was more than what it was? But we had pages and pages and weeks and weeks donated, uh, uh, which those issues uh, were uh, portrayed. So for many people, uh, it uh, became uh, a, an, an issue in which uh, they are receiving a range of information. Uh, you know, the Reserve Bank uh, can rest easy now that they won't be getting advice on interest rates before the next meeting. That, that was some of the things that were discussed. So there's a range of, uh, of reasons, but changing the Constitution is hard. Yes. I said when I announced it, I stood here and said it's hard. There are no guarantees of success. We knew that that was the case. But we also knew this, that Prime Minister John Howard promised to have a referendum on recognition, that Scott Morrison prior to 2019 promised to have a, a uh, referendum 
on recognition. I was there in 2019 at Gama with Ken Wyatt, mm -hmm. who I have total respect for, who stood there and gave just as I did after the 2022 election. After the 2019 election, uh, there was a speech at Gama saying we would advance this. Uh, we promised, we promised to accept the graceful invitation of First Australians to put this to the Australian people. We did that. We campaigned for it. Uh, we did so with integrity and principle, uh, but we were not successful, and we respect that outcome. Prime Phil. Minister, you, Prime Minister, you Phil. Yes. And then. Yes, sir. You, you came to office um, proposing other referenda, uh, the Republic, something, you've, not this term, but you've you, you, you've sort of you've moved it. You might look at that next term. You have a minister for the republic. What does this defeat do for plans you may have for other referendum, especially given your observation that without bipartisan support you can't get a referendum? Is this, is this basically the end of referenda uh, unless there's support from the opposition and the well, government for any other proposal as well? Well, I made it very clear uh, that this was the only referendum that I was proposing uh, in this term. I mean, for, for, well, I, I made no commitments about any further referendums. One of the things I did on election night, I spoke about this today, I spoke about it yesterday as well, uh, was I went through the range of commitments that I'd made. Cheaper childcare, housing, national reconstruction and new industry, our climate policy and this. We've gone through and fulfilled all of them. I'm someone who believes that we need to restore faith in politics. And one of the ways that we do that is by saying what we'll do and then doing what we've said we would do. That is what we have done tonight. And uh, I make uh, no apologies for that. Well, Just yeah, 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 yeah. Referendums and are about now. unity and deciding as a country what the best um, route is moving forward. As Prime Minister, how do you reconcile with the fact that your personal views and the views of most of your party aren't aligned with the majority of Australians? Look, we, we accept the result. Yeah. We accept the outcome. Uh, we had uh, a referendum that we put forward. We know uh, that uh, this arose, this arose uh, from a request made in 2017 through the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I wasn't Prime Minister in 2017, uh, but uh, we had waited, Indigenous Australians had waited for a long period of time for, the government, for a government to have the conviction uh, to put this to the Australian people. Uh, my predecessor was promised uh, support from the Labor Party if the Morrison government uh, fulfilled uh, that and took it forward to a referendum. They chose not to do so, uh, as, is, as is their right. Uh, we chose to do so, and uh, there wasn't, uh, during uh, the campaign as well, there isn't a single occasion in which uh, of all of the Indigenous uh, people who I've spent time with, who it's been my honour to spend time with. Not once at Gama, not once at Uluru, not once anywhere else did people go, hang on a tick here, can we just kick this can down the road further? There are people who've been involved who stood on this stage with me in March, who spent a lifetime on this, a lifetime struggling just to be recognised in our constitution. I had a duty as a conviction politician to put that to the Australian people. And I'm reminded, uh, I'm reminded uh, of uh, uh, one of my favourite uh, Churchill quotes. There's quite a few good ones. Success is not final, failure is not fatal, 
it is the courage to continue that counts. We intend as a government to continue to do what we can to close the gap, to do what we can to advance reconciliation, to do what we can to listen to the First Australians. Thanks very much. Thank you. They're ending uh, with a Churchill quote, but beginning by saying it wasn't the outcome that he was hoping for, but certainly is one that he accepts the will of the Australian people uh, and they're making that determination. He said this is going to be a tough moment for some. Uh, a mo this moment of disagreement, he said, does not define us, it will not divide us, and that he renewed uh, his uh, pledge for cooperation tonight uh, and let us now cooperate to deal with the, not with the divisions, uh, but with the division that is, the real division which is disadvantage, uh, saying constitutional recognition, recognition may not have happened, but change has happened tonight uh, and that it's not the end of the road, pointing there to uh, lack of bipartisanship as one of, one of the uh, issues that led to tonight's outcome. Dan, we also heard from Wiradjuri woman Linda Burney, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, also speaking there. This has been a long fight for her during this campaign. She spoke about the breakthroughs and heartbreaks that come uh, in political processes and a referendum was always a high bar. She also sent a message to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right across the country saying, be proud of who you are and be proud of your identity and your history. She said... All uh, politicians and Australians now need to find a new way forward uh, to advance and, and see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children thrive into the future. We're going to go now to Anthony, who I think has possibly some more results from Western Australia for us, Anthony. Well, actually, it's, it's Victoria. We'd Victoria. Um, been... Um, had, it was the one state in the east we hadn't called. This is the track of the results they've come in to about 60%. There was a while there where it was trending up started to trend down, basically the pre-polls and, and maybe some posters are coming in now. Uh, but that is happening in the current results. So uh, our, we are now projecting that Victoria, Victoria will be won by the no side. So Victoria has become the fifth state to vote no. Western Australia, we've only got very, very small results so far. So it's... Uh, and just one other thing, if I'll just have a look at the national figure, it's now at 58.4. Those extra figures coming from Queensland have sort of raised the yes... raised the no vote, and Western Australia is still to come. So there we have it, Anthony calling Victoria towards the no case. Victoria has voted no to enshrining an Indigenous voice in the Constitution. About 53% of Victorians voting no. Yvonne, I want to come to you after the Prime Minister's speech, and we also heard from Linda Burney there. Mm. Uh, was the Prime Minister right to proceed with this referendum without bipartisan support? Look, I think, you know, with the results probably, uh, you know, no in terms of the outcomes that, and the changes that he wanted to make. Um, but he certainly stood by his conviction. Um, unfortunately, other people haven't in the past. And, uh, but I think that where we're at with the way people have voted, um, they also need to stand by that. Um, and if people are going to start to point the finger, they need to start to point the finger at themselves first to be able to make that change. Um, Aboriginal people have always been put out the front um, and often used uh, as shields um, and put in the firing line for so many other issues in this country that we have not addressed. Uh, when I think about uh, the Prime Minister's speech, but then also think about uh, my people where we've always been used uh, in a political process and Yes, there are, you know, many of my people that have actually voted no as well because of some of the concerns that they had. And I actually, you know, feel for them because, you know, have they stood on the right side of history? And, and some would say that they, they proudly have. But when I think about the steps forward, we're so many steps back. And I think that we need to start to really reflect and all of those that did vote no, what is the solutions to their no? Um, because there was going to be so, more, so many more <laughs> solutions to a yes. Um, and so those first steps um, are not being taken easily. It's going to be very hard and it's going to be a long way to uh, catch up, and which we've always had to. Mm. Um, but, you know, in terms of where we're at with the, the conviction of the Prime Minister and potentially with the government, 
uh, those people that were in opposition that did not want to have bipartisan support for anything for my people, uh, stand by mm. what you've done, but make sure you stand by what you should be doing for my people in the first place. We're going to go to Professor Chelsea Wadigo in Mianjin, Brisbane now. Uh, Professor, to you, the Prime Minister says he still has plenty of hope that we can continue to write the next chapter. How do you think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are feeling tonight um, after hearing the Prime Minister's words there? Look, I think the Prime Minister's words were particularly shameful. Um, that wasn't the leadership, I think, that a lot of blackfellas had hoped for him. Um, I feel for the blackfellas who have been betrayed by hope through this whole campaign, who have vested their hearts and hopes in everyday Australians to recognise them, even with an advisory body with no power. And, you know, that the Prime Minister would say that this 58% majority who believe we, that Indigenous people shouldn't have a voice to Parliament doesn't reflect a divided nation and the real divide is close the gap. These two issues are directly related. That everyday Australians believe that Indigenous peoples don't deserve such a moderate concession are police officers, are teachers, are people that blackfells encounter every day in the world that we occupy and has material consequences for us. And it's disappointing that the Prime Minister couldn't use this moment to actually tell the truth now about who we are as a nation. We are not a nation of a fair go. Tonight we know it's a nation of a firm no to blackfellas on anything in this place. And that's shameful and we should name it for what it is. Professor Wadigo, it's Dan Borsha here with Bridget in the Referendum Centre. The fact that so far, 41% of Australians voted yes, around just under 4 million at the moment. Does that give you a sense of any sort of hope that there was a groundswell for change there? Absolutely not. Um, the, what was put before the Australian people was not anything that gave me hope in the first place. That we would have recognition in their constitution with an advisory body that, according to Clause 3, the government of the day would still control its purpose, membership, function. So the fact that that's what people were pushing was, didn't give me any sign of hope in all of this and that less than half of the Australian people um, believe that we deserve that um, and most believe that we don't even deserve that. I mean, I don't know why we're so intent on this idea of hope when the evidence tells us we have no reason to have hope in the Australian people when it comes to the emancipation of blackfellas. So what needs to happen now, do you believe? What needs to happen now, and I say this for us, Mob, um, is to use this up as an opportunity to maybe come up with a different strategy when it comes to dealing with the violence of settler colonialism in this place. And maybe we retire hope and maybe we think about fighting on different, on different grounds. What's been frustrating in the conversation here and what the Prime Minister um, reiterated tonight was that this is about Indigenous disadvantage. The Black Sovereign No position has been focused on our unique rights as First Nations peoples. I think we need to change the battleground here in terms of what we're fighting for. We're not fighting to be the problem to be solved. We're arguing for our unique rights as First Nations peoples. And we need to do more fighting and less hoping um, in achieving anything for our people. Fris and I think the one hopeful thing out of all of this, for me, is that this may reinvigorate a black political movement across this country where we're not appealing to the so-called radical centre, which effectively is the far right, and actually fighting on our terms for what we want. Because the Australian people have shown us that even the most moderate concession in which they have the ultimate power over us, they still don't think we're deserving of. Professor Wadigo, I've delivered there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, Wesley, I want to bring you in. Is this going to spur a, a new black political movement, and is it time to retire hope, as the Professor was no, saying? No, not at all, Dan. I think it's actually quite the opposite. Um, when I look back on the statistics around the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission all those years ago, there were a lot of Indigenous people that weren't active in that, and the reason they weren't is because they were involved in the economy. Mum and Dad were going to work, 
kids were going to school. You know, we do have a fairly urban mm. and suburban um, Indigenous population. A lot of Indigenous people are active in the economy. So I think that instead of collectivising Indigenous people and saying, you know, it's us 3% versus you 97%, um, maybe we should fund need and focus on need and address it where we can according to households and their lived experiences and assist people where we, where we can um, because I think Indigenous disadvantage is going to be overcome probably one household at a time. Young kids need role models. They need to go to school. Um, you know, we shouldn't lose sight that, that there is a struggle ahead of us but I think it's going to be a very personal struggle from here on in. Catherine, mm. I wonder if, if that focus on need... I mean, that's something you and I have talked about in the past, that, yeah. that if that was happening... If, if we had needs-based funding. There yeah. probably mm. wouldn't need to be the national conversation we've had yeah. this year. How are you re re reacting to all of this? Oh, look, I think... I, I, I mean, there's so many ways my brain could go on this one. Um, First of all, I actually am going to circle back to something the Prime Minister said, and that is the, you know, we do need truth-telling. And I'd imagine every single Aboriginal person in this country will lean in and say, you really want to make progress, you've got to have the truth-telling, because we're not going to get to needs-based funding if we're not clear on why that is required. So it's... it's and, and I know what Wesley was saying about, you know, families um, going to school. Well, families go to school in... Fa uh, sorry, children go to school in families that have jobs. Now, the Northern Territory intervention wiped out our jobs, wiped out our jobs in remote communities. Um, pretty much at the same time, that $500 million came along and got wiped out from all of our services. There was genuine need. Our children needed to be able to drink safe water. It is vitally important that they have access to safe water. Our children need to be able to access early education and care services, just like every other child should be able to. Our families deserve to be able to pick up a phone when, they're, when they have um, a flat tyre and ring someone and say, I am stranded in 47 degree heat on a road in the middle of nowhere and there are no telecommunications to be able to help those mob and they sit there and they perish on the side of a road. That is genuine need and it is need that every single government has known about year after year after year after year um, and no one has responded to. So without the ability to look at those things, without the ability to actually pr to create the structures that brings those voices forward, we're not ever going to get there. So I'm hoping that, yes, we move towards that. I'm hoping that people um, uh, will reinvigorate themselves. I certainly, as I've said, even coming into here, I never stay in the... Sorry, Catherine, long. we need to go now to the opposition leader, Peter voted, Dutton, speaking uh, in, in our Brisbane. our 45th referendum. And it's clear, obviously, that uh, the referendum has not been successful and I think that's good for our country. I want to say a very special thank you tonight to... Jacinta, uh, to Warren Mundine, uh, to Karen Little. No one has owed more gratitude than each of these individuals. They've led the no case, they've suffered through deeply personal and offensive attacks for it. I want to say thank you very much uh, to David Littleproud and to all of my coalition colleagues. The no campaign was led by Fair Australia's Matt Sheehan and Steve Doyle and our volunteers. I want to thank them sincerely. Tonight, while the majority of Australians will be pleased with the outcome, there of course will be Australians will be disappointed as well. But what matters tomorrow is that this result doesn't divide us as a people. What matters is that we all accept the result in this great spirit of our democracy. All of us know people who voted yes and people who voted no. But to those of you who voted yes, let me say these few words. As a leader of the coalition who has supported the no campaign, while I disagree with your position, I respect your decision to have voted yes. At all times in this debate, uh, I've levelled my criticism at what I consider to have been a bad idea, to divide Australians based on their heritage or the time at which they came to our country. The Coalition, like all Australians, wants to see Indigenous disadvantage addressed. We just disagree on the voice being the solution. And while yes and no voters may hold differences of opinion, these opinions of difference do not diminish our love for our country or our regard for each other. This is the referendum that Australia did not need to have. The proposal and the process should have been designed to unite Australians, not to divide us. And what we've seen tonight 
is Australians, literally in their millions, reject the Prime Minister's divisive referendum. The Prime Minister clearly was not across the detail and he refused to explain or answer reasonable questions from Australians. I wrote to the Prime Minister in January of this year asking 15 basic questions, still no answers. So people from all sides of this debate are rightly and understandably disappointed with the Prime Minister. He's held the pen of this divisive chapter in our nation's history and if he has any strength in his leadership, he must take responsibility for it. I also want to speak tonight specifically to Indigenous Australians. Like all Australians, some of you will have voted yes and some of you will have voted no. Those of you who voted yes will be hurting. To Indigenous Australians contending with difficulty and disadvantage, I will do my utmost to lead with courage and to do what is right to implement the practical solutions required to improve outcomes and close the gap. So tonight I again commit the Coalition to implementing a Royal Commission into child sexual abuse in Indigenous communities and an audit into spending on Indigenous programs so that we can get the money where it's needed to those families in regional and remote areas. As a Leader of the Opposition, I believe that we need to come together to tackle challenges, to help families struggling with the cost of living. That needs to be the Prime Minister's priority now. We need to give young Australians hope that they can buy their own home. We need to fix the mess of the energy policy so that we can deliver electricity that's affordable and reliable as well as clean. We need to support not to oppose our small businesses and boosting our national security to prepare Australia for a very uncertain world. Importantly, we must also redouble our efforts to improve outcomes for Indigenous Australians in those disadvantaged communities and to close the gap. That includes an urgent need to boost law and order, to increase school attendance and employment at many remote communities. And that means listening less to activists and more to people in those communities and those who champion them, including Senators Karen Little and Jacinta, Jacinta uh, Nampajimpa Price. They're amazing Australians. For the past year, the Prime Minister and the government's been consumed by this referendum and they've focused on the wrong priorities. Now, as I say, we do need to turn the page to unite and to address the many challenges facing our country. I want to thank all Australians who have participated in this debate. We are the greatest country in the world. We need to continue to make sure that that's the case, to never have complacency and to always stand up for our values and what we believe in and show the strength of character and leadership to deal with those threats that our country faces now and into the future. I'll ask uh, Jacinda to say a few words and then uh, we're very happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Oh, firstly, I want to thank the Australian people for believing in our nation, in our great nation, in the goodwill of this country and understanding that the vast majority of Australians want what's best for each and every one of us, including our most marginalised Indigenous Australians. The Australian people have voted overwhelmingly uh, say no to this referendum. They've said no to division within our constitution along the lines of race. They've said no to the gaslighting, to the bullying, to the manipulation. They've said no to grievance uh, and, and, and the push from activists to suggest that we are a racist country when we are absolutely not a racist country. We are one of the, if not the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And it's time for Australians to believe that once again, to be proud to call ourselves Australian, because until we can be proud, we can't form a position where we can be strong to tackle our tough issues within our country. I am grateful for my family's support throughout this campaign, my wonderful husband, Colin Lilly, our sons, my parents, um, that taught me to stand up uh, for those who are disenfranchised, those who are voiceless, uh, to be a warrior for them. Uh, I want to thank the Fair Australia campaign, Matthew Sheehan, Stephen Doyle. I want to thank my wonderful colleagues in the coalition, the leadership of Peter Dutton and David Littleproud, the Nationals, 
for coming out, drawing a line in the sand and saying no to this proposal very early in the piece so that Australians could understand that it was OK. It was OK to recognise that this was a bad proposal, a proposal that the, prim the Prime Minister failed to provide detail on. When we kept asking questions, we weren't receiving any answers whatsoever. We could not be shown with any clarity or it could not be demonstrated how this proposal was supposed to support our most marginalised Indigenous Australians, those who belong to some of my close family members. For me, my family experienced three funerals yesterday. For me, my family are still sitting in communities where largely they have been exploited for the purpose of somebody else's agenda. This referendum has yet been another one of those agendas where it was suggested that 80% of Indigenous Australians supported this proposal when we knew that was not the case. When I knew, having spoken to people throughout the Northern Territory, to Indigenous people from the Northern Territory and right across the country, particularly in my role as the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, that a vast group of Indigenous Australians did not support this proposal. And it has been a shame that throughout the campaign that we have been accused of misleading this country through disinformation and misinformation when it was a campaign of no information whatsoever. And that we called out where the Australian people were being misled, whether it was the claim that 80% of Indigenous Australians supposedly supported this when we know that they didn't, when it was the claim that this was just a simple advisory body, when the words advice, advice or advisory didn't even appear in the question nor the proposed chapter. The Australian people were misled and the Australian people saw this for themselves. And that is why the Australian people decided to vote no to this proposal. I look forward to the future. I realise that much work has to be done for us to be brought together as a country because it has been such a challenging and heart-wrenching time for many Australians. For those of you that voted yes, please know that we as a coalition have always got the best interests of all Australians at heart. We want to make sure that we are fighting for a better future for all Australians. But going forward, we need to prioritise where our most marginalised are. As I've always said, the gap doesn't exist between Indigenous Australia and non-Indigenous Australia. It exists between our most marginalised that we know, whose first language is in English, who live in remote communities, and the rest of Australia, including the middle-class Aboriginal Australia, that are doing really well for themselves, for ourselves. We need to focus our efforts to where our marginalised exist. And we need to listen to their voices. And as Peter said, no longer listen to the voices of the activists, of those push pushing ideology onto us. The Australian people have said no to this. The Australian people want practical outcomes, a unified country where we can move forward together. Once again, I want to thank the Australian people for delivering this result. We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Well said, Jacinda. Uh, very happy to take questions. Opposition leader, the referendum is now clearly defeated. Uh, what is the first thing you're going to do tomorrow for Indigenous Australians? Well, I think uh, the most important thing we can do is uh, continue the work of Jacinda Price and Karen Little. Uh, they will lead a process on behalf of the Coalition uh, to look at our policies uh, that we'll take to the next election. I can announce that tonight. Uh, as I said, we called uh, last year for a Royal Commission into se child sexual abuse uh, within Indigenous communities. Uh, and the government should take up that offer immediately. There's bipartisan support uh, in relation to that very important issue, the sanctity of those children, their childhood, and making sure that uh, we support them and reduce violence and domestic violence uh, in those Indigenous communities is absolutely central to our plan. Uh, the work that uh, Jacinta and Karen will be doing will uh, concentrate very much on 
uh, calling out uh, where the money is not being spent appropriately, where it's being diverted, and making sure that the money that taxpayers work hard for and give to the government, that that money can be spent appropriately and prioritised in those communities where the practical need is most and for families, for education, for health. That's what Australians have voted for today. They haven't rejected Indigenous Australians. They've rejected the voice and the government's proposal, which deliberately wasn't explained to them. But they haven't rejected Indigenous Australians and we are all dedicated to making sure that we can do everything possible to improve their lives. Why do you think the campaign was so successful? I, I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, clearly, uh, Australians were always going to reject a proposition which divided us into different categories. Uh, one of the great attributes of the Australian public is that we all see ourselves as equal. And it doesn't matter if you came here six months ago, as Jacinda and I have repeated as we've gone around the country, uh, or 60 years ago, uh, or 65,000 years of ancestry in this country. Uh, we're all equal. We're all equal Australians. And I think the Australian public rejected the Prime Minister's proposition to divide us on the basis of ancestry or race, and that's a great thing for our country. Uh, we shouldn't shy away from that. Our nation's rule book is incredibly important. It underpins the success of our country. And Australians have stood up today to defend that, to defend our history and to make sure that our future is certain. And Jacinda and the work that she's done, Warren, Karen and others, they've been key advocates in much of that messaging, but I think Australians have risen up tonight. They've stared down division. They've rejected a proposition that wasn't properly explained to them. Uh, and I think Australians should be very proud of, uh, of that outcome. Senator Price, the generation of Indigenous leaders like Noel Pearce and Marcia Langton have campaigned for the last 15, 16 months, indeed in some cases for decades, for a voice in Parliament. They've been roundly defeated tonight. They've also been, at times during this campaign, personally critical of you. Is it time for that older generation of Indigenous leaders to leave the stage and has the torch passed to you tonight? I think it's uh, time for a new era in Indigenous policy in, in the Indigenous narrative, um, we have to step away from grievance. Um, attempting to bring about change through grievance has evidently got us nowhere. It's time to accept that we are all uh, part of the fabric of this nation, that Indigenous Australians are also Australian citizens, that Indigenous children, their human rights should be upheld just as any other kids. We should not be lowering standards. We should not maintain the, the racism of low expectations in this country. Certainly, for those that have been there for decades, I think it is time to recognise that if you haven't been able to bring about the outcomes that you have seemingly worked for, then obviously it has not worked. It is time for a change. It is time to apply more accountability to those who are responsible for the lives of our most marginalised. And certainly myself and my colleague, Karen Little, are absolutely up for that work going forward. And no more, again, can we continue to listen to uh, academics and activists from the inner cities who think that they know better for Indigenous Australians, particularly in remote communities. The Prime Minister spoke of the role of the media, the role of the no campaign. But of course it was he who decided the timing, he who decided not to change the language, he who decided that once it wasn't bipartisan that it was to continue. Uh, what is the lesson the Prime Minister has to learn, not just about the result, but the way that this all played out? Well, Paul, I think there's a real arrogance in the way in which uh, the Prime Minister's uh, approached his discussion with the Australian people, even tonight in his speech, you can hear the words almost of contempt uh, for the Australian people dripping from, uh, from what he's saying. And that doesn't have any place. About 65 or 70 per cent of Australians, uh, depending on where you are in the country, have expressed a very strong rejection of the Prime Minister's proposal. The Prime Minister was warned over the course of the last 16 or 17 months not to proceed with this divisive referendum. And he owes the Australian public an apology for that. Uh, there are many indicators along the way uh, that should have been red flags for the Prime Minister uh, to say that uh, he was taking the country to a point of division. 
And I just don't think strong leaders do that. I mean, clearly he wants to please everybody. He's not across the detail, which is why it couldn't be explained to the Australian people. And Australians aren't stupid. They're not going to vote for something where the detail is kept deliberately from them. The design of the voice wasn't scheduled to start until Monday, a couple of days' time, if there was a yes tonight. I mean, that, that's unbelievable. There's no constitutional convention. And the design wasn't taking place until after people had voted. And I think on that basis, uh, the Prime Minister really needs to listen to the Australian public uh, instead of just words of arrogance again. Uh, he needs to listen to the very clear message that he's been sent tonight by millions of Australians uh, instead of telling them that they got it wrong. Uh, I just don't think that's what the leader of our country should be saying. Mr. Dutton, Dutton, you've called for an audit of the spending in, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs, and uh, Mr. Mundine also called for a comprehensive audit when he gave his, uh, his interview earlier today. Um, you were gov- well, you're part of a government that was in power for almost 10 years up until recently. Why don't you know where that money was spent? Why, why do you need to ask where that money was spent as your government was spending it? Well, firstly, uh, Australians work hard for their money, and at the moment, Australians are really doing it tough because they're paying more for their electricity, they're paying more for their gas, they're paying more for their mortgage, they're paying more for their petrol, and Australians are really struggling, not just families but small businesses. And so they expect their hard-earned tax dollars to be spent appropriately. And I think it's entirely reasonable to say to the Prime Minister, uh, is the money being spent appropriately? And where it is and where we're confident that a program is working really well, we should scale it up. Uh, Jacinda's got an excellent idea in relation to putting accommodation into some of the schools in the Northern Territory so that kids can get a good night's sleep, so that they can be fed, so that they can be housed safely. They're the sort of practical things that the government should be embracing now, but they haven't. And so I think it's entirely reasonable to ask the government to make sure that money is being spent appropriately and that the huge amount of money that goes into the funnel at the top in Canberra that becomes a trickle now into Indigenous communities is looked at. I don't think that's unreasonable and I think there's a fair message uh, in people's vote today that they want the government to be able to do that. Thank thank you very much. And that was the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, there speaking from Brisbane, uh, saying that it's clear, obviously, that the referendum has not been successful and he added added that he thought that that was a good thing for the country. Uh, The result, he says, does not divide us as a nation. This is the referendum that Australia did not need to have, he said, uh, and says that Australian voters have not rejected Indigenous Australians. Uh, He also again reiterated that call for a Royal Commission into child abuse uh, and an audit that he touched on there at the end saying money that left Canberra began as a funnel but ended up as a trickle into remote communities uh, and said spoke directly to Indigenous Australians contending with difficulty and disadvantage, saying that he would do his utmost to lead with courage and to do the right thing to implement the uh, practical solutions to improve outcomes and close the gap, accusing the Prime Minister of arrogance uh, and saying, quote, hear the words almost of contempt for the Australian people dripping from what he is saying, was what the opposition leader Peter Dutton had to say there. We also heard from the Coalition's Indigenous Affairs spokesperson, Jacinta Nabajiba Price, of course, a key no campaigner, saying that she thanked Australians for delivering a majority no vote. She called this a push from activists and said Australia was absolutely not a racist country. She touched on her own personal experience, saying her family has experienced three funerals in recent days, reiterating her call uh, for more attention to be placed to remote Aboriginal communities. She did say it was a challenging and heart-wrenching time for the nation and she put a message out for those who voted yes, saying we as a coalition have got you in mind as well, Dan. Mm, We're rounding out that news conference. So we're going to go bring in Anthony uh, now for some more numbers. Yeah, well, the figures are now coming in from Western Australia. We've got about 13% of the vote counted. Um, Let's look at our tracking graph. And you can see it started very low, rose, and it's just levelled off at about 40%. We've seen enough. We've looked at some of the polling place comparisons with the last federal election. So at this stage, we are... Let me see this one. We are prepared to say that Western Australia has also voted no. So that becomes the sixth state to vote no, along with the national vote 
uh, adding to the defeat for the referendum. And just, um, just to update things, just for the national figure, the national figure is now 59% no, 41% yes. So just reiterating uh, that breaking news there from Anthony that in fact uh, Western Australia has also voted no. All states and territories, in, as well as the national vote and the Northern Territory, have voted no, uh, with just the ACT voting yes tonight in this national referendum to enshrine a voice to Parliament in the Australian Constitution. Now we're joined uh, by Referendum Working Group member and Indigenous Voice Coordinator, report author Dr Tom Karma, and also want to welcome in uh, Professor Lisa jackson Paul who we'll come to in a moment. Uh, Professor Karma, welcome to the program. What's your reaction to this news this evening? Uh, thanks, Dan. And, um, yeah, look, I, I'm uh, very disappointed, of course, that uh, this is the way it fell out. But I think what we need to recognise is that just over 4 million Australians did vote yes, and um, and we've got to recognise that. We've also got to recognise that um, across the nation there's been, you know, a whole range of um, misinformation and disinformation provided to the community, and I believe that needs to be addressed, and it will be addressed into the future. So disappointing, but also encouraging that so many people are walking with us and that um, this will be something that we can reflect on. And it just means, as co-chair of Reconciliation Australia, that we have to, to do a bit more work and um, identify precisely uh, where the, the voting uh, was for and against. Um, I believe we can get down to a, a fairly granular level and particularly to identify where the Indigenous voices um, were no, so that we can um, work with those communities to get them to understand more about um, what was being proposed and how they can be better engaged in the future if they feel that they're being disenfranchised now. Professor Kalmer, it's Bridget Brennan here, live from the Referendum Centre on Gadigal Country. Great to see you. Look, constitutional recognition has been part of your life's work um, and certainly taken up a lot of your time in the past 20 years. Is this the end of this debate on whether we should be recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution? Do we now look to a legislated model, potentially for a voice, perhaps your model that you worked on with Professor Marcia Langton? Um, yeah, look, I, I'd um, be very keen to hear what um, the opposition leader is now going to do. He indicated mm -hmm. very clearly um, to the Australian population that if this referendum failed, he would then take a, another referendum to the population to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. So that's, I, I think, the first response, is that we are likely to have a, another referendum. Otherwise, people will believe that he's misled the the Australian population by yeah. saying that and giving people on the no side some hope uh, that they would, would be able to go back to a referendum uh, to be able to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our constitution. So that's up to Mr Dutton um, to, to then progress that. Uh, I think he's also made the statement that he, he would legislate. And so let's see if a private member's bill comes up pretty shortly uh, to legislate a voice. And I think... Um, you know, both those issues are very important that, um, you know, if, if he's a man, um, you know, who is convicted to, to honesty and integrity of what he tells the Australian population, bring it on. <laughs> uh, Professor Kummer, it sounds like you're very much laying the gauntlet down there to the opposition leader to make good on what uh, commitments he made throughout that uh, campaign. I, it did surprise me that he didn't uh, bring any of those issues up in that news conference just then. Um, I wonder if you have a view about why that might be. And also when he said that he... the words almost of contempt for the Australian people dripping from the, what the Prime Minister was saying, how did you respond to that? Oh, look, I, I was very disappointed, you know. It's, um, you know, I can recall as a, the referendum working group, on two occasions, um, uh, Peter Dutton came to the group to hear our views and he, he heard our views, and then he went outside to a pre-arranged uh, press, presser, um, press conference and didn't reflect anything that he'd heard inside the meeting. So, you know, I, I have, um, you know, I have questions, I guess, as to, as to how genuine he is in his statements and how, how accurate he is in, in um, uh, the information that he's provided to, to the Australian population. I'm also very critical of politicians... Um, who have been spreading a range of disinformation out there. 
or distorting facts and and issues uh, to mislead the population. And you know, and and that doesn't bode well for us as a democracy and for us to have confidence in in our politicians if they can't be straight and and give a clear answer. And I guess the other really interesting thing will be um, how much he'll be on board and the opposition will be on board with anything that the um, uh, the government of the day might want to present, um, you know, in, in relation to advancing Indigenous affairs. Mm. I can go back to 2008 with the National Apology, post the National Apology. Um, there was the, the statement of intent on closing the gap that, that um, Kevin Rudd presented to the population. All the states and territories got behind it. The opposition leader at the time, who was Brendan Nelson, got behind it. And anybody who has any interest in Indigenous affairs needs to just look at that statement of intent where it talked very much about engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, hearing us, involving us in policies and programs. Um, just a little while later, there was a change of government and all of a sudden, you know, that started to, to uh, dissipate. And, and that's probably one of the big issues and why constitutional recognition was, uh, well, constitutional enshrinement was so important. So we don't have and, and we don't need to be at the behest of, of the government of the day as to whether we'll be able to advance or, or, um, or, or go backwards when it comes to Indigenous affairs. From an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective, we've given our bit um, to try and assist government. This was another opportunity for governments to hear what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had to say in the most effective ways to be able to get outcomes, uh, sustainable outcomes, and there's plenty of examples of that around the nation uh, where engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has had very positive results. And yet we need to, um, you know, and I heard what um, uh, Senator Price said, you know, and, and really I, I question, in, in all the time when she was, say, in Alice Springs on the, on the town council, how many representations did she make to the mm -hmm. coalition government right. about addressing those issues mm -hmm. in Alice Springs? Um, so, you know... This gets down to a party political issue and we are sick and tired of it as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of being the, the political footballs at the behest of what governments want to do and what, don't, uh, what they don't want to do in Indigenous affairs. We will never advance, we'll never take, uh, get the opportunities to really enjoy our full potential whilst it's uh, relying on political parties to, to, um, to shove us around and, uh, and be unstable. And you just have to look back to, to the time that, you know, I put the Close the Gap report in in 2004. We've seen nine prime ministers. You know, how, what, what sort of stability do we have mm. in, in, mm. in our political system to advance Indigenous affairs when, when um, you know, we're the only constant, the only one still working mm. to try and advance our cause? Professor, thank you. Let's go to reporter Tani Josh on you and Country at Eden on the far New South Wales south coast. Tani, how are the community feeling where you are? Hi, Bridget. I'm here in Wake, uh, Wakeham, um, also known as Eden. Um, it's a little fishing town on the far south coast of New South Wales. I've had the great privilege of spending the day with one of the UN elders here, um, Uncle BJ Cruz. And in fact, we're actually in his lounge room and have been watching the results unfold as they've been coming through the night. It's been quite a big um, day and night for the Cruz family. Uh, it's been quite emotional. Um, Uncle BJ Cruz's dad, Uncle Ozzy Cruz, was actually one of the uh, signatories of the Uluru Statement from the heart. Um, Uncle BJ, you know, we've heard that a voice to parliament is not going to get up. How do you feel hearing that news tonight? Well, I'm disappointed in, um, in the now about uh, getting up. Um, I voted yes. Uh, I've looked at uh, all the people that um, campaigned and um, I can see, particularly with the Aboriginal people, I can see that there's a, there's a common ground about our ideas, about, um, you know, the needs of our people, the disadvantages, our sovereign rights and all those sorts of things. I agree with those things, um, but the difference is that some people believe that they could achieve those things through a yes vote, whereas other people believe they could have 
achieve those things for a no vote. The only person that I didn't agree was Jacinda Price because um, listening to her, I didn't hear her mention anything about Aboriginal disadvantages or uh, sovereign issues. She was more or less uh, talking from a mainstream uh, political government point of view, which concerns me that um, someone that, uh, you know, an Aboriginal person was in a position that could have done a lot towards um, uh, dealing with, with Aboriginal rights and needs and aspirations. Uh, even though there was an, uh, a no vote, uh, I'm not um, deterred. I believe that Aboriginal people give nothing up, government take nothing away, therefore nothing has changed. Aboriginal people still retain full sovereign rights as a matter of birth. And um, I saw the, um, the yes vote as a means of um, dealing with those things, but in a timely manner that um, we didn't chuck the uh, cat amongst the pigeons, but we stepped uh, the population through a process of learning and coming to terms with things. And in the first instance, set up a voice in parliament so that Aboriginal people would have a mechanism to be able to talk to uh, Aboriginal people at a grassroots level and convey that uh, message through to the highest levels of governments. And, um, and through that process, gain the understanding and the support of the non-Aboriginal people, listen to the Aboriginal people too, because we're not saying to everybody, you know, pack up and go back to your country where you come from. If we were saying that, then half my relations would have to go with them. But, and we do uh, respect the rights and needs and the aspirations of all peoples, but there is still a matter of um, the uh, outstanding matters uh, uh, that stem from colonisation that, that needs a, a redress. And I believe that, in my own opinion, uh, without severing our rights to our sovereignty, the voice was, was a good opportunity for us to uh, uh, deal with those sorts of things. Thank you, Uncle BJ, so much, and thank you for having us with you, with, um, you and the Cruz family in your home tonight. Back to you, Bridget, and Dan in the studio. Thanks. That's Tiny Josh there on UN Country. Professor Lisa jackson Pulver. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to bring you in earlier. It's a bit of a busy night tonight. Can I have your reflections on tonight and on the vast policy challenges ahead for uh, perhaps a bipartisan solution, if there is one, yeah. on what we're going to need to do? We had ahead. a real opportunity. We had a real opportunity for, uh, for something different to happen because doing the same old thing time and time again is not going to give us what we need as an Australian nation. When you think about it this way, we're one of the richest nations on earth. You know, we're right up there in the political, geopolitical north, although we're deep south. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a colonised nation. We're still... Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people haven't got the same kind of rights that other colonised peoples do around the world. And it's way, way long time and way overdue. So today was a really good opportunity to start that stepwise process. So we didn't get that. But what we do have on Monday morning is a lot of conversations to have. And I don't really think it should be about, you know, pointing the fingers and saying, you did that wrong and you did that wrong and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. I think the time's over for that. We know that arguing with each other and pushing things down the road for another time to come is not going to do it. People are still unwell. There's still this massive difference in life expectancy. We still have children being taken away and we've talked about this ad infinitum. Uh, in unprecedented numbers, we've got more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people locked up than ever. We've got people being unwell of things that are just unheard of in many other first world nations. You know, we've got rheumatic heart disease, 100% preventable from a $3 vaccine, you know, and we still have it in this nation. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. And I think our political leaders 
you know, pointing at each other saying, oh, you didn't do this and we didn't go with that because and there's a better mm. model and here's my bright idea for the future. Well, that doesn't work. Mm. It, it sounds to me like you're <laughs> grappling with the disappointment while being pragmatic and actually saying, yep. do you know what, Let, let's get on with We've it. We've got to crack on. And, and yeah. you know, at the end of the day, and the evidence is in for this, is that if you work with the people for whom you're creating programs about the best way of implementing that program, then guess what? Stuff changes. You know, we've certainly seen that in the community controlled health services around Australia. You know, Aboriginal people in recent memory would rather die on the steps of the great big fancy hospital than walk into it. And now we've got Aboriginal community controlled services and that's made a significant difference with how people engage with the health system. You know, it is not perfect and there's certainly not enough. But that is just one very small example of how things can change for the better if community has control over addressing the needs that it needs without all of this buck passing that occurs, um, usually around funding. Mm. And that's not OK. We've just got to get over it. You know, 3 to 5% of the population, it's not a biggie for such a rich nation. Yvonne, what's at stake if we can't get this right, as Lisa just said? The, oh, the you know, I mean, it's, it's been at stake for such a long period of time. It's, it's more of what we've had. Uh, in the past, and when I think about what Dutton has said uh, tonight, I'm not surprised, uh, to be honest. Um, it's more about what he uh, doesn't do. Uh, when he was in power and what he was able to do and failed to do uh, will continue to be more of that. Uh, the words that I had, or the word that I have for uh, Mr Dutton and co is uh, look at Teals. Look at tools. You know there is. Do you think so there's going to be political consequences? Oh, well, I think there's political consequences when you look at what the results that have come in tonight. There has been more about, less about the the First Nations people and what they should have done way be beyond tonight's vote. Uh, the you know Dutton's government previously could have actually taken this to the people, yeah. but failed to do that. How much more do we have to do? But when we think about what needs to take place for my people, there's always excuses of what it shouldn't be. You heard Price talking about, you know, more about remote communities. If she thinks that the Im impacts on Aboriginal people are not for, uh, across the whole of the country, mm -hmm. she is wrong. Look at your data. Mm -hmm. Look at what you failed to do. When we actually talk about what has to take place for our people, when uh, Dutton's government was in power, when they looked at all of the, what was it, the Aboriginal uh, Australian Indigenous Strategy Funding, majority of those organisations... Indigenous Advancement yes, Strategy. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Majority of those were non-Aboriginal organisations. Mm -hmm. Majority of that money went to administrators yeah. and bureaucrats, was not on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's not this government. That was that government. Mm -hmm. So they need to have a good hard look at themselves rather than continuing to point the finger and gloat, what, that's all I saw tonight, is that they gloated in such a way at the expense of my people continuously. Thanks, Yvonne. Wesley, I want to give you a chance to have final thoughts. Uh, where, to, where to now? Well, where to from now? I think um, it's... A referendum is optional. The Prime Minister chose to go with it. And so I think also the Prime Minister now has... He's still in power, so he has to come up with perhaps a regime change. Um, what do you mean by regime change? Well, uh, change? taking advice from different people um, or, or, or seeking advice from different... You know, in a different way. Uh, I don't think that he can continue... You know, we've had a few people on his team who have not lived up to expectations. So I think that there will need to be some changes. In, are, you, are you saying in terms of ministerial appointments? In terms of advisory and ministerial, advisory. yes. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, and he can't keep shifting blame to the opposition. Um, the, op the, the, the chance to, to bring Peter Dutton along was a long time ago. Um, had he genuinely sought and negotiated bipartisan support, then we would have had a very different outcome tonight. So I, th I think the Prime Minister's actually got a lot of work ahead of him, um, starting from tomorrow. Catherine, I, I want to bring you in to give you uh, the final word in our final thoughts uh, for this part of the, mm. the conversation. My final thoughts um, actually go to mob who are hurting right now and what I want to say is you're going to be OK. We will get through this. You're going to come back stronger. We will continue to look for those solutions. We will continue to push... You're going to be OK. We got you.
I suspect that there are many in the nation that want to bottle your optimism that it seems to be eternal. I'm not sure what spring or well that comes from, uh, but thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I think it's strength, actually, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Let's go over to Anthony now for some more updates on tonight's vote. Just, um, that's the figure, just under 60% voted, 59% no. I suspect that will rise towards 60, so the results have turned out pretty much very similar to what was predicted in all the opinion polls. And in terms of the statewide, it's a pretty consistent pattern across all the states. Higher no vote in Queensland and South Australia, 63.9 in South Australia, 67 in Queensland, 59.8 at the moment in WA, though the, the, the vote is not nearly as progressed. The no cases won the Northern Territory, though, at the moment. A lot of the remote polling places are now starting to move from the Indigenous communities and they're voting pretty, pretty solidly, yes. The ACT is a solid yes case um, jurisdiction at this stage. What we've seen is a result that, to me, reminds me very much of the Republic referendum in 1999. You're seeing a lot of high-status electorates which supported a change, whereas other electorates have voted no. So it's been a substantial... To me, it's a repeat of that. Others may look at the results and see it differently. But again, it's an attempt to achieve something rather which a lot of people didn't particularly feel connected to or wondered what it was all about. And it's led to the defeat of the referendum. And uh, it was probably, probably um, like most opinion, uh, referendums, started high. And the more you got into the detail, the more the campaign started. The support for the referendum dropped off. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Anthony. I understand this is the second referendum for you, probably, uh, or many, many elections between them. Thank you for helping us thank guide you. us through with all the numbers throughout the night. We do thank appreciate you. it. Let's go to David Spears. Bridget, thank you. Just to illustrate on our big board here what Anthony was explaining there, you can see when it comes to winning either of the requirements for a double majority to win a referendum, well, the yes case failed. Uh, over here, you can see the states. Every state has voted no. The national result, that big circle in the middle, no. The only jurisdiction to vote yes was the ACT in the end. Even the Northern Territory, with the highest proportion of Indigenous Australians, has voted no. And as Anthony mentioned, that mirrors the Republic referendum, when only the ACT voted yes. That's been the case with this Indigenous Voice referendum as well. So an overwhelming rejection by Australians uh, of this proposal. I want to show you this rough map of Australia, each dot representing one of the 151 federal electorates across the country. It gives you a geographic sense of where the no vote is. The no in orange, you can see a lot of regional Australia there. Those purple dots for yes are grouped around the metropolitan centres. Brisbane in, uh, in Queensland, Sydney and the ACT. Uh, Melbourne uh, had a stronger yes vote, but not enough. And then a little in um, uh, dot down in Hobart and over in Perth as well. But largely there you can see a, a sea of orange for no right across the country. And the national vote at the moment, uh, as we wrap up things tonight, is sitting at 59%, so nearing 60% the no vote and the yes vote still hovering just above 40%. Uh, one interesting thing I want to show you, where is the strongest uh, no vote tonight? Which seat, which federal electorate had the strongest no vote? Little Proud. It's Maranoa in Queensland, held by the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. The strongest yes vote tonight was in the seat of Melbourne, held by the Greens leader, Adam Bant. So the strongest yes vote in the Greens leader's seat, the strongest no vote in the Nationals' leader's seat. Just an interesting mm. uh, point there tonight. Look, uh, just some final thoughts before I throw back to you. What we heard from the two leaders tonight, they, these were really important speeches. Both Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton spoke about respecting the outcome and coming together. But then, as we heard some of the questions to the two leaders, it was pretty clear there was still a lot of finger-pointing, a lot of blame going on between the two of them and really not much sign of how they are going to cooperate together from what has been a difficult, divisive referendum process. Now, that's politics. There will be political fallout from all of this. But what, what does that mean for reconciliation, for any sort of recognition in the Constitution, and importantly, for closing the gap? Tonight, that still remains very unclear. Bridget, Dan, back to you. David Spears is back tomorrow morning with an Insiders special from 9am. Do follow ongoing coverage and analysis of tonight's result on abc.net.au slash news. That's Australia Votes the Voice referendum. Thank you to our incredible panel uh, and for giving up so much time and your generosity with your thoughts uh, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.
This has undoubtedly been a difficult time for the nation. Australia's 45th referendum has been defeated and perhaps along with it, a decades-long debate on recognising First Peoples in our constitution. Indigenous Australians had different views on this proposal, but this will take some time to process for communities across the country. Yeah, thank you again to everyone who's appeared right throughout the night here on the panel and right across the nation. And thank you for joy choosing the ABC as we bring you this historic evening. Thank you and good night. Good night.